Ebola outbreak, which has been traced back to Mexican peppers. There have been more than 1,200 reports of food poisoning caused by this strain of salmonella, known as St. Paul. The hearing of the Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations is about five hours. This being will come to order. Today we have a hearing titled The Recent Salmonella Outbreak Lessons Learned and Consequences to Ministry and Public Health. Each member will be recognized for a five minute opening statement. I will begin. Since the 110th Congress in January 2007, I'm going to wait a minute. Since the 110th Congress began in January 2007, this subcommittee has been investigating the adequacy of the Food and Drug Administration's efforts to protect Americans from unsafe food. Today we hold the subcommittee's ninth hearing regarding the safety and security of the nation's food supply. The purpose of today's hearing is to, is to examine the events surrounding the recent Salmonella St. Paul outbreak. We will consider the implications to public health and industry and will examine what lessons can be learned to better safeguard our food supply. Since April, at least 1,304 people in 43 states, the District of Columbia and Canada have been infected with Salmonella St. Paul. These illnesses have resulted in at least 252 hospitalizations and may have been a contributing factor in two deaths. This outbreak is one of the largest outbreaks of Salmonella ever in the United States. And based on the number of confirmed cases, it's the largest foodborne outbreak in the last decade. The, Centers for De the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, have struggled to identify the cause of salmonella outbreak. Originally, CDC and FDA identified tomatoes as the most likely cause of the outbreak. However, as the outbreak continued and the number of illnesses soared, the FDA was unable to definitively identify tomatoes as the source of contamination. In late June, CDC expanded its epidemiological investigation to include food items that are commonly served in combination with tomatoes. This study found that people who became ill were more likely to have recently consumed raw tomatoes, fresh jalapeno peppers, and fresh cilantro. However, the CDC still could not determine the exact cause of the outbreak. Finally, on July 21st, nearly two months after the outbreak was first discovered, FDA announced a significant break in its investigation when they confirmed the presence of Salmonella St. Paul in a Mexican-grown jalapeno pepper. The jalapeno had the same Salmonella genetic fingerprint as the strain linked to the outbreak. Despite this discovery in jalapenos, the FDA still refused to rule out tomatoes as the original source of the outbreak, which has angered many tomato growers. Today we will examine why it took the FDA, CDC, and state public health agencies so long to identify jalapeno peppers as a source of Salmonella St. Paul. Further, we will explore what lessons for industry and government should be garnered as a result of this outbreak. Perhaps most importantly, we will try to determine which aspects of this outbreak investigation worked well and which failed, so that regulators and the affected industry will be better prepared to rapidly respond to future outbreaks. For example, we will examine a portion of the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, which was designed to ensure the traceability of food. The Act directed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue regulations regarding the establishment and maintenance of records by most people and companies that manufacture, possess, pack, transport, distribute, or receive food. Most notably exempt from this requirement are farms and restaurants. The regulation requires that records must be kept to allow federal investigators to identify the immediate previous sources and subsequent recipients of food in order to be able to quickly respond to threats to our food supply. However, in discussions with committee staff, Dr. David Atchin, FDA's Assistant Commissioner for Food Protection, other known as the Food Czar, stated that the Bioterrorism Act did not function as intended during this outbreak because the Bioterrorism Act does not require a particular format for maintaining records. Most food companies have their own unique system of record keeping, which, according to FDA officials, has caused significant delays in FDA's traceback investigation. While FDA has ultimately been able to trace back commodities associated with this outbreak, it has been too time consuming of a process requiring countless hours trying to link one company's records to the next. Today we will explore what specific problems FDA had in its traceback investigation 
and whether alterations to the Bioterrorism Act or other additional regulations are needed to allow federal investigators to quickly trace back suspected commodities during an outbreak. We will also explore what the industry can do to maintain traceability of its products. While there has been discussion by FDA and the media that loose products, like tomatoes, are difficult to trace due to their complex processing and distribution chains, some of the industry maintain that such commodities are rapidly traceable from the farm to the end user. Indeed, some tomato companies visited by committee staff did provide evidence that tomatoes could be rapidly traced back if the need arose. However, these sophisticated systems appear to conflict with statements by FDA officials who claim that tracing this commodity has often been a time-consuming and daunting task. Today we will discuss whether there are particular systems that can be adapted by industry to enhance traceability, particularly for high-risk commodities. Finally, we will also hear a host of criticism from industry directed at the FDA and CDC for the way they conducted its outbreak investigation. For example, we will hear that the FDA often did not share or solicit critical data and other information from food safety agencies. We will hear that the way state health agencies interact and share data with key federal agencies, such as the FDA and CDC, is often inefficient, overly bureaucratic, and sometimes even counterproductive. We will hear that by failing to adequately coordinate with key state agencies, both FDA and CDC missed important opportunities to leverage scarce federal resources with state resources to conduct investigations and field work related to the investigation. We will hear that neither CDC nor FDA work closely enough with state agencies to understand key produce distribution patterns, and if they had, they would have realized early that based on geographic distribution patterns of the illness, the source of the salmonella was likely not from Florida. Finally, we will hear that, we will hear that because there were over 3,000 local health departments and 50 state health departments working under different public health laws, there is a tremendous variability in the capacity to respond to disease outbreaks, which can have produced consequences on the ability to pinpoint a contamination source. These and other troubling issues related to this outbreak continue to be uncovered as we move, move forward with this investigation. While we understand the FDA's and CDC's investigation in the, into this outbreak is ongoing, it is important to find answers and solutions to the key failures that have been identified up to this point. At a minimum, the FDA and the CDC must convene an independent post-mortem task force, which includes local, state, federal, scientific and industry officials related to this outbreak, to study which features of the investigation broke down and how the system can be improved. While this salmonella outbreak has sickened scores of people and caused great economic damage to the produce industry, we are fortunate that this does not appear to be an intentional contamination of our food supply. If we do not learn from this case and rapidly improve our food safety system, we will be doomed to repeat the failures of the current outbreak. The American public deserves better from industry and our state, local and federal agencies. That completes my opening. And next turn to Mr. Shimkus, ranking member of the subcommittee, for his opening statement, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome this panel and the succeeding uh, panels to, to follow. This is our ninth hearing uh, we have held on food safety this Congress to identify ways to ensure the safety of our, and security of our nation's food supply. At the beginning of our last hearing in June, grocers and restaurants nationwide had begun pulling tomatoes from the shelves and menus at great economic cost until the cause of the salmonella outbreak could be identified. Since then, two months after FDA's initial notice, not one contaminated tomato has been found. Instead, the outbreak strain of Salmonella St. Paul was originally traced back to a jalapeno pepper that was grown in Mexico and imported and, dis and distributed through a warehouse in Texas. Yesterday afternoon, the FDA learned that the same genetic strain of the Salmonella was found that was found in the Sereno pepper on a different farm in Mexico and in a nearby water reservoir. To date, nearly 1,300 illnesses have been reported in over 43 states, and local, state and national public health officials and regulators have been working to protect Americans during the outbreak. Outbreaks of this magnitude cause serious concern and warrant our close attention to help better prepare our nation uh, for the future. Today we will explore the dynamics of the marketplace in which Federal agencies are trying to do the right thing and prevent harm to consumers while their decisions often result in economic losses to the industry. Witnesses from the tomato industry will discuss their frustration of how the outbreak has handled and explain 
the effects the government's actions had on the consumer confidence and industry revenues. A question to consider today is, is there a way to limit unnecessary collateral damage to the industry and effectively address a foodborne illness outbreak? A lot of the hearing will focus on traceability. Traceback is an important tool used to rapidly and accurately identify the source of contamination. This issue was supposed to be addressed in the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002. The Act directed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue regulations regarding records kept by those who manufacture, process, pack, transport, distribute, receive, hold, or import food. Current regulations require that records must be kept to allow Federal investigators to identify the immediate previous sources and subsequent recipients of food. This is known as the one step forward, one step back. In light of recent outbreaks and events, it may be time to evaluate the intent of the Act and determine if clarification or additional regulations are needed to improve or trace back abilities. Witnesses today from different states and industry will discuss their current practices and proposals to establish more robust traceability systems. FDA's current traceability system is not without flaws. We need to identify and understand the system's limitations and then explore and implement realistic ways to make it faster and more cost efficient. A critical part of this hearing is how a contaminated product or commodity is identified in the first place. It seems to me that without reliable information about the contaminated product or commodity, traceability will be ineffective. Among today's witnesses are two epidemiologists and a representative from the Centers for, Di Di for Disease Control. I hope they can explain the process of identifying suspected contaminated commodities and highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of our current system. I want to understand the role epidemiology plays in relation to nationwide foodborne illness outbreaks. If there are gaps in epidemiology that we can avoid and traceability is only as good as the science that is guiding it, we might want to focus our limited resources to improving the science and statistics and not in requiring more regulations. We may not be able to create a perfect system, but we must have a more reliable and efficient one. There is a lot to be learned from this outbreak, and a thorough postmortem should be conducted by FDA and CDC with input from local and state governments and the affected industries. We need to determine where the breakdowns in the epidemiology and in tracebacks and interagency and intergovernment communication occurred, and then decide how we need to allocate our resources to provide the most protection to the Americans against foodborne illnesses. Finally, if there are legal walls blocking the states, CDC and FDA from fully communicating and cooperating during an outbreak investigation, then those walls need to be torn down. We have 16 witnesses here to help explore these issues and discuss possible solutions, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Again, welcome to the, this panel and succeeding panels. Thank the gentleman. Ms. DeGette for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as a mom, I spend a lot of time with people who are like me, people who are trying to raise their kids and do the right things. And unfortunately, even though in some prior life they may have been very interested in politics and public policy, they are more interested in the safety of their kids and making sure their families work. But they are they've been perking up lately because there has been a whole series of threats to their family life and to the safety of their kids. We dealt with the consumer product safety yesterday and the toy safety, but with food, it's just been one thing after another the last few years. First we had the spinach recall, then we had the peanut butter recall, then we had the pet food recall, and this saga of the salmonella outbreak has been going on now since last spring. And frankly, this is the kind of thing that people really take notice of because they think that the main job of government is to protect their family's safety. And frankly, we could be doing that. We have the technology. In mid-April, people started getting sick in this country. Then, in late May, the CDC and the state health departments identified that it was Salmonella St. Paul. But not until June did the FDA warn consumers not to eat red tomatoes. And so consumers all around America quit eating tomatoes. And, for, and what that did was that caused tons and tons of tomatoes to be discarded at a cost of millions and millions of dollars to the tomato industry. But now we learn in July, four months later, 
that, oh, it's probably jalapeno and serrano peppers. This makes consumers very nervous, and rightfully so. And, and the thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Many of you know that I've been working on food traceability issues now for about six years, and I have legislation, H.R. 3485, which would require the USDA and the FDA to get moving on a system to track food products throughout the supply chain. chain. For a long time, I found a very difficult time trying to convince people that we should have traceability. They said, we can't afford to do that. And I'm here to tell you today, with the loss of consumer confidence with the latest outbreak, I think we can't afford not to do traceability. We have the technology to do traceability for produce, for processed foods, for other types of foods. In fact, as we will hear today, the tomato industry and many other industries are using traceability right now. We have the technology to trace a tomato from field to fork, but we don't do it in any kind of, of organized way nationally. So while you might be able to trace a tomato in one particular industry, you can't do it across industries and you can't do it on a national, on a national level. And so if we institute simply voluntary tracebacks, those programs will still have cracks and all of the participants will suffer if an outbreak occurs. On the other hand, if we have a national system of traceability where we might not have just one system in place, but the systems are interoperable, then we will be able to effectively trace outbreaks. This will both protect consumers' health and it will protect business because we won't have overbroad recalls and we won't be uh, losing consumer confidence in the system. It's, it, it, to me, it's an essential part of any food safety legislation that we might do. Finally, I, need, I think all of us up here want to know what we could be doing better from a public health standpoint to trace outbreaks once we identify that there's a problem. Is there some better way we could communicate between health departments and the CDC? Is there some better way we could communicate between the CDC and the FDA and the other rocket science? This isn't rocket science. We have the technology to do it. We have the know-how to do it. We simply need to have the will to make it work. And Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping this investigative hearing will go a long way towards making all of these things work together to protect consumers from unnecessary disease in foods and other consumer products. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Blackburn for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for calling uh, the hearing today. And I would like to recognize Dr. Tim Jones, who is an epidemiologist from the Tennessee Department of Health, who is going to be a witness for us today. I'm uh, pleased that he is here with us. As our witnesses can tell, uh, we're fully aware everybody in America is aware of the food contamination issues that are before us. And this time, it is the largest salmonella outbreak in our nation's history. And it has affected tomatoes. It has affected jalapenos and the supply of those. And while the various federal and state agencies worked to pinpoint the source of the dangerous bacteria, too much time passed at the peril of public health and hundreds of millions of dollars of produce was lost. And for those of us that have agricultural groups and farms in our districts, this is something that we have heard so very much about as we have met with these individuals. Plus, this committee has spent countless hours listening to testimony on FDA's inability to protect the nation's food supply as a result of limited resources, insufficient personnel, lack of interagency communication, and a la lack of best practices to streamline safety review efforts. And I'm still waiting to hear what those best practices are and looking forward to hearing from the FDA what their best practices are, how they follow these in their communications and uh, their efforts to streamline safety review efforts. I will welcome that information when it makes it to my desk. I think it is indeed ironic that we are sitting here today 
for another another investigative hearing to scrutinize the nation's food safety review capabilities when yesterday this body, the House of Representatives, took a vote to force the ill-equipped FDA to regulate tobacco products. The FDA is saddled with so many unfunded mandates that placing additional stress on a broken federal bureaucracy will eventually lead to disasters. And uh, I, I I hope that this is not lost on my colleagues and on those of you that are here. We're talking about an FDA that cannot get information from one division to another and cannot seem to figure out how in the world to police food and drugs, and yet, indeed, we're talking about tobacco. For the past few months, federal, state, and local officials, as well as the industry, were all involved in the salmonella investigation. I'm looking forward to testimony that explains the complex flow of information, or maybe it is the lack of flow of information between all the stakeholders, the lack of clearly established protocols and lines of communication between different jurisdictions in the industry and the agency seems to be troubling. It's troubling to me. I would think it is troubling to some of you. And as a result, from all of this miscommunication and lack of established flow of information, the tomato industry was devastated and public panic ensued. I believe the hearing will be a good opportunity to learn what worked and what changes need to be made to protect consumers and industry from future outbreaks. It is critical that a coordinated outbreak response further evolve to protect Americans and to ensure consumer confidence. As I've said in the past, the FDA needs to shift its focus from reacting to food safety breaches following contamination and instead implement policies to prevent food safety problems before they occur. The recent outbreak is a clear example of defensive action and a lack of best practices to efficiently solve this issue. I thank the chairman and I yield the balance of my time. Mr. Dingell, Chairman of the Full Committee, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I congratulate you on the vigor with which you are approaching the problem before us today. I note this is the ninth hearing on the safety and security of the nation's food supply, and interestingly enough, on the inadequacies of food and drug and the resources of that agency. There are good people there. There are not enough of them. They don't have the money. They don't have the resources, they don't have the leadership, and they do not have the support of the administration. Today's hearings will examine those matters, and in the light of a major food contamination outbreak involving Salmonella St. Paul, which has again shaken public confidence in food and drug, in our food industry, and has devastated an important industry. Today we're going to learn how important it is not just to the public whose health is at risk, but how important it is to the industry. Because without an adequate way of addressing the problems of assuring safety of the nation's food supply, confidence in that industry and the costs to that industry are going to be at levels and places where that industry cannot tolerate. Since April, at least 1,304 people in 43 states, the District of Columbia and Canada have been infected with Salmonella St. Paul. These illnesses resulted in 252 hospitalizations or more and contributed to at least two deaths. This is one of the largest outbreaks of Salmonella in the United States. And based on the number of confirmed cases, the largest food uh, born outbreak in the past 10 years. While it has caused personal and financial tragedy to many, this outbreak should also be another wake-up call to everyone in our system for responding to unintentional or intentional contamination of the nation's food supply and pointing out that that ability on our na national capability is very much at risk and very much wanting. Our investigation to date has uncovered, amongst other things, one, a breakdown in the way the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and the Food and Drug Administration shared critical data 
with key state agencies. Two, the failure of FDA and CDC to leverage state resources. Three, more than 3,000 state and local health departments working without any adequate coordination with each other or with the federal government and with grotesquely limited resources considering the needs of the times. And they are, I note, supposed to serve as an identifying agent to help bring to our attention the existence and the cause of outbreaks like this. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we're going to hear today that key sections of the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, which was designed to ensure the rapid traceability of food in a situation such as this, has failed to perform as intended. And I note in good part because the system can't talk to each other, it doesn't have resources, and it doesn't have leadership and proper support from the agencies involved, including the Department of Homeland Security. This act directed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue specific record keeping requirements to allow federal investigators to quickly respond to threats to our national food supply. We've learned, however, that key portions of this act designed to allow for rapid traceability don't work. While the FDA was ultimately able to trace commodities associated with this outbreak, the process was slow and cumbersome. And it reminded me very much of the kind of Keystone Cop situation which we saw when we had the Chilean grape situation. And it's as interesting to note that what should have taken hours or days has taken months or more. Today, we will not only explore the failures of FDA and CDC, but also what industry can and should do to improve the traceability of its products. And we're going to have to explore what we have to do to see to it that the money and the resources are available for this and who is going to pay for that in times of a tight budget. While some in the FDA have argued that loose produce, like tomatoes, are too difficult to trace, some of our industry witnesses will de describe systems currently in place that can rapidly trace their products. And we're going to want to hear why it is that food and drug can't or won't or doesn't support efforts to get us to the point where we can properly address the traceability of products. We can and must learn from industry. And rather than be at odds with the government on improved safety, the industry must be our partners. And we're going to find out whether they want to do that today or not. If parts of the tomato industry can develop an efficient traceability system, why can't other parts of the food industry do likewise? Why can't FDA mandate it? And why not uh, the industry voluntarily adopt such a thoughtfully crafted and well done system? Perhaps it's time to revisit what additional changes to existing regulations may be required to achieve this goal. We have a number of outstanding witnesses today. I want to thank them for coming forward. And I look forward to hearing their views on what needs to be done to prevent more debacles of this sort, which seem to occur on a weekly or daily basis. With the help of the industry, I believe we can restore public confidence and the safety of our food supply. We can prevent suffering, loss, and hurt and death to our people. And we can prevent significant damage to industry at all levels for want of the ability to maintain public confidence and to properly trace and manage our nation's food supply. And we need to see what we have to do to see to it that the regulatory agencies have the resources, the willingness, the enthusiasm, and the leadership to protect our nation's food supply. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barton, for an opening statement, please. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the um, prompt response to this problem in the hearing today and all our witnesses for being here. 
We've invited 16 witnesses to tell us what went right and what went wrong in the search for the source of the latest salmonella outbreak in fresh produce. Nearly everybody seems to think that more went wrong than went right, but I think we need to explore the complex reality if we're really going to try to f fix the problem. First of all, we want to know why it took so long to figure out that it was Mexican peppers instead of American tomatoes that were making people sick. Many innocent farmers in the United States lost thousands and thousands of dollars because we at first identified tomatoes and it hurt their crop. You don't have to be a detective to know that the initial investigation didn't really help anybody. and As I just said, it did harm a lot of people. I understand that the investigators follow clues until they've found the culprit, but it's arguable that our public health agencies should have found the source of contamination much sooner than they did. Identified tomatoes, I believe according to this timeline, Mr. Chairman, in, um, in early June, and we didn't really begin to look at or identify the jalapenos until late June. And it wasn't until July that Minnesota authorities actually pinpointed the jalapenos as the source of the salmonella-induced salmonella illnesses. So that's a month uh, that really hurt in terms of the um, tomato crop situation. The point of doing traceback, spending millions of taxpayer dollars, is to contain an outbreak quickly and prevent any future contamination. The first response, unfortunately, to this outbreak fingered the tomato industry and caused growers all across America to suffer a devastating loss. This hearing is also going to examine a portion of the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002, which required the Food and Drug Administration to establish procedures on traceback and record keeping. The rationale behind passing the act was to enable federal investigators to have access to records that could help trace back and lead quickly to the source of contamination during an outbreak. This is important. To meet these regulations, the records kept by those who manufacture, process, pack, transport, distribute, receive, hold, or import f food need to clearly identify the immediate previous source and subsequent recipient of that food. If the records that are kept by industry are not meeting these standards, the trace back and trace forward process is not being achieved, then the industry needs to tell us and the regulators need to find a way to improve compliance. However, if industry is meeting these standards and it's the regulations themselves that are limiting our regulators, then perhaps a change in the law of the regulation may be needed. I'm really not interested in trying to find a, a bad guy in this story. I want to get it right. If the current system is broke, let's figure out what's wrong with it and fix it together. If it just needs a tune-up, then let's start tuning it up. Mr. Chairman, I've got three more pages of specifics, but I'll submit those for the record. Let me simply say that this is an important hearing, and I know that uh, my folks down in Texas are very interested in this, and as I just said, let's figure out what's broke and fix it or let's figure out what needs to be tuned up and tuned it up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and, and I know members will be in and out. There's another hearing going on, so um, we look forward to your submission, and we'll put it in the record at appropriate time. Uh, Mr. Burgess, next for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I guess I didn't realize this was the ninth hearing, but I appreciate the chairman of the full committee bringing that to our attention because it is, uh, I do think it is instructive. I want to thank the panelists for being here with us today. Many have been here with us before and, and some are new to the process, but we welcome you all here to the committee and, and we're anxious to hear your testimony. This issue, suffice it to say, has been at the forefront of our nation's consciousness the past few months, and we know that it is impossible to reduce food. There, there's an irreducible minimum below which you cannot go with foodborne illness, but still, it is our obligation as the, and it is the FDA's obligation as the premier federal agency 
to ensure that the products that come to our nation's tables are indeed safe so people can feel safe and secure in the purchases that they make. Now, the Food and Drug Administration has been diligently trying to do the trace back, and we'll hear a lot about trace back and how perhaps there are some ways that this can be streamlined and improved, and I'm, I'm anxious to hear from the individuals at the Department of Health in Minnesota because it seems like they got to the root of the problem much more quickly. And in the meantime, of course, our distributors, our retailers, and our restaurants have suffered many, many millions of dollars in loss as a result of the public health risk. But the fundamental issue here is that the Food and Drug Administration is in desperate need of help. And this committee, this is the committee that should be helping beyond just holding nine hearings. And we do it over and over again, hearing after hearing. And, and when, Mr. Chairman, are we going to take some action? And we sit here, we've got all the levers of government ahead of us, in front of us that we can pull, and, and all the powers of Congress, and the only thing we've managed to do so far is hammer the FDA. And while that may make for good sound bites and that may make for good television on cable, it's not good enough for the American people. As a consequence, the image of the FDA has suffered, and I would submit that the image of the United States Congress has suffered as well, and that is something that I think we must stop. We do need to give the FDA more resources. We need to give the FDA more personnel. We all get that. There has been a small uh, attention, small amount of attention paid to that in the supplementals, but it's not good enough just to put a bunch of funds down in the pipeline and then think we've done our job. There has to be the steady state. There has to be the ongoing the ongoing appropriations process needs to behave as it's supposed to behave, not in this stop and start fashion that we've done the past 18 months. The FDA needs to know that they have a steady supply of funds on which they can depend, and we have not been able to manage even that simple task. Um, probably almost 18 months ago, we had one of these food safety hearings, and I don't even remember then what we were, what we were investigating. But as a consequence of that investigation, I see Mr. Hubbard here again, and I, I welcome him back to the committee. He's been very helpful in working with our office and trying to craft legislation that would just simply allow us to stop a problem when we encounter a problem. H.R. 3697 was developed as a consequence of one of the hearings we had in this committee, the Imported Food Safety Improvement Act, and as yet we've had no legislative hearing on that or, or any, any other measurable improvement. The fact remains that after the FDA did their work, after they finally found the problem, it's Friday. And on the Lou Dobbs show, when the commentator asked the reporter, well, what, are you, what is the FDA recommending that consumers do to protect themselves? Well, ask. Ask where the peppers were bought. We didn't have the, even the ability to say no more imported peppers for at least this weekend until we figure out this problem. We have to have the ability, once we identify where the problem is, we have to have the ability to put an immediate stop so the American people will have at least some confidence that, yeah, they may still need to ask where this paper came from if it came into the country last week, but no new sources of contamination are going to come across our borders until we have figured out the problem. So I'm glad we're here today. I'm, I'm glad we're having a hearing. I, I, I wish we would do something concrete, and let's do focus our energies on providing the Food and Drug Administration the resources and the authority and the improved processes that it needs to protect our food supply. So I'll continue to work to draft legislation to prove, improve the Food and Drug Administration's ability to stop products from, from entering the American marketplace. If this committee ever actually gets around to legislating on the issue, I would appreciate the opportunity to work with the chairman so that the fact that one out of every four Americans is almost daily touched by the Food and Drug Administration's, that they can, administration's activities, that they can feel safe and secure. The Food and Drug Administration has the cops on the beat for them. And I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. As the gentleman pointed out, it is the ninth hearing. And for the ninth time, I'll remind you, we do have the Mr. Dingo's Global Food and Drug Safety Act, which is being negotiated with all the parties, including many of the people in this room. And with the, uh, if the gentleman side. would yield, sure. my, my staff and I stand ready to participate in those negotiations, but as yet uh, we have not been asked, and I would, I would greatly appreciate the chairman offering my office the courtesy of participating in that activity, and I'll yield back. Sure. We've been working with Mr. Barton and, um, and uh, the Republican side, and uh, we hope to have a bill up uh, as soon as we get back. In fact, uh, most of the, I think some uh, food provisions have been pretty much negotiated, so uh, it's been an inclusive process. Both Democrats and Republicans have been doing it, and you bring it up every hearing. I just want to remind you, for the ninth time, we've been working on it, and we'll have a bill. 
And with that, it's Mr. Murphy's turn for an opening statement, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate these hearings and also look forward to continuing to work with you on these food safety issues. You know, oftentimes when we're concerned about something as uh, the size of food outbreak, the call is for more government. Of course, government has its own problems as well whenever we are working on any issue. We need a system that can constantly learn from itself and adapt from its errors in reviewing problems, and we are immersed in that situation right now. Families across America want fresh, safe, affordable food year-round. And that is a formidable task. The FDA is tasked with inspecting and ensuring the safety of products and protecting our citizens from foodborne illnesses, dangerous chemical alterations, and acts of terrorism. <clears throat> the number one goal is to prevent this contaminated food from getting to the table. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of problems get through. Some 76 million people contract foodborne illnesses. 325,000 get hospitalized and 5,000 die. 400 to 500 foodborne illnesses outbreaks are, in, are investigated each year by state and local officials. But let's keep in mind a lot of those foodborne illnesses have nothing to do with the food handling industry. Many of those are what happens once it's in the consumer's home, not properly handled, refrigerated, or clean. And to add to the formidability of this task, some $2 trillion uh, in imports each year, 60 percent of that is food, 80 percent of our seafood is imported, and 40 percent of that comes from China. Many of those have been found with some chemical alterations, and we've had other hearings on some things that are downright poisonous added. We've uh, passed some bills to help traceability, but we need to have Congress and the food industry be able to review those records quickly. I'm pleased to hear that some of the, the private groups are working with the FDA to do that. But the FDA needs to be sufficiently staffed and funded to do this. We've appropriated funding for this purpose. GEO concluded that the FDA did not reveal any planned process yet by which this plan would be implemented, and we want to see that. Consumers need to be responsible for their action. The FDA needs to follow through on the proper epidemiological evidence, and I'm hoping that one of the things that we can review today is just what happened. My understanding is one of the things that occurred is people who contracted uh, illnesses were, in, uh, were interviewed, but those who ate the same food were not interviewed. If that is the case, that's a serious epidemiological research issue which we need to review. I'd like to find out if that's the truth. We also need to find ways to make whole the farmers and those in the food industry who are damaged by this scientific, this scientific error. I'm going to put scientific in quotes. But also let's keep this in mind. Our food industry here is among the safest, if not the safest, in the world. And what has happened with public health efforts have improved the lifespan of Americans. You know, early in the 19th century, when the average person lived to be 40 or so, and by the end of the 20th century, uh, they were living up in the 70s, was basically because of public health issues, primarily with clean water and sanitation and some food issues. We need to continue with our history of, of success in this, but this just shows what happens when you import so much food from around the world that we cannot possibly have an inspector standing at every plant and watching every vegetable and fruit come across the border every moment of the way. Now I believe only 1 percent of foods are inspected. We also need better communication with the public when these things get out. I saw signs appearing everywhere when the concern was about tomatoes. but. Uh, unfortunately, when the things came out about jalapeno peppers, I was surprised in a bittersweet way to see the warnings were saying such things as don't feed uh, contaminated food to infants. I can't imagine many parents of a wise interest who are actually deciding whether or not to feed jalapeno peppers to their infants. I guess they think that spices up the applesauce or something. But the issues, however, are formidable and ones we have to properly address here. Uh, and I want to say this. I certainly believe that there's people in the FDA who want to do this in the right way. I also believe there's people in the food industry who want to do this in the right way. There are a lot of intelligent people in this who want to fix this system. And my hope is that whatever bill we come out with, it is a way of opening up a door so we have a system where people with real expertise who are motivated to fix this. Because I don't believe anybody wants to hurt consumers. There's no farmers out there that want to see anybody sick. There's no food processors or companies that want to see their own children or grandparents ill from these foods. We are Americans caring about Americans, and we're going to fix this problem. And I want to make sure that we have a bill shaped by the intelligent uh, statements coming from people in these panels today that will make sure we have a, a good open process that can learn and evolve as we go on. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. That concludes the opening statements. Uh, we will have our first panel, which is a panel of growers and producers. 
Uh, on my far left is the Honorable Charles H. Bronson, who was Commissioner of Agriculture at Florida's Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. The Honorable A.G. Kawamura, who is the Secretary of California's Department of Food and Agriculture. Mr. Reginald Brown, who is the Executive Vice President of Florida Tomato Growers Exchange. Mr. Ed Beckman, who is President of the California Tomato Farmers. Mr. Parker Booth, who is the President of Ace Tomato Company in California. Mr. Thomas E. Stenzel, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of United Fresh Produce Association. And Mr. William Hubbard, who is a Senior Advisor to the Coalition for a Stronger FDA. Welcome all of our witnesses. It is the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right to be represented by counsel or advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be represented by counsel during your testimony? Uh, everyone shaking their heads no, so I will take it as a no. Therefore, let me ask you to please uh, rise and raise your right, right hand and take the oath. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this committee be truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witnesses replied in the affirmative. Each, are now, each of you are now under oath. We will now hear a five-minute opening statement from our witnesses. You may submit a longer statement for inclusion in the hearing record. Uh, Mr. Bronson, can we start with you, please, sir? Pull that mic up a little bit. Turn on that uh, button there. should get a green light. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you're on for five. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, ranking member, and members of the committee for uh, allowing us to come today to talk about this issue uh, of the FDA, CDC, and the states uh, working on this issue of trying to get to the bottom of uh, potential contamination of the food supply. Um, I am the elected Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Florida. Uh, food safety is part of my main function for the people of the state of Florida to protect the people against uh, plant and animal pest and disease from causing any type of uh, problem in the state of Florida. Uh, we have uh, 3,700 employees. We are the largest Department of Agriculture, State Department of Agriculture in the country uh, because I do also have uh, law enforcement and uh, forestry firefighters underneath uh, uh, my office as well as laboratories for food safety and approximately 158 personnel that are food safety specialists uh, with the State of Florida and 50 lab uh, personnel. And we are part of the um, FERN program uh, with uh, FDA and CDC to test for their particular issues. Uh, I, I think that I would indicate to you that uh, thanks to the cooperation of the tomato industry, and the University of Florida's Institute in, in uh, Food and Agricultural Science at the University of Florida's Land Grant College, we put together a program specifically on tomatoes at the request of the industry uh, three years ago. And we have the toughest inspection verification program in the nation for tomatoes. Uh, that was a voluntary program the past year and a half. We put into rule July 1st. All of those provisions that we have been working under, we made FDA aware of that. And that is why I consistently said over and over that I was 99.99 percent sure that Florida grown tomatoes was not a part of this problem. Uh, as we now find out that not only was Florida grown, but uh, and there are no tomatoes that have been shown so far to have uh, Salmonella St. Paul. I think. If I could get anything out of this meeting today, uh, I sit on, a on an advisory group uh, for the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, one of two members sitting on that group who is uh, working on issues with USDA and Customs Border Patrol, specifically on plant and animal pest and disease brought into our states from offshore, which is where I would like this committee to consider is where this all begins, not necessarily with FDA and CDC. However, it starts with USDA inspection, Customs Border Patrol comes into our states and then filtrates throughout the United States. My point to you would be today that we have 158 inspectors that are just as qualified as any federal inspector out there today. 
We have lab technicians that are just as qualified with PhDs, our medical teams with our public health, uh, our, our bona fide medical doctors, uh, just as you'll find anywhere in the country. Uh, we work very closely between our food safety laboratory, our Department of Agriculture inspection teams, and our local health departments and state health department on potential foodborne illnesses. We also have uh, protracted uh, outbreaks of uh, avian influenza and gone through the whole process of how we will handle that, how we will work with the different federal, local, and other state agencies. And I would hope that if we get anything out of this meeting, that we can work some type of MOU out since we are using the same process that the federal agencies use, including trace back and trace forward, that the use of the personnel that I can call within a moment's notice and put them on the road in the area where the problem may be, not is, but may be, so that we can take inspections of the field, we can take inspections of the produce, we can take inspections of the animals if it happens to be a, an animal uh, situation, and we can send it to our fern uh, approved laboratory that works with the federal government, and we can start on it immediately. We don't have to wait for a group at any level of the federal government to decide when we're going to do it, how many people we're going to send, how are we going to react to it. I can do it by a phone call. On 9-11, at the incident of 9-11, we were sitting in our office, or we were actually were having a cabinet meeting in the state of Florida. We pulled all of our agricultural leadership together for the state of Florida's department. We were not only taking pictures of people driving hazardous materials at our interdiction stations, which I have 23 of them that we operate in the state of Florida, but we sent our food inspectors out to the grocery stores to make sure no one was tampering with the food supply on the shelf on the day of 9-11. So we have the capabilities of doing these programs in concert with the federal uh, FDA and CDC. We do, not want to, we do not want to take over their jobs. What we want to do is do an MOU that says, if you don't have the personnel available, let's use our people to go get this done immediately so we can clear the state of Florida if that's the case or prove we have a problem. We do not want people in the state of Florida sick any more than any of the people in your states do. Um, we certainly uh, believe in protecting the public and our, and our tourists that come to the state of Florida, and we want to get to it as quickly as possible. But I think the way this will work the best is if we can work an MOU out so that we can put these people working together on the same issues to protect the people of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kawamura, uh, your opening statement, please. And um, please pull that mic up a little bit so we get curious. We'll do that. Clearly. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Stupak and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate this opportunity to address the committee about uh, the food supply of a 21st century. Uh, as the leading producer of fruits, vegetables, and nuts, and the leading producer of uh, dairy products, milk, uh, with a farm gate of over $32 billion, uh, California is a diverse supplier of food and other products to this nation, and we are a leader on food safety programs. Uh, in dealing with human health and the kind of outbreaks that we have seen, uh, human health is always going to be paramount. We recognize that that is a priority when we are looking at any kind of an outbreak. And we know that the focus then also must entail uh, recognizing that this food supply that we enjoy today uh, does come with tremendous uh, balance, uh, tremendous abilities to deliver food and especially perishable foods in a safe manner. The difficulty of having a quick and reliable uh, traceback system, I think, is one of the main focuses of this committee because by having a traceback system, we are able to quickly identify which products are and which products are not a part of any outbreak. And I think that is one of the focuses that we will have to uh, get to at the beginning, big, at the end of this session today. We recognize and understand that the Centers for Disease Control and, the, uh, and Prevention and the FDA have been working very hard with their resources to identify the sources of this recent outbreak and others in the past and will undoubtedly initiate more of a, f a full review of their processes as we move forward. We have directed growers and processors in our state to develop and implement 
written and scientifically based guidelines for food safety and food pre uh, safety prevention. We must also ensure that the public health and regulatory agencies develop and implement their written and scientifically based procedures for, for conducting these very complex investigations. We recognize that it is easy to look for quick fix fixes and why we look for someone to blame for the current Salmonella St. Paul outbreak. We must recognize that the complexities of our modern food system uh, are actually quite remarkable. It is a remarkable system that continues to improve with new technologies and advances through research. I, I would like to mention that I think after every outbreak, which we would like to prevent in the first place, but after every outbreak, this system improves. This pr the system tightens down. We are able to use the technologies of the day to modify, to improve, to eliminate those kinds of threats to the food supply, and that process takes place every day. I think the, uh, Mr. Barton from Texas mentioned that is this system broken or does it need a tune-up? And I would uh, submit to you today that this system needs a tune-up, basically using the 21st century tools that we have today. And my colleague, uh, Mr. Bronson, mentioned again the many resources and tools that we can converge to deal with food safety in our in our nation. Um, we also recognize that in our State of California, good ag practices has been a hallmark of what we continue to provide for this country, whether it was dealing with pistachios years ago with the uh, challenges of, uh, of fungus disease that uh, is found with them, whether it's, whether it's the almond industry and the adopted Federal regulations that they put into place uh, requiring raw almonds to undergo an approved pasteurization process. The California tomato industry as well in our State has developed tomato specific best practices uh, to uh, in, ensure that their tomatoes are produced uh, under uh, safe guidelines. These programs also require USDA trained inspectors to conduct random and continuous audits to ensure compliance with these programs. Uh, we recognize that the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, which brought together not only spinach but all the different vegetable products that are of the leafy green nature, uh, was uh, accomplished this last year and has uh, completed a successful year of voluntary compliance and audits that involves not only uh, the Departments of Agriculture here and at USDA, but FDA, Departments of Public Health and the industry in dealing with solutions using the technologies of today to get to the bottom of these causes of foodborne illnesses. Uh, in closing, I would like to mention that uh, we have many next steps that we need to deal with, and I'd let me go through those now. We must balance, then, the ability to uh, make sure and ensure public health and the public warning system uh, when we do have an outbreak, uh, with also the very important desire to make sure that our, uh, that our producers that are not implicated in an outbreak are not damaged. We encourage a better dialogue, then, between FDA, states, growers, handlers and retailers to identify good ag practices at all levels of the food chain. We, uh, prior to making a foodborne illness announcement, FDA should solicit states to provide commodity harvest data. This can minimize the guesswork and can limit the number of growers implicated in any outbreak. The grower shippers and distributors and retailers must agree on a standardized, uniform set of criteria that will follow a product from farm to point of service, enabling quick and accurate identification of the routes and sources of all products and all produce. We encourage more research dollars be spent on identifying the life cycle of foodborne illnesses, potential points of entry and kill step technology to ensure safe products. In our State, we work closely with the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security as well as the newly established Center for Produce Safety at UC Davis to improve methods of growing and safe handling of food products. Better surveillance and imported products uh, of imported products is critical. Consumers are relying more and more on a year-round supply of products that come from outside the United States. Programs must be established to do a better job of monitoring and testing food product imports. By monitoring our points of entry for repeat violators of false import declarations, making changes in import volumes at point of entry and random sampling of products for contaminants, we can more effectively identify sources of potential risk. We also then urge Congress to support states in the development of programs that result in the implementation and auditing of good, uh, good agricultural practices. And lastly, there must be funding to implement a uniform system for epidemiolo ep epidemiological reporting and investigating outbreaks in all states. And with that, uh, I, I will submit the rest of my testimony for the record and look forward to uh, continuing with this conversation today. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Um, may I want to use that mic right there. 
Uh, we have a large panel. We usually don't have that many people on a panel, uh, but uh, there is such great interest from uh, the growers and producers and the commissioners. We wanted to give everyone an opportunity. So, Mr. Brown, if you start your five-minute opening, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. The producers of tomatoes in Florida represent the largest single state's fresh tomato production system in the country. We dominate the supply of fresh tomatoes in the United States from May to November. We have, in fact, been the primary injured parties in this entire process, and we look forward to Congress addressing that concern and our injuries at some point in the future. We have a few recommendations we'd like to pass on to the committee and, and to the Congress. First of all, it's critical at the end to the entire tomato industry that FDA exercise its authority to establish mandatory guidance based on the commodity-specific guidelines for the tomato supply chain. This document was created by the industry in conjunction with science and with FDA, and we would offer that up as a program that could be implemented immediately by the FDA in a mandatory way as a guidance document for tomato production throughout the country and throughout North America. We also call for the initiation of regulations for mandatory food safety programs for tomatoes throughout the country. This is important that we don't establish a single program that forces uh, programs on various segments of the industry that are inappropriate because one size of a regulatory program will not fit all. But we encourage uh, FDA to move forward and we would encourage the Congress to move forward on bills such as H.R. 5904 to provide basis for those regulations going forward. We would encourage that the FDA, through consulting committees or some other structure, uh, create a mechanism for the industry and other representatives to be involved in these outbreaks. These consultants could be integrated early in the outbreak and we can avoid many of the complications and problems that I think we encountered in this unfortunate circumstance. These consulting groups could be constructed to where conflicts of interest and confidentiality could be uh, maintained and we also have the overriding common interest of the industry in public interest in making sure that we get this thing right. We would encourage FDA to uh, expand their current to tomato initiative program that they've operated for the last year and a half in both Virginia and Florida. We think those kinds of initiatives are important in giving the experiences and understanding and knowledge to the agency. It would assist in uh, their understanding the industry and we would encourage them to incorporate in those uh, tomato initiatives uh, trace back exercises for small, medium and large type growers and packers and repackers so they have a, a very functional understanding of our industry. We would encourage the FDA and CDC to develop improved risk communication tools for the future outbreaks that would increase the understanding of the actual risk probability in suspected items and the risk posed to the public. Good risk analysis, informed assumptions and recommendations would facilitate greater understanding for all concerned. Such improved communications would improve public health rather than promote public hysteria. We strongly urge the formation of a blue ribbon group of experts both inside and outside government to conduct an interview or a review of the handling of the 2008 salmonella outbreak by state and federal agencies. The purpose of this review would be to improve the effectiveness in handling future outbreaks. Learning from mistakes made is the only way to make the world a better place as a result of our unfortunate experience. We share the same interest in producing the safest tomatoes possible for consumers. It is a trust that we take extremely seriously in the tomato industry and we look forward to continuing to be leaders in the food safety arena for the American consumer. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning and I'll submit the rest of my testimony for the record in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Beckman, your opening statement, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. California Tomato Farmers Cooperative is the largest producer of fresh tomatoes for all of North America during the summer and fall. Our cooperative was formed in 2006 by 54 growers, large and small, who represent 80 percent of the fresh tomato production in California, and we require production based upon a higher food safety standard. 
As noted by the Secretary, we require mandatory random and unannounced food safety audits of all ranches, all packing houses by the California Department of Food and Agriculture. We are also the co-author of the new commodity-specific food safety guidelines for fresh tomatoes, and we support mandatory traceback at all levels. Although California was never associated directly with the Salmonella St. Paul outbreak, our members have indeed lost millions in sales in both domestic and international markets due to the broad warnings related to tomatoes. But our very real concern is that this may happen again, putting the consumer at risk, and that we may see a prolonged investigation that will further weaken trust in our food supply. FDA publicly noted the difficulty of their investigation, and we cannot help but ask specifically where was the problem. <coughs> Traceback should be able to trace fresh tomatoes from point of service to the field in hours, not days or weeks. Traceback of fresh tomatoes is based upon lot identification codes which travel with the product. The code is printed on all containers, included on all quality control records, production reports, and forms used in the shipping of the product. It is the foundation of traceability. As you know, we recently hosted a tour for the investigative staff of this committee demonstrating traceability of fresh tomatoes across state lines. The investigative staff directed the case study that I will detail to you today. In the slides provided to the committee, we will be tracing tomatoes from a single restaurant back to the grower through five handling points. And while the tomatoes move in one direction, traceback requires a two-way flow of information among all who handled the product, the store, the distribution center, the repacker, shipper, and grower. There are six steps to this traceback investigation. We begin with the Quality Assurance Vice President phoning a restaurant to obtain the date code on a random carton of tomatoes. That date code is relayed to the distribution center. In step two, the distribution center uses the date code to learn the product came in on July 7th from a repacker supplier. In step three, the supplier is phoned, provided with the purchase order for the shipment. This is the document. Using the purchase order, the supplier then determines the origin of the product in a single document. In the next step, the supplier holds the critical document to maintain traceability. It is a single document that documents the purchase order for incoming product and the final lot ID for unfinished product. It is this one single document that determines whether or not there had been any commingling of product and the source of all tomatoes used in the final product. In the final slide, we look at the role of the supplier who phones the shipper and, using the purchase order, obtains the original lot ID. The lot ID includes the complete field history and it is passed forward. The supplier, using this document, now has all records they need to pass forward to the food service chain. The time required for this traceback, as done for the investigative committee, was 35 minutes. Why did this traceback work? Well, the answer is the use of electronic record keeping that is based upon lot identification and also the Bioterrorism Act. What we did was linking one step up and one step back requirements of this act at each level of the supply chain. We believe that we must learn from this outbreak and investigation to ensure that future investigations do not take months. They should not. And we therefore recommend that Congress require an analysis of the FDA tomato investigation to include individual traceback records to effectively determine why this investigation of tomatoes was so lengthy. That FDA's tomato initiative be expanded to include tomato repackers, wholesalers, and traceability throughout the supply chain. And that FDA establish a pilot project that would establish mandatory food safety production and handling requirements based upon the just published commodity specific food safety guidelines for the fresh tomato supply chain. I would like to note this standard is already employed by our members in California and Florida. Together we represent 70 percent of the fresh tomatoes produced in the United States. By taking these already high standards national, we would improve preventative measures by all who produce and handle tomatoes, including smaller farms. But we caution, food safety is not limited to the grower in the packing house. It is the responsibility that must be shared by all, including supermarkets and restaurants, if we are to truly protect the consumer. 
This concludes my testimony, and I'll welcome any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beckman. Uh, Mr. Booth, opening statement, please, sir. Thank you. My name is Parker Booth, and I'm president of Delta Prepack, uh, a repack company, and Ace Tomato Company, Inc., a grower, packer, and shipper of tomatoes. Both entities are part of the Ligorio family of companies based in Manteca, California. Uh, today, while farming over 10,000 acres, 3,000 of those acres are planted with a wide variety of tomatoes. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Shemkus, and members of this subcommittee for the opportunity to testify before you on the topic of traceability within the fresh tomato industry and the impact this outbreak investigation has had on our two companies. A critical component of a food safety program is having the ability to trace where the product we pack for a customer comes from all the way back to the field. Traceback is not a passive process for any company. It must be aggressively managed every step of the way. This process requires a commitment from top to bottom within an organization with a culture of accountability no matter what the size of the company may be. Traceback from our, from our customer to the field can rapidly be completed using existing software programs. As a grower and shipper and also as a repacker, we are required to conduct mock recalls that test our ability to trace back product. Traceback is not an option. It's a requirement of doing business, and it works. I want to show you an example of a box that we had with, with our investigators uh, team that came out just uh, last month. Um, and it has on it the markings. You probably can't see it from, from your uh, seat there. But the essence is, from looking from the left side, as the lot number. There's a lot number. 23. There's also our state federal ID code, which is uh, the number for our shed, which tells us that's, that's who packed it. And finally, on the, the far right-hand side is the date that we actually packed the product. The, lo the lot code, which is on the far left, number 23, is the essence of the traceback. This is the number that starts everything. So when we actually harvest a field, we identify and label that particular field with a lot number, and that is what goes through the whole process. Uh, this is information, um, there's no way you can see this, but uh, this is uh, documentation and paperwork that actually supports that, uh, from pallet tags to lot ID numbers. And this is the information that will go all the way to a distribution house, all the way to a retail store, or all the way to a national chain distribution uh, with this information. Although Ace Tomato Company was not in production at the onset of this outbreak, Delta Prepack was marketing fresh tomatoes from both Mexico and Florida. The financial consequences of the inconclusive FDA traceback increased greatly as the Center for Disease Control expanded their warning beyond the original states of New Mexico and Texas. As the warning was expanded to all 50 states, our suppliers in Florida and Mexico were considered suspect as they remain within the scope of FDA's investigation. We have full confidence in our suppliers as we apply the same standard to the product they grow as we place on our own selves. It is important to note that we work closely each year with our growing partners along with our customers calibrating our food safety standards. This means we are on site in the fields, in the packing sheds, verifying protocols we have established in an effort to gain agreement between ourselves and our customers that the supply chain is as safe as possible but that confidence wasn't sufficient to retain our customers. Due to the blanket warnings by the FDA that Mexico and Florida were not safe, our customers were forced to require that we source from other states outside of our normal supply chain. In effect, we moved away from a supply chain that both our customers and ourselves had worked hard to ensure was as safe as possible. In effect, money, the money and resources we invested in our food safety efforts went for naught. Consequently, in the first week alone, we had to dispose of several hundred thousand dollars worth of perfectly good tomatoes, with the total impact from the two-month outbreak still being tallied. As a grower, shipper, and repacker of fresh tomatoes, we urge that Congress address the economic significance to all levels of the tomato supply chain that broad-based warnings uh, may have in fairly associated safe tomatoes with foodborne illness. Consideration needs to be given to the development of a more effective warning system that would allow companies to assess their particular positions much further in advance as information from the investigations are being collected. This is a, there is a critical time early in the suspected outbreak where the industry can provide supplemental guidance to the government investigative efforts in order to obtain quicker answers. 
This industry support could be from a panel of industry advisors whose purpose would be to work closely with the FDA to gain them a better understanding of our industry's distribution center uh, system from an outbreak before an outbreak occurs and to provide guidance during any future investigation. As it is, we've caused undue alarm to consumers of fresh tomatoes and undue financial hardship on an industry that contributes better than $1 billion in sales to the U.S. economy each year. This concludes my testimony, and I welcome any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stenzo, uh, your statement, please, sir. Good morning, Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tom Stenzel. I am President and CEO of the United Fresh Produce Association, a total supply chain association representing the fresh produce industry, multiple commodities from grower, packer, shipper, all the way through retail and restaurant. Uh, let me uh, broaden my testimony a bit now from specifically the tomato industry, but speak on behalf of our entire sector in fresh produce. We are totally committed to food safety and hold ourselves to rigorous standards in growing, handling, packing, and tracing our fresh foods. We strongly support federal oversight, mandatory federal oversight of commodity-specific risk-based rules. But this outbreak also shows us that government and industry alike have not spent sufficient time in the investigation process after an outbreak as we are spending in prevention of those. Today I want to uh, broaden the conversation a bit to some of the lessons I think we can learn from this investigation and hope to engage in a dialogue with the committee about some of these issues. Number one, there is no one in charge. Throughout the investigation it became clear that no one was in charge, leaving local, state and federal officials vying for leadership, various agencies pursuing different priorities, and well-meaning individuals reacting independently to events rather than part of a coordinated investigation moving forward in a logical and expeditious manner. We recommend that Congress require a command and control structure with a clear chain of command, take the guesswork out of who is in charge, drive real accountability and authority into this process. Second, we need better crisis preparedness and transparency in the process. The dispute today over the validity of early work by the states and CDC with food recall surveys in which tomatoes were indicted could have been avoided with properly vetted and peer-reviewed epidemiological tools ahead of time. Instead, we find CDC rewriting questions that they ask consumers in the middle of the outbreak and not sharing that data broadly. Even when FDA tried to do the right thing by creating a cleared list of regional tomato production areas, it was responding logically to the fact that many areas were not in production. But the cleared list became problematic and there was no easy way to explain how to get on the cleared list. Individual states were left having to call FDA to uh, advocate for their areas of production. And there is a serious question of equal treatment for all producers. And there was constant confusion about what data could be shared with industry and what could not. Uh, we went weeks asking for simple data such as the onset of illnesses, the geographic patterns of illnesses. We could have used knowledge from our food distribution systems to help in that process and we are told the data simply wasn't available. Number three, the current system doesn't use expertise outside of the agencies that's available. Uh, let me first say that industry input needs to be transparent and squeaky clean. We are not asking to run the investigation. But there is an abundance of knowledge in the industry about specific commodities, growing and handling practices and distribution systems, as you have heard from my colleagues, that can help protect public health. As this outbreak expanded to dozens of states around the country, we knew very early that it was highly unlikely that a single contamination point for tomatoes was possible, whether a single farm, packer or repacker. But industry's knowledge was ignored when it could have helped shift attention quickly to some other product, perhaps jalapenos. FDA and CDC should also welcome outside expertise not just from industry but also from academia, from USDA and State Departments of Agriculture. Number four, we believe government is ill prepared to make complex risk benefit decisions in the food area. Every health or safety regulatory decision requires an assessment of risk and benefits. Yet in the case of foodborne disease, FDA and CDC seem ill-prepared to grapple with risk management other than an all-or-nothing approach. This leads to the extreme measures of banning all tomatoes or banning all jalapenos in the quest for zero risk. 
But is it really zero risk when 99.999% of the tomatoes available in the market are perfectly safe and we are scaring consumers away from a, a high lycopene product that can protect against uh, prostate cancer? There is another part of public health that we have to take into account here as well as um, the concept of talking about the entire tomato supply. Finally, the risk communication process that is in use is unacceptable. These are tough issues. They are tough to explain. But how many times have we listened to CDC and FDA media calls where the first five minutes was explaining there is nothing new in the investigation and the next 55 minutes are explaining and speculating about what may have happened, what may be happening, what may be plausible, what may be theoretical, but not what the facts are. Yet any risk communication expert would advise precision and care in communicating exactly what you want to say and not speculating beyond what is known. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, much of the discussion today I think is going to focus on traceability. I would like to uh, add some perspectives on that perhaps in the question session. My colleagues, I think, have shown you uh, some of the industry experience with traceability. Uh, frankly, we are confused. We don't understand where some of the problems the FDA is reporting in our systems. So it's something that we really do want to address. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard, for an opening statement, and as we all talked about our ninth hearing, I think you've been here for all nine. We appreciate your uh, work and willingness to work with us and your patience and uh, your insight to this issue. So we look forward to your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have written comments, but I'll make just a few oral ones. It is unfortunate that we're here yet again talking about yet another failure by the FDA. And, um, and I'm sorry you're having to go through that, but I think the public is sorrier. The, um, as you know, I've expressed the view that many of the problems have not been of FDA's doing, that uh, there have been shortfalls uh, other places that have caused FDA to be ineffective. And I think there are many issues for Congress to deal with in this particular outbreak, uh, how the government's organized, how the FDA is organized, how federal-state relations occur, how well the industry can can track and otherwise do its job. But I'd like to focus my uh, comments, if I could, just on three areas, all dealing with FDA's capacities. First, the agency's food safety resources have not kept up with the responsibilities that have been given them. In fact, they've been, we've been taking down the food safety system at FDA for several years. We're reducing staff at a time in which we need people even more at the agency. We need uh, more inspections. Uh, we, we need the scientists uh, to deal with these emerging pathogens, and, and it's been going the other way. So I, I think that is a tremendous piece of the problem at FDA. But by, by taking down a program at a time it needs to be strengthened, we're, we're, simply, we're simply going the, the other way. But FDA also needs to be able to acquire food processors to implement a system of preventive controls. We need to prevent these things from occurring, not just chase them after the fact. As you know, preventive controls are well-proven mechanisms for keeping food safe in the first place from, from being contaminated. Mr. Dingell's bill attempts to do that, and I certainly wish you well in, in that effort. You may know that FDA tried to use its existing authority last year to impose preventive controls over produce. But the administration rejected the recommendations of the agency's scientists to do that. And I think that's proven to be a grievous mistake. Just think we could be well on our way to having regulations for preventive controls for produce in effect today, but essentially we're nowhere because of that, that denial. So I think that was a tremendous mistake. And I urge Congress to proceed with its efforts to establish a system of preventive controls. And my third point relates to traceability. When Congress enacted the Bioterrorism Act in 2002, it intended to give the agency the authority to, to track these products so that you would have a, a rapid ability to follow up on a potential terrorism attack throughout the supply chain. But instead of having a robust records keeping system that allowed for rapid access to complete records by all participants, the agency got and ended up with delayed access to partial records from only some elements of the supply chain. So we, we've weakened those records tremendously. And I think the Salmonella incident demonstrates how the weakening of those uh, rules essentially negated the intent of Congress. So just imagine, uh, Mr. Chairman, if the Salmonella outbreak had been a terrorist attack and thousands or hundreds of thousands of people had been at risk of death and disease, how, how much of a failure those rules, that record-keeping requirement would have been. And I think we need to look at it in that context 
uh, for future consideration. Now, the good news is, as Mr. Jett and others have said, there are effective technologies available to provide for uh, successful traceback. Some produce firms have demonstrated it, but the problem is we're only as strong as our weakest link. And those small firms that have not been able to, to do effective traceback, I think, need to be addressed. So the means are available to improve the situation, and I hope you'll be a strong supporter of those means. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we talk a good game about food safety. We say we care about it. We say we're going to do more. But we just haven't backed it up, that rhetoric up with, with necessary support, in my view, for FDA. I do not believe we can make FDA an effective agency without giving it additional resources and authority. These problems, as we're talking about, they're going to keep going. We're going to have more of these outbreaks. This is going to be an endless process until we fix the system. So I hope Congress will agree with those and, and move to make it so. And thank you for giving me the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to present those views. Well, thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Uh, we'll begin questions. I, I guess the uh, more or less, at least to me and up here, sitting up here, the, the last 12 hours sort of epitomized how this whole investigation has gone. About uh, 9, 10 last night we got a release from the uh, FDA about uh, jalapeno in, in uh, Mexico. Then about 10, 15 we had a correction. And uh, 8, 9 o'clock this morning we had another one. So we've had about three releases in the last 12 hours on what's going on with this investigation. Now I don't know if that's the quality of the investigation or the fact we're having this hearing here today. But let me ask this question of this panel. Now this investigation started out with Salmonella St. Paul and detailing uh, tomatoes. Has there been any Salmonella St. Paul, Salmonella, found in any tomatoes in the United States? I, I take it none, correct? None, okay. And then at the time when we started this, uh, May 22nd, the only state I understand that was growing tomatoes at the time would have been Florida, right? It's okay. So any other tomatoes would have had to come either Florida or I guess Mexico would be the other source, right? Okay. I'm sorry, put, put that up there, Mr. Brown. It would have been Florida. Not primary source. Uh, the, the Florida was the primary domestic supplier at that point. Right. Uh, and then the other one would have been other foreign been countries, primarily mostly Mexico. And, Mexico. And matter of fact, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the morning after we were informed that there was concern, we provided data for a period of 30, 60 days okay. prior to that as to where every tomato in the country came from. Okay. Now, we eventually get to the jalapenos, right, after Minnesota gets there. And believe it or not, we got one today. Okay. But Florida, Mr. Booth, you mentioned about Florida, and Mr. Brown, you mentioned your process you have for tomatoes, the box and all the markings, did the FDA help you with that? I mean, were they aware of your system? Did they help you develop it? We've had positive lot identity for round tomatoes in Florida for going on close to 20 years under a federal marketing order. Okay. We had worked with the FDA in working up our state regulatory program that we were voluntarily implementing and we now have under state regulation. Okay, but as of today, Tomatoes are still suspect, correct? Unfortunately. Or as we call it, the, uh, the vegetable of interest, right? So the person of interest is still the vegetable yeah, of interest. We're, we're still indicted and convicted in the media. Okay. But yet we never had any. And now we're at a jalapeno from Mexico, right? Okay. Well, I've got a double dare with shimkus. We're going to eat it yet today. Um, <laughs> give me the box. This is a box we got today. There's no markings like you had to show your area, right? All it says is produce of the United States, net weight 25 pounds. And just says tomatoes on it. Okay, we got a local retailer here today. Now, Mr. Booth, your box had those markings on. Is it legal to use your box? I mean, you ship it to, let's say you ship it up here to Washington, D.C., okay? And can a grower take that box with all its markings on, put tomatoes in it, even if it wasn't from Florida? In other words, can you reuse that box again and again and again? As long as they maintain the records. Okay, but they would have to wipe out the coating? 
that you that, have on it? That have, they, when, when a repacker takes that, they're going to have to, when they repack it, they're going to have to take the original lot number, okay. the original information, and put their own information on it. Okay. Now, only California and Florida has that system, right? So the other 48 states are, they can be sending boxes like this here, correct? Mr. Chairman, this is yeah. why the industry has stepped forward in conjunction with FDA and, and the Correct. research community and created this document which would resolve and solve that issue in requiring that every person in the country that grows and handles tomatoes maintains that information, passes it so up. So you want a federal regulation saying yes, you must sir. do it this way? We want whether a level tomatoes, playing field with good information whatever it might be. because the public trust is so important to us, we can't afford to do it any other way. Okay. What is the cost of doing that? Of putting that code on there and have that trace back. Is it, can anyone give me an estimate? Because that is always a question we ask. What is it going to cost us? Mr. Booth? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, Mr. Stenso? It, it is um, not sure what the cost is. It, it, in, the large, is in the largest cost. Is it minimal thing, or? It is minimal. It is minimal. It's minimal. It, it's minimal. Okay. Any, the point being is that any size firm, large or small, can do this. Okay. It does not have to be fancy and it does not have to be expensive. Okay. Now, you said, Mr. Beckman, you, you traced back that tomato that you did in California for the staff and, and they learned a lot from you guys. That was all within California, though, right? It was, but. So, what if that tomato goes to Michigan, where I'm from? We actually were able to produce for the investigative staff a number of tracebacks throughout the United States. That included product from California, Florida, and Virginia going into multiple states. For example, one of the tracebacks was from California to Colorado. Okay. How long did that take? That one took about five hours. Okay. But I can give you a story that took place yesterday if you would like. Okay, but the point is you can do it, right? Yes, we can. Right. And there is minimal cost. Okay. The cost actually that we can say is it is a part of a business culture and it is not significant. So the cost that we pay in California to validate our process runs about a penny a box. Okay. So let's go back to Florida. Let's go back to May 22nd. We have Salmonella. Florida is the only place growing, but Florida has this system right, to track everything. So if people are getting in sick in New Mexico and Texas, that seems to be June 3rd is when they put the place out, couldn't they have gone and say, okay, Florida, have you sent to Texas and New Mexico in this area, wherever it is? Could, could they have done that? Yeah. They were advised uh, in early conversations that the supply chain or the supply system for tomatoes in the country is basically bifurcated by east and west. Yes. Florida dominates the eastern supply system, right. the Mexican supply source dominates the western supply system, and because of the well, energy cost, we don't move them back and forth very often. And right. there, there may have been some minimal amount of tomatoes in that marketplace, but they would have been but insignificant. Would California then would have been the big supplier to Texas, New Mexico then at that time, right? Only uh, when they come into production and they follow us. We were at a transition zone between. When, when, did, when does California go in production? California had started this year on May 17th, was the first field harvest of Cali uh, California. Okay, so we are on June 3rd, so they could have possibly been. No, at that point, uh, knowing what the, in the initial yeah. outbreaks uh, as they took place, we knew that California had not been in production at that time and we were able to verify that with FDA at the time. So why did we make tomato vegetable of interest then? It was still a vegetable of interest throughout the rest of the production areas of the state. I know the early, uh, one of the early announcements from FDA was that California was not a part of this outbreak based upon the, the harvest schedules that we were aware of. Okay. Could country of origin labeling have narrowed the focus here in your estimation? Anyone, Mr. Beckman, any, would that have helped? It could perhaps help, but the problem was that the association was with all tomatoes, and so we had a scenario where all tomatoes were suspect, and then as the safe list was produced, we were essentially trying to back individual states away from an association of guilt, and that is extremely difficult. Okay. So the thing we need right now from the FDA is a firm statement that tomatoes are not even vegetable of interest. They have nothing to do with this salmonella outbreak. Because we still, if I look at the last line here, it says FDA announced that it is determined that fresh tomatoes now available in the domestic market are not associated with the current outbreak. As a result, agency removed its June 7th warning. And my problem is with that is they have never cleared tomatoes from the original outbreak. No. Correct. You are correct, Mr. That Chairman. Is, but we still we have this suspicion over the. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I yeah, might as well uh, uh, enter in this. Uh, 
One of the things that we noticed very early on was when the outbreak took place in, in Texas and New Mexico and began to go north of there, um, we were selling tomatoes out of Florida all over the southern United States, all over Florida, but we didn't have sicknesses in Florida. So we, we were suspicious right then right. that Florida tomatoes, grown tomatoes, were not a part of this problem from the very beginning. And I, I think we need to, while we have to follow the scientific method, we also shouldn't throw away common sense and risk assessment that says if you know this is where the outbreak is the, is the most seen, there's a good chance it's coming either across the border or from within a state or two of that outbreak uh, because the South had no cases at the time. And the other issue, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like for you to consider, because someone from Florida goes to the doctor with a sickness that ends up being uh, Salmonella St. Paul, they may have gotten it in Texas. They should not be, uh, sure. they should not be counted as a Florida uh, sickness because it may have been picked up while they were traveling, and that is the case in a number of these. Well, I'm looking at the CDC uh, investigation outbreak of infections caused by Salmonella St. Paul dated uh, July 29th, and when you look at it, they have the breakdown of 1,319 people, 1,319 people infected, only 11 is from California and 4 is from Florida. So with the mass of them, of course, being uh, Texas with 502 and New Mexico 106, so I guess that proves your point. Mm -hmm. One question, and I, I'm, my time is way over, and I just want to ask Mr. Hubbard a question, because we're talking a lot about traceability here and suspect vegetables and that, but let me ask you this one. On July 25th, the Associated Press ran an article entitled, Food Industry Bitten by Its Lobbying Success, Companies Oppose Electronic Tracking That Could Locate Source, Outbreak Source. The gist of this article is that there were some within the FDA that were advocating a much stronger record keeping and traceback system than what we currently have today underneath the Bioterrorism Act. However, due to heavy pressure from industry, many of the requirements were watered down. Mr. Hubbard, you were an Associate Commissioner of Policy at the FDA at that time. What systems were being proposed and how did these systems differ from what we're using today or what we've seen in California and Florida? Well, as I said, the, uh, I think the agency wanted a lot of the things that folks are talking about here now, lot numbers, rapid access, uh, record keeping throughout the chain. I, I won't deny that the industry may have had a come to Jesus moment in, in recent years, but in 2003, the message from the industry to the Office of Management Budget, which was reviewing the reg, was too expensive, too hard, don't do this. So again, I, I, I'm very gratified to hear the progress that's been made, but when FDA was doing its regulations, it was being literally, ha literally hammered for proposing things that were viewed by many members of the industry as too much. Uh, one more. <laughs> Mr. Beckman, it, 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 didn't it really say, did, did you tell our staff that to do that tracing on, on that box there, isn't it like a penny a box? It's a penny a box for the verification. The actual costs are, again, insignificant. Okay. Mr. Shimkus for questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good, good round of questions. Maybe we should go, you know, 10 minutes, one round or whatever. So, yeah, and whatever. Uh, the, uh, but it's all, you know, I like to talk about on the business end and talk about raising a capital, assumption of risk, return on the investment. And part of this is, a payment to lower the risk. And obviously there's been a big loss. Now the, the gr growers have in intimated uh, that um, obviously there should be some recovery. Um, and there could be a debate on takings based upon response. And I don't know if and how that will resolve itself. Hope, but, you know, the thing I want to focus on it, to begin with, I had a um, a whole bunch of scribbled notes from the testimonies. It's very good. But first off, for Mr. Bronson, and we have the, the timeline here. And so it's June 3rd, 2008, FDA warned consumers in New Mexico and Texas not to eat certain types of raw red tomatoes. Now, you, your opening statement said you were 99.9% .9 sure it wasn't Florida. On June 3rd, how close to June 3rd did you know there's no way it was a F Florida tomato. Congressman, we, um, because of our program that we implemented and third party verification, which is as close to HACCP in most other fields of um, food safety as you can get, 
the fact that we had no single person in the state of Florida that was showing Salmonella St. Paul or any other kind of Salmonella that we were aware of because our, our people in, uh, in our county and state health departments would have been in touch with us if it had shown up. Um, we had that good a working relationship and the fact that we were shipping all over the southeast United States and there was no cases. So what's the date? Uh, How close were you to that June 3rd time frame? And you said it's not here. It highlights the communication aspect of the FDA. That's the only reason why I'm asking it. About June. Well, I'm saying I'm hearing now from my deputy uh, commissioner who's in charge of food safety around. They were very sure by the time we analyzed what we were getting by the 15th of June, right. there was no way Florida was responsible. Well, no Florida tomatoes. The only thing I'm highlighting, we know there's areas to be fixed. One's communication, Phil, you all mentioned it communication uh, across the board with all agencies, transparency, and an early notification of information and acceptance could help limit losses. Um, I, 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 you know, I think, and that's, a, that's an issue. But I want to highlight, I mean, we're all FDA, beat up FDA. Trace back, although it was slow, Mr. Stencil, trace back worked in this, in this system, did it not? I think, Mr. Shemkus, that uh, you've identified a, a very key part of our discussion here. The real issue where this started is in the identification of tomatoes at the CDC. Uh, everything in traceback would prove that tomatoes were not the cause. Everything that was traced back showed tomatoes came from different sources. There was no common point of contamination. Could, there, could that have been done more quickly, more effectively? If it could, I want to know how. I, I want the FDA to show us where they, they ran into roadblocks. These types of systems that my colleagues have talked about are precisely in place also for many Mexican tomatoes. So many of the tomato products, this industry, because it has been, been bitten in the past, has done a fantastic job of putting in place extensive traceability. So we don't understand what that, that slowness was, but in this case, Traceability showed tomatoes were not the cause. 1,400 samples, not one, I, one positive. Um, and the key, you know, I, I really, we ought to have a hearing from the CDC and the state health departments. I mean, that's, that's the, the hearing today ought to be. I mean, we, we, because that's where, in this case, the system failed. Mr. Shimkus, I think it's very difficult, and, and this is an issue that I think you've got to grapple with with the uh, agencies, is how do they back away from an initial uh, uh, association? Uh, we, they still won't do it. They're still, even in the uh, press releases today, clinging to the theoretical plausibility that perhaps tomatoes from near these Mexican farms might have been involved in the early stages. I guess that's still possible, and, and we'll have to hold judgment. But my goodness, we now know that the initial month of activity that said tomatoes are it and we're, by darn, we're going to prove tomatoes are it, they didn't do it. They just found tomatoes were not it. Mr. Hubbard, you have to agree that as much as we're focused on FDA, it's this issue of the CDC and the public health departments and why they didn't, uh, I'm not a criminal, I'm not a criminal investigator, but, you know, when we were doing, I was doing the prep for this. Um, with my understanding, they limited the suspects instead of having all the suspects, like, you know, everyone in the, the room, instead of they focused, it on, they focused on a commodity product, not all the commodity products. Absolutely. FDA chases the food that the CDC questionnaire process identifies. And epidemiology is an inexact science, and I'm sure you'll hear that from the CDC folks. I'm sure they did the best they could, but FDA was chasing down the results of the CDC recommendation. And let, let me go uh, to Mr. Beckman real quick, because uh, I want to follow up. I think I made my point on the CDC and the, and the public health departments, but um, uh, this this issue that we did on tracing the tomatoes to the retail location, which was a jack-in-a-box, um, uh, the chairman followed up with across state lines. Uh, the, the question I would ask is smaller mom-and-pop retail locations, uh, family restaurants, um, or tomorrow um, is Friday, uh, my American Legion Post 365 does a weekly 
fish fry, of course, the only way Illinoisans love to eat fish is cod and it's deep fried. So, uh, um, and they'll have tomatoes. Can this process uh, that we're talking about, obviously a major retailer, it's just that whole debate, has the, have the resources, can do the IT, can, can do all the process. What about my local American Legion Post 365 that really relies on the fish fry to bring an in income to help serve our veterans? Can they do that too? Well, first let's look at the state of California and the fact that in the California Code, all tomatoes must be traceable at all points in the system. That includes the smaller players. But to answer your question as to outside of California, again referencing the tomato supply chain guidance document, what we looked at is where are the weaknesses in the Bioterrorism Act? Is there a weakness in the fact that an individual mom and pop restaurant isn't required to maintain such a level of documentation? Traceback can simply begin with an invoice an invoice that we recommend in this document be held for at least six months so that way we know where those tomatoes came from. There has to be that initial piece of paper right now. Those outlets are exempt from the Bioterrorism Act record keeping requirements. Let me go um, to uh, Mr. Booth for a second and um, talk because you, you, you deal with all. You're a grower, you're, you're a supplier, you're a repackager. Right. What about the repackage? In repackaging of uh, the other thing in, in our research talked about sizing of tomatoes uh, from maybe different growers. Does that happen? And then how do you tr say say you're a repackager and you have a multitude of growers mm. and they're so they're coming into your facility, you're repackaging by size and weight versus where it came from. And so then in that box, could there be? more than one and does that code, I, then does it identify that this came from four different locations versus one location? Is that how that works? Yeah, look, well maybe I can just take a minute and just uh, give you an example of how that might work. We, we will buy at any given time from multiple growers. Uh, today, this minute, Delta, uh, our repack company, is actually purchasing product that we actually grow uh, in multiple different fields. Uh, we're going to be purchasing uh, this week product from other growers, uh, competitors to our other baseline company, Ace Tomato. Um, the way we handle and, and uh, the lot identification is identical, whether it's our product uh, coming from our fields or to another, from another grower. And that grower could also come from Mexico, so it's identical. The uh, product comes into our repack facility. We run that product to size and spec um, uh, specifications that our customers give us. Uh, by lot, so that one lot goes all the way through our process. Uh, so in a box that I just that I showed you a few minutes ago, you'll have one lot of, inf of uh, tomatoes in there, just just one. <clears throat> commingling has been talked about a lot, and I think that's been discussed, and it's a little bit confusing as what commingling really is. Um, if you do have multiple lots in one case, you need to make sure that you've got the documentation to prove that there's multiple fields, multiple lots in that box. We don't want to do that. We really don't want to mingle a particular box. Uh, as I showed your, your congressional investigators, on a pallet, you may have one case out of 80 that is from a different lot than the other 79 boxes. As long as you have the documentation, that shows that that box came from a particular lot, you're okay. You can trace that back. Um, and if there is an outbreak or if there's a suspected um, outbreak of a particular case that goes to that restaurant, you can again follow that all the way back to the lot. Um, I, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, again, I'll, I'll want to end by saying CDC, st State Health Department, uh, we've got to bring them in the loop and, and empower them to make some better decisions. I missed again for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really want to thank each of you on this panel because you've really uh, quite thoroughly explained to us that we can do traceability, that it's cost effective, and we can do it even with mixed lots. What I want to talk about is why do we need to have some kind of a national system of traceability? Now, um, Commissioner Bronson, in your state, you have mandatory traceability for tomatoes, correct? That is correct. And also, um, Secretary, uh, 
Kawamura, we have that mandatory traceability in your state as well for tomatoes, correct? Yes, we do. And um, Mr. Beckman, you talked today and, and also um, I met with you and you talked to me about how quickly and effectively we can trace tomatoes if we have a traceability system, right? Correct. In, in fact, you, you, the story you wanted to tell Mr. Stupak was you folks bought some sandwiches at Subway and went and did, ran a trace on those tomatoes at Subway and you were able to do it in a few hours, right? Correct. And, and um, that's because Subway requires traceability for its tomatoes, right? Correct. I'm not sure that the, that the uh, whatever it is, the fish fry people might have mandatory traceability. But that's... No, I don't think we do. That's yeah. the whole point. Exactly. That's the whole point. And, and so, Mr. Stenzel, you might be able to answer this broader... We, we, we're really clear on what's going on with tomato traceability, but part of the problem we've got is we don't have national tomato traceability. Um, right, Mr. Beckman? I mean, it's it, some industry, some producers have it, some industries, some states have it, but it's not a national system, right? It's fair to say that uh, if you are a major tomato grower and shipper and want to do business with major corporations, you absolutely must have it. But, That's right. not to say that there are not some growers in some areas of this country that do not maintain traceability. But in addition, it's, traceabi it's, it's, it's vertical traceability, not horizontal traceability, because it's traceability for that grower. It's, it's not a national system of traceability that the national tomato growers have instituted for everybody. Well, traceability begins at but the grower can you, shipper. I'm sorry. I don't have a lot of time. Okay. Yes or no? Uh, please repeat the question. Is it a national system of traceability that's interoperable for all of the tomato growers? It is not a national okay. system. Okay. No. Uh, Mr. Stenzel, um, now you represent broader numbers of growers, and I understand the way you trace a tomato may not be the same way that you would trace green beans or, or other produce, correct? Correct. But there are other types of traceability systems that would work for almost any kind of commodity, correct? Well, yes, ma'am. And, and so what I've been thinking about is this recent salmonella outbreak. And, and it appears that what happened is people, let's, let's step all the way back to the beginning, um, the, the um, public health sleuths talking to people found out that they had eaten probably salsa or something that had tomatoes and uh, chili peppers in it, correct? Yes, ma'am. And so, so if you were trying to do traceability on that, um, it would be really helpful if you could break down the components of that and be able to trace them, whatever the system was. Is that right? Certainly in any processed food or a mixture of different ingredients, um, <laughs> it gets much more complex, but you would want to be able to trace the individual ingredients. And that would have helped us in this situation if, if, I mean, it would have helped the tomato industry if the FDA investigators and the CDC would have said, okay, let's, let's trace all of the tomatoes that were involved in this in this salsa, and, and if you had had a quick system, you could have resolved the tomato problem much more quickly than it was resolved, I would assume. Well, I think our concern, uh, Congresswoman, is that we believe that across the board there are these systems in place, particularly in the tomato industry, and that the, the traceback actually showed that it was not the tomatoes. Uh, okay. Th this was not a, a matter of inability to track tomatoes and where they came from. Right. It was the confusion with other ingredients that perhaps well, were in Well, let's salsa. talk about that. So let's say we had a traceability system, for, a traceback system for jalapeno peppers and cilantro and the other ingredients. We, if that would have moved faster, we would have been able to resolve this, this situation much more quickly to the benefit of the growers of the, of the, of the vegetables that were not contaminated, right? Our industry has the highest um, incentive to resolve these things quickly to protect health and to prevent damage to the industry. Exactly. If, if the CDC scientists had had any concerns about other ingredients, they could have been tracked. Once the uh, investigators Do we have the same kind looking, of system for jalapenos that we do for one, tomatoes? And not nearly uh, as effective. But once they started looking for jalapenos, they have tracked them extremely effectively. Right. But We're if back we, at the individual farm in Mexico today with today's traceability with one of the most complicated small items uh, that doesn't have these elaborate systems. Right. 
So, but, but if we had a national system, not maybe one type of traceability, but if everybody had to do it and it was interoperable, we could have done this much more quickly. Wouldn't that be fair to say? I am not convinced that the traceability investigation of FDA was the lagging factor in this case. Okay. We, you we think it was the need, identification? We need to improve our traceability, and that's something the industry is taking very, very seriously. Okay. Uh, and a national program in the tomato industry, I should also say, is important. Okay. One, Let, one uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't have much time, and I have one more topic I want to talk about with Mr. Hubbard. And welcome back. I, I was you. just telling staff I feel <laughs> like we should just put you on the roster every time we have an FDA hearing. I want to talk to you about the 2002 Bioterrorism Act because some people have said that provides us with the federal tools we need to do traceability. And, and I, um, I, I know you don't entirely agree with that and I wanted to explore that with you. Um, in your testimony, you, talk, you provide a side-by-side -side analysis in your written testimony of the key weak points introduced into the original legislation. And, and regulation as it was reviewed and considered by administration reviewers. So I, I want to go through those because I think that kind of gives us some sense why maybe that act is not helping us trace as much as we want. Uh, what you say is uh, what FDA wanted or needed and the final rules. Now, FDA wanted records by all sources and recipients, but farms and restaurants were excluded, correct? That's correct. And um, for, uh, FDA wanted foreign firms as well as U.S., but the foreign firms were excluded from the final legislation. In the rulemaking process, yes. Um, uh, they wanted a complete record of the food's movements, but what ended up, and I think this is maybe the biggest flaw, is only one step up and one step back, correct? That's correct. Um, they wanted lot numbers for each shipment, and that was denied in the rulemaking, correct? Mr. Absolutely. I mean, the consumer groups pushed very hard for that, but the uh, industry view was that lot numbers would be too expensive to, um, to maintain. And um, the FDA also wanted electronic records for speed, and that was denied, correct? Obviously, yeah. If you can just go on the computer and, and, and punch it up, you can do it a lot faster than going through thousands of pieces of paper. Um, they wanted records access within four hours, and that was extended to 24 hours. Is that correct? Right. Four hours doing normal business hours, uh, eight hours if they ask in the middle of the night, but uh, it got extended to 24. Um, they wanted a consistent record format, and that was denied, correct? Yeah, I mean, FDA Now, why is that important? Are, well, FDA inspectors are now finding, you know, they'll go into a firm and, and, and someone will have great records and others will have just bills of lading. And I, I've had anecdotal, anecdotal examples given to me of people have records on a plain paper bag or other, you know, all kinds of different formats where you've got to really search through for the various information you need instead of it all being there rapidly accessible. Um, and that was part of the problem with this recent salmonella outbreak, is, is the records problem. Absolutely. I mean, one anecdote was a, uh, a Florida tomato packer, I'm told, uh, literally ran out of supply and couldn't get any more Florida tomatoes, so he, he bought some Mexican tomatoes. Imagine how that could complicate a traceback by FDA to have this, this a foreign product enter into the Florida, main, into the Florida stream when, when you know, that could just be a tremendous uh, fly in the ointment, as they say. Um, furthermore, the FDA wanted authority to verify the keeping of records, and that was also denied, right? I'm sorry. I, I, the FDA wanted the authority to verify keeping of records. Yeah, the problem there is we, the, way the, the way the rule was set up, if, if an inspector goes in to do a routine food inspection, they say, well, let me see your records in case there's ever an outbreak. The firm can say, no, you can only see the record if there's an outbreak. So the inspectors are not able to confirm that the industry is doing what they need to do to prepare to for sure. when there is an outbreak. And that's kind of nuts if you ask me, but that's the way the rule came now, out. Now, let me ask you this. For what you say the FDA wanted or needed, that sounds like a pretty good description of a national traceability system as these gentlemen have been describing today, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. If we gave them these authorities, let me just ask you, in your opinion, would this investigation and further investigations have been expedited so that we could protect public health and I, I also certainly business? think that to the extent traceback was the issue, they could have much more rapidly identified that tomatoes were being excluded, and then the industry would have been spared a huge expense, and they could have gotten to the peppers more quickly, and, we, and a lot of people would have been saved a lot of distress, absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Burgess for questions. Ten minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Stansel, um, and I apologize for being in and out with the other hearing going on. In response to a, a question by Mr. Jett of Colorado, you said that traceability was not the lagging factor. You started to tell us what that was, so would you tell us what that was? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the initial identification of tomatoes uh, as the sole source uh, of contamination uh, really sent us down you know, the wrong path. Uh, as Mr. Hubbard said, it is FDA's responsibility then to investigate uh, precisely what CDC has already identified as the villain or the vegetable of, of interest, if you will. Uh, in that process, we have heard claims that there was uh, slowness or slow in traceability. But as you have heard from other witnesses here on the, the uh, panel, we don't understand where that slowness would have occurred. We need to see the specific examples, not the anecdotal stories. Uh, it is not uncommon for growers to substitute new product from other regions, but they can keep track of that quite well in the systems that are in place. So we don't understand where that slowness would have occurred. The initial time that FDA did a trace back from someone who was ill in Virginia and it went to a Florida farm, and then they did a trace back of someone who was ill in Illinois and it went to a Mexican farm, they should have known it was not a common source. That could have happened in the first day. The very first day we could have done trace backs. I think we did do trace backs, and I would like to understand what trace backs were done uh, to confirm that there was not a common source of contamination. Why did it then take three weeks or four weeks? There was a bias, I believe, in terms of we must prove it is tomatoes because that is what CDC has said. That was their epidemiological evidence. Until we got off that horse and realized that there was something else that we hadn't figured out early enough, by well-meaning scientists, but we had not figured it out early enough that it was really something else causing the illnesses. Now, we talk a lot up here about things like mandatory recalls going down the wrong path like that, had there been a mandatory recall, it might have in fact been more deleterious to the industry. Is that correct? I can't imagine it, it would have been worse. Um, we have a mandatory ban of all tomatoes. So, so we pretty much uh, suffered. Um, you know, our industry, the produce industry, supports mandatory recall authority for the FDA, uh, but their press releases are pretty darn effective too. Okay. Let me, uh, Dr. Hubbard, uh, Mr. Hubbard again, and, and thank you for being here. Just like. Uh, Mr. Jett, I, I feel like uh, you're, you're part of a part of the committee. You're here so frequently. You mentioned in your testimony, and I was watching on television upstairs. You said that we're only as strong as our weakest link, and this thing under the Bioterrorism Act, the the exception for a company that has ten or fewer employees, keeps keeps coming up. Do you have an opinion as to how that weak link might be tightened up so that we don't face these problems? Sure. The this is an old story to FDA that. Small firms tend to drive rulemaking because the even though small firms, in this case, I imagine 90 percent of the fresh produce is managed by large firms, but they're, they're usually a large number of small firms, and they make a powerful argument that a strict regulation could uh, drive them out of business or adversely affect them. Here, I would think with the kind of technology Mr. Jett is talking about available, I would hope that there would be ways to uh, identify. Will the gentleman yield? I'm going to put on the record. This is. Diana DeGette, so from I, my colleague from Texas and Mr. I, Hubbard. Uh, <laughs> now we are on the record. I apologize, Ms. It, ki it kind of sounds more exotic, though. Right. It does. That That's why I used it. Um, that there could be off-the-shelf technology or other inexpensive ways to give the smaller firms access to the kind of tracing mechanisms that Ms. DeGette has mentioned as, um, as the, the proper uh, uh, way to do it and, and reduce some of those costs. But clearly the costs are going to drive decision making here unless we can help the small uh, manufacturers, in this case the small produce producers. So is it, is it an issue of being able to provide them the, the funding or the backup for those systems or is it, a, is it a, a, a just simply getting them into the process? Well, I think I think it's more the latter. Imagine you're you know you're a small producer and, and you don't you're not sophisticated in technology. You don't have the funding to to have a, an expert come in and create a system from scratch. But someone says, look, there's established uh, software and hardware that you can purchase uh, and 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 get get into the system with the, with the big guys. I would think that that would much much lower the cost for those if if they had a easily off the shelf uh, access to the technology. 
let me uh, let me ask you another question. I mean, you heard my my anxiety about the inability to to actually do something definitive on the Friday where this was all finally sorted out that we Peppers are the culprit, and again on TV we're hearing the FDA's recommendation is you ask where the peppers came from, and that seemed like a, a fairly incomplete response to be to, to be delivered. Is there is there something better we can do when we find there's a problem? And we talked about mandatory recalls and letters do everything that, that they do. But at the same time, we have to have a way, I think, of stopping that stuff from coming in the country. Our border has to be secure from preventing what we've now identified as a contaminated product from come, entering in the stream of commerce. Well, first of all, in terms of communication to the public, imagine if CDC or FDA had said, we're 90 percent certain it's tomatoes or 80 percent or whatever, and they didn't tell anybody because they wanted to be 100 percent. And it turned out it was tomatoes and people, you know, you would be having a different hearing, but well, you'd it, still be having a hearing. Sure. And, and it, would be, it would be really ugly. In so, fact, we, we had that situation with heparin in, in some respects. Sure. So, so I think that the agencies are in a bind, and, and the key is for them to eliminate a given commodity very rapidly. And that's where things like trace back and record keeping come into play. So, so the, these, these uh, investigations don't run for weeks, they run for days. And then you cut it off and you're done and, you, and, and you know, you've, you've solved the problem. Okay, it's that point of cutting it off. Again, Friday they found a problem, but there wasn't really the ability to cut off that product. I mean, how do we know how much product came across the border over the weekend? How do we know that by Monday morning we hadn't had more bushel baskets of contaminated peppers entering the stream of commerce. Well, as we've discussed, the import problem is, is just tremendously problematic when conditions in these Mexican farms can be horrendous with farm animals traipsing through. And I understand that, that one of these farms that uh, is a subject here, they, 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 when the, even though they were told in advance FDA was coming, when the inspectors got there, they found all kinds of problems, animals in the irrigation ditches. They only had two porta potties for the entire farm, farm and one of those had just been stolen. So. You know, you've, you've, you've got fundamental violations of preventive control technology that I would hope we don't see in the United States, but we certainly do see in Latin America. But as far as securing it at the level of the border, is, is, there, is there authority that the FDA could have that they're lacking at this point? Well, the only authority they have is to examine the product as it comes across the border, and is, because the committee has found the FDA does very little of that. They need the authority to put preventive controls in place back to the Mexican producer so that they meet the same standards U.S. producers meet. And, and I wouldn't disagree with that except that, as you correctly point out, time after time there are violations of the standards don't seem to be where, where we would want them. Uh, it just seems to me that we have to have a way, there has to be a fail safe at the border when we discover we have a problem on a Friday afternoon that we don't just let it run then for the next couple of days until, uh, until we can get someone down there on the farms and inspected it. There, there has to be, I think, and I think the American people want us to have the way to stop that from entering the stream of commerce the minute we detect that there's a problem. We may, it may only be temporary. We may have to, within a certain time period, come back and, and address that. But we have to have, have to have the ability to stop that when we discover there's a problem. And Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to yield back. We're shocked. Uh, but uh, great. Uh, Ms. Schakowsky for uh, questions, please. Thank you. I apologize very much for not being here for your testimony. There are a lot of hearings going on, but through the magic of my uh, assistance from staff, I find myself able to ask questions nonetheless. Um, so let me, uh, let me start um, with some questions for you, Mr. Stenzel. Let me um, walk you through uh, a few key points of your testimony. Is it true that throughout the outbreak investigation, you and your members really couldn't determine who was in charge of the investigation? And this left local, state, federal officials vying for leadership? Yes, Congresswoman, um, in many of our uh, conversations with officials from both CDC and FDA, it was unclear uh, who is making the decisions uh, on public advisories, at, at what point in time, uh, which agency had the authority to advise consumers not to eat these tomatoes or this type of tomatoes. Uh, we saw repeatedly concerns um, between those two agencies. Uh, as far as the state and locals, uh, this is probably more that we've discerned from our members, uh, people doing investigations in the field who said, 
uh, that sometimes they heard from their state health departments a disagreement uh, with the federals in terms of, gosh, we don't think it's tomatoes. I don't know why we're still chasing this. Um, isn't it also true that as a result of this, various agencies related to this investigation, as you say, were, well, I guess you answered that, were pursuing different priorities, which added to the, to the confusion. So the priorities were both instructions for consumers, the source of the problem, those kinds of things? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, wasn't one of your chief concerns in this outbreak that field investigators across various agencies were not coordinated? So it was difficult for your, in, your members to understand what kind of information authorities were seeking and what they could do to help the investigation. This is another important lesson, I think, as we look at traceback uh, as well. The field investigative staff, um, while, while doing their best, uh, we're not experts in produce, certainly not experts in produce distribution. Uh, we have anecdotal stories, uh, as Mr. Hubbard told, of an, investor going, an investigator going into a warehouse in Philadelphia uh, who said that they had been investigating heart transplant and heart valves the day before, and now they're looking for tomatoes in a warehouse. We have cases where an investigator on contract to FDA comes in and says, give me all your records. You know, it almost sounded like a go fish game. Mm -hmm. uh, no wonder we can't trace it with that kind of an approach. But with a very targeted, well-organized effort, Commissioner Bronson raised an important point I, I don't want to forget, uh, the ability to task State Departments of Agriculture, who are much more familiar with our systems, to help in those investigations might you know, be a very good lesson out of this, mm -hmm. this hearing. Um, you suggest that Congress should consider how to put into place a command and control system with a clear chain of command during food outbreak investigations. So you're thinking that we ought to think more broadly and include state agriculture departments or that we should look at that chain of command more broadly as well as more uh, efficiently? I think realistically we're going to have to have a collection of different agencies of local, state and federal uh, working together. Uh, I don't simply see you know, a, a total revolution at hand in, in changing our public health structure. But there does need to be some type of um, command structure, I would suggest. I use the analogy of the National Transportation and Safety Board investigating an accident. You know that someone who flies to the scene, that person is in charge. Everything else flows through that investigation. There's one spokesperson to the press. Uh, the analogy, this one seemed to be going in fits and starts in many directions. How we could pull that together in one more cohesive fashion? Well, there's also industry expertise. And I know another primary concern of your members was that the government failed to use that expertise during the course of the outbreak investigation. What role should indi industry experts play? We believe that there has to be um, uh, very clear precaution taken. We don't suggest that industry run an investigation. But there's a lot of knowledge and expertise. You can hear it from these tomato uh, people. There's expertise in jalapenos uh, out there in the industry. And to be able to bring them in in an appropriate way for FDA and CDC to call on uh, those resources. Uh, an example would be, uh, we mentioned the illnesses. There were very few in California. There were very few in some of the Mountain West states. We began to look at the distribution patterns of food distributors and could start to see why and where product may have been coming from. Uh, the, the jalapenos we discerned were probably coming on the east side of Texas, not the west side of Texas, just because of the distribution patterns coming up through the Mississippi to Illinois. So uh, that type of expertise. Are, are there some um, legal con constraints or, that regulatory agencies may have in sharing data or that you may have in sharing data? There may be. We're not familiar with what okay. those are, but I think it's something the agencies ought to look at. And if there are impediments, uh, is there a way that um, Congress could help them uh, have a legal means to get that expertise? I have a few more minutes. So let me ask Mr. Beckman. Um, you communicated to committee staff that you believe in the future the FDA should attempt to use industry to assist in the an outbreak investigation because they understand the what with regard to players and the complex distribution chain, as um, uh, Mr. Stenzel just just said. Um, let me ask your opinion on how you think industry could help the FDA. 
Well, to give you an example, within the first 24 hours of our being informed of this outbreak, it was brought to our attention by FDA that they were interested in ingredients that went into the production of salsa. There were follow-up discussions that continued. We did not fully understand, though, where this investigation was going and what information we provided if it would be acted upon. Really, it seemed like there was a greater level of outreach by FDA, but we were not able to ask the important questions to help connect the dots. We were somebody, uh, I'd, you, I'd you say, were not trying asked? to shoot, shoot blindly, trying to understand where okay. FDA was going with its ah. investigation. That was part of the problem, and it's my understanding that there are confidentiality issues that prevent them from disclosing specific points of the trace back during the investigation. Well, that's why I'm wondering in the recommendations, perhaps um, both of you, because there are um, statutes, including the Trade Secrets Act, portions of the food, uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, even the Freedom of Information Act, that makes it difficult to share information with industry. So in the face of those information sharing limitations that govern the uh, FDA, do various associations represented here in conjunction with other produce industries plan to consider ways that would allow more industry assistance during outbreak investigations? We would welcome any form of involvement that would include the restriction of the release of any confidential data. Uh, any involvement that we can possibly have to help move FDA forward on a traceback investigation, and we would welcome being held to any form of confidentiality law regarding our involvement. Okay. If I may, uh, I've suggested the uh, possibility of a security clearance or some type of um, pre-vetting of industry experts that uh, could be officially authorized and stand at the ready, uh, that FDA could call, they, they've already been pre-approved, and they would come 24-7 to help in an investigation like this. Thank you. Mr. Kawamura, did you want to respond as well? I'd like to add that in my testimony, you'll, you'll note in the written testimony that we mentioned the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, which took place in California and now Arizona as well, as a nice template for industry working collaboratively with governments, both at the state level, as was mentioned earlier, and the federal level, both at USDA and also with FDA as, as a partnership to look at how we can bring those resources, to, resources together, create standards and practices that allow for documentation, for traceability. And I think that kind of effort shows that I think all parties want to move forward. Well, our, our discussion today continues to be on what happened in the past, but in moving toward on what can happen in the future, um, the diagnostics that we're working with are, are, are incredible. To be able to trace genetically these different strains to a source back at a watering hole or at a, in a field, these are the kinds of things that we should really be celebrating in our system. It's not to say that the system is not perfect, but I will, I will continue to submit that this system is getting better because none of the groups that are represented here uh, can sustain these kind of outbreaks and these kind of damage to the growers. I know we haven't talked about compensation today for those growers when you're uh, unfairly uh, uh, pointed to, uh, unfairly in, in, implicated in, or, or incorrectly implicated mm -hmm. in an outbreak. I hope that becomes part of the testimony today as well. But I think what we want to do is how do we move forward step, hand in hand? Uh, uh, I continue to say that uh, for the amazing job that is done domestically in our, in our country, um, the misunderstanding still comes with the lack of confidence or the collapse of confidence. How do we rebuild confidence with the American public that consumes every day a billion meals a day, if you will? Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we recapture that confidence and show that the system is moving forward? And you're suggesting that um, California may provide some um, model and some suggestions for I, us at the federal I, level? I believe both California and Florida have some models that can easily be used and put into play. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. I've called on the FDA to uh, do a post-mortem here on what went right and what went wrong with this investigation. Would you all be willing to share on that panel, if asked? We'd love that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're ready to go. All right. Uh, let me ask this. Uh, it came up, and I'm, I'm still a little confused. Tomatoes is the only one that really have this traceability that we have. Does jalapenos have them? Does spinach have it? Uh, some are shaking heads yes, some are shaking heads no. 
in California, the leafy green marketing agreement uh, takes all those leafy, leafy vegetables and they do have a, a very comprehensive uh, traceability and identification package. Okay, so the leafy greens, that would be the spinach that we've had problems with in the past. And many other, and many other of our, our products as well okay. in California. Florida? We do not have a, a full set yet, but we're working on all the leafy greens to match what we're doing in tomatoes. But let me, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, let me say to you that uh, even with the new law that uh, has passed on country of origin, where these groups were found, and the reason why we began to see that Florida was not a part of this was around a restaurant situation. Right. Uh, you understand that uh, w even with the new country of origin labeling, it does not have to follow to the restaurant. Correct. And that's where right. one of the problems was uh, in this outbreak. And um, Country of origin label is really an old law. We're just waiting for it to be implemented well, by the administration. Florida's had it for 20 years, I know. and it's worked for us. I I'm I glad it's uh, I don't know why we can't get it done up here. But let, let me ask this question. Let me ask this question. Because I want to go back to what I said earlier about the, those three press releases last 12 hours sort of epitomize this uh, uh, investigation because we still have so many questions. Um, if I'm growing up, tomatoes, and I'm not a farmer, so bear with me. If I'm growing tomatoes, do I rotate my crop every other year and put a different crop in there to keep the ground good and I do that? What would be the other crop? Absolutely. You'll, you'll, for tomatoes, you'll rotate that every two or three years. Okay. What would I substitute then when I'm not growing tomatoes in that uh, field? It would be wheat. Wheat's a very good, a very okay. common crop to. Okay. In contrasting it, a, a Congressman, in Florida, we basically grow tomatoes on the same piece of land year after year after year with okay. the technology we have in place. Okay, because going back to these press releases that uh, I mentioned, it, it says, you know, previously FDA inspectors collected a positive sample of jalapeno pepper from a produce distribution center owned in, in McAllen, Texas. The FDA continues to work on pinpointing where and how in the supply chain this first positive jalapeno pepper sample became contaminated. It originated from a different farm in Mexico than the positive samples of serrano pepper and irrigation water. So this tells me, okay, we still haven't cleared off tomatoes yet, as we talked about earlier. And the pepper, we had one farm. Now we have another farm, and it could be the irrigation. So it could be all the farms that use that irrigation source or water source, correct? That's what it sounds like uh, to us. I think the FDA uh, panel will obviously be able to answer those questions better than us. Okay, because it's a different farm in Mexico than what the original positive samples back on, what do we say, July 21st. And so, okay. Mr. Hubbard, you said so you had some, what your understanding is this farm that they found had deplorable conditions, sanitary conditions? Yeah, I mean, but again, I think uh, conditions in Latin America in produce operations tend to be fairly consistently uh, uh, substandard. And, and again, if the, the, fir the farm knew they were, they were coming, and still there were, they were substandard conditions. So uh, one, would, one would suspect perhaps they were even worse earlier. Right. We, we have inspectors, FDA inspectors in Mexico, don't we, doing produce, uh, looking at the farms? Usually only for cause. There's not, there's not normally a, a routine. Not a normal routine inspection going there on. There are lots of uh, attempts to educate, though, good agricultural practices, that sort of thing. And Mr. Booth, you wanted to say something there. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that we're not painting a broad brush with Mexico and other Latin American countries that, uh, uh, that they are substandard. Uh, there's many, many exceptional growers in, in Mexico. We deal with those directly. Right, and I think some testimony was they have a traceback system in Absolutely. some parts of Mexico, Absolutely. depending on the grower and, and who they're working with in the United States. Yes, sir, that's right. Okay. So, someone said earlier that uh, major uh, consumers, let's say like if I'm, um, who's a major, uh, Jack in a Box, okay, they would have certain requirements for tomatoes which are more towards uh, how they're handled, shipped, grown. Are they different than what you're doing in Florida and California? I mean, are you having trouble with corporations saying do this? You say, well, this aren't part of our system. Uh, is, is that a we're, concern? Mr. Chairman, we're not having a problem because we have one of the highest standards, uh, probably the highest standard in America. So we're not having problems with any of our uh, uh, people who are buying major corporations that are buying our tomatoes. Well, some of the farmers are telling us that so, some of the concerns that some of these uh, corporations are putting on them in order to buy their tomato or jalapeno, or whatever it is, uh, things like fencing and, and things like that that really has nothing to do with uh, the growing of this tomato. 
And, and so I, I just want to see if you can yeah. push back from corporations who are more geared towards risk assessment from an insurance financial point of view as to risk assessment from a food safety point of view. Well, I, I agree. Now, I, now that you've uh, expounded on that, there, there are certain companies that will say we do not want tomatoes that have a certain product or whatever put on them. Um, and there is usually a third party evaluation of that, of that tomato before that company will buy that particular tomato. Okay. But we have not had problems in Florida. Okay. Uh, whatever the standard is, we usually can meet it. You think no problem in California like that, uh, Mr. Kawamura? Uh, that's the same. You may, you may know that California pr provides 50 percent of the fruits, vegetables, and nuts that are domestically produced in, in the United States for the rest of the country. Okay. Uh, let me ask this question, if, if you know. I understand that this uh, type of salmonella, St. Paul, is usually associated with poultry. Is that right? Not necessarily. But Not necessarily? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Stenzel, you mentioned something about did any of you, um, who was in charge, command center? Um, ex can you expound a little bit on that? Sh should we have like a you have a natural disaster, you have a command center, someone comes in, boom, you know who's in charge, very rigid. Uh, That's precisely the example, Mr. Chairman, that um, between CDC and FDA in particular throughout this investigation, uh, we've noted tension, rivalries, um, uh, defensiveness between the two positions of, of individuals within the agencies. Uh, we feel that that's an important thing to look at of putting someone clearly in charge. This Some kind of an incident command center. Right? Where, where CDC uh, fingers the, the culprit, but then FDA is left to investigate it, whether they agree with it or not, it, it's kind of strange. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Shimkus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to be brief. Um, as I received the testimony, I just want to reiterate, we're still looking for the salmonella tainted tomato. And once we focused on peppers, 18 days to identify the pepper, four days to find the location. And had we identified the right vegetable at the beginning, the losses would have been limited. You still would have had losses. Go ahead, Mr. Bruns. Yes, uh, Congressman. Let, uh, let me say that if we had been given in Florida, and I'm sure all the states involved, California including, if we had been given the, given the right information and not withheld information from us, we could have gotten to the point very quickly on how to help them in Florida. Uh, every state may be a little different, but in Florida, if they'd have told us what they were looking for, exactly what, what their suspicions were, we could have gone and verified that or denied that we had the problem in Florida, which would have cleared it. Now, I hold a commission with FDA. So does Dr. Brown. So does Dr. Aller in our, in our laboratory. But I'm not sure what that commission means. Uh, because I can hear on national news more than than what I was be we were being told at the state level in these conferences. So uh, we can't help if we don't know what we're supposed to be looking for. Mr. Brown, you, you want to answer and respond? Traceback works wonderfully, and that's an excellent example in the case of the jalapeno. But when you identify the wrong culprit, you can't ever find the traceback. Right, and I, and I want to follow up on um, on on this because we're going to have a debate about giving the FDA mandatory recall authority. And when this, this was touched on, and also recovery of damages. I'm not a lawyer. We, we have some on the panel. Any of you all lawyers? Um, I, what makes a more convincing case uh, to get cost recovery from a warning or get cost recovery because the government did a mandatory recall that was an error? I've got to believe that we'll be on the hook on a mandatory recall, especially when it was an error. And I think that's one of the, 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 the problems that we might have in this debate as we move forward. I think we all are in agreement. Uh, transparency, communication, uh, someone responsible and hold them accountable. I mean, I'm a military guy. That's kind of the way it works. You got to have a chain of command. You, and this fusion center, we call it, in, in terrorism and connecting the dots. We've heard that numerous times since September 11th. We didn't do it well. We're, uh, the state agencies are getting together where you've got people in the same room. That's probably something, Mr. Chairman, we also ought to consider is, is making sure that we, we empower everybody to help us solve the case sooner rather than later. And, and I think we're going to get that in other panels. So, 
with that, I, I really appreciate it. It's it a great panel, and um, we've got more to come, and, I, and I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Gedd. Got a question? Uh, I just have a couple quick questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stenzel. Your industry has endorsed mandatory recall, correct? Yes, we have. Mr. Beckman, I think your industry has too, correct? Correct. And and um, uh, just so you know, I, I think most of the industries have endorsed mandatory recall. Most consumers think that we have it now because they read the recall notices and they think they're mandatory. Mr. Beckman, I just wanted to ask you quickly about your document that you flourished during your testimony, which is Exhibit 11 in the notebook. Um, that's the one that your organization helped create called Commodity Specific Food Safety Guidelines for the Fresh Tomato Ch Supply Chain. It's my understanding that this document lays out a number of best practices to be used throughout all the levels of the tomato distribution chain, including traceability requirements. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, it's also my understanding that you believe that national regulations governing the tomato industry should be enacted. Is that correct? That is correct. And if your document, um, Exhibit 11, were used, then the whole tomato industry, not just bits and pieces, would be required to implement comprehensive systems for tracing their products through the supply chain. Is that correct? That is correct. And I also um, know that the FDA has seen this document, and you would be in favor of the FDA modeling a national regulation based on the contents. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, Mr. Stenzel, uh, just to clarify with you, I, I think a lot of what you said is really important and has some nuance that this com committee needs to understand. I just want to clarify one thing. Is it the position of your organization that more stringent traceability requirements should be enacted beyond what's currently required in the Bioterrorism Act of 2002? We believe uh, that with traceability as well as um, preventive food safety controls, they need to be commodity specific uh, and based on risk. So for the tomato industry, we're the co-author right. of these um, guidelines and certainly support that in the tomato industry or other products or commodities that FDA would determine to be at higher risk. Okay. And you think that those requirements should be more stringent than the Bioterrorism Act of 2002? We believe that um, these requirements uh, in the tomato guidelines would be more stringent. And, and you would support that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Schakowsky, any questions? Well, let me uh, thank this panel. It's been most interesting. You've been most helpful and uh, appreciate your time and your attention to this. And uh, as I said earlier, Mr. Dingo has a bill. Most of us are on it. And negotiations are going on between both sides and industry. And hopefully some of the suggestions you made can be part of that. Uh, Mr. Chair, if the Chairman will yield. I will now uh, sure. say that we are also in the room and, uh, right. and that we, there are negotiations in good faith going on bipartisan. So hopefully we can get something done here yet, this Congress. So thank you very much. We will dismiss the panel. Thank you. Our second panel witnesses come forward. On our second panel, we have Dr. David Atchison, who is the Assistant Commissioner for Food Protection and Food and Drug Administration, also known as the Food Czar. Dr. Lonnie King, who is Director of the National Center for Zoonotic and Vector-Borne and Enteric Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Kirk Smith, who is the Supervisor of Foodborne, Vector-Borne and Zoonotic Disease Unit Acute Disease Investigation and control section at the Minnesota Department of Health, and Dr. Timothy Jones, who is a state epidemiologist for Communable and Environmental Disease Services at Tennessee's Department of Health. Welcome, gentlemen. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath.
please be advised that witnesses have the right under the rules of the House to be, be advised by counsel during their testimony. Do any of you wish to be represented by counsel during your testimony? Everyone's shaking their head no, so I'll take that as a no. So therefore, I'm going to ask you to please rise and raise your right hand to take the oath. Do you swear or affirm testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth in the matter pending before this committee? Let the record reflect each witness entered in the affirmative. They are now under oath, and we will start with opening statements. Um, if you'd like to submit a longer statement for the record, we will include it in the hearing record, but we'll try to hold it to five minutes. Uh, Dr. Atchison, you want to start, please? My pleasure. Good afternoon, Chairman Stupak and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. David Atchison, Associate Commissioner for Foods at the FDA, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the recent foodborne illness outbreak associated with fresh produce contaminated with Salmonella St. Paul and the measures FDA is taking to enhance the safety of fresh produce and to enhance traceability. There's no question that the Salmonella St. Paul outbreak investigation has been one of the most complex in recent memory. I assure you that FDA is committed to working with all our food safety partners to expedite tracebacks and to ensure that America's food supply continues to be amongst the safest in the world. For this outbreak alone, we at FDA have conducted nearly 450 inspections or investigations together with our state partners. FDA labs have analyzed nearly 450 samples, including samples of produce as well as environmental samples. To support coordination, we've hosted or participated in 40 teleconferences with the states as well as CDC. The number of illnesses associated with fresh produce is a continuing concern for FDA, and we've worked on a number of initiatives to reduce the presence of pathogens in foods. Some of these activities include working with industry to develop guidance on ways to prevent or minimize potential contamination, conducting educational outreach to consumers on safe food handling practices, sampling and analyzing both domestic and imported produce for pathogens, and working with industry in foreign countries to promote the use of good growing, harvesting, packing, transporting, and processing practices. We're also conducting research to improve the identification and detection of disease-causing agents in a variety of foods. I'd now like to provide a brief description of the typical traceback process. CDC, along with state and local officials, will, through its epidemiological investigations, identify possible food or foods associated with an outbreak, and at that point, CDC notifies FDA. From that point, FDA begins our traceback investigation to identify the source of the contamination. We work with industry and with local, state, and federal officials, and when needed, foreign governments, to identify the source of the contamination. We do this by tracing the food suspected of being the vehicle for transmitting the pathogen back through the supply chain from the retailer or restaurant and inspecting or investigating points throughout that supply chain to determine where the contamination most likely occurred. Tracing food requires us to find and examine documentation, such as bills of lading and invoices, for the, for the product right throughout the supply chain. We also obtain information on the practices and conditions under which the product was stored and handled at each point. The current outbreak investigation, which initially focused on certain types of raw tomatoes, provides an example of one of the most difficult kinds of traceback investigations. It was on May 31st that CDC advised FDA of a significant statistical association between the consumption of certain types of tomatoes and a multi-state outbreak of Salmonella St. Paul infections. Raw tomatoes are a perishable commodity and thus are unlikely to be in a consumer's home after a consumer becomes ill, obtains a diagnosis, and the outbreak is identified. Further, raw tomatoes are often sold loose without any form of packaging. In the current investigation, we learned that many tomatoes had been shipped to washing, packing, and repacking facilities where they were or might have been commingled with other tomatoes from different sources. A further complicating factor was caused by entities in the supply chain using different terminology to describe the tomatoes. Since May 31st, many FDA employees in the field and headquarters have been working to, on the outbreak investigation to identify the source. To help the dis public distinguish tomatoes not associated with the outbreak, FDA adopted the policy of specifically designating the types of tomatoes implicated in the outbreak, as well as listing growing areas that were not part of the outbreak. On July 17th, FDA updated its consumer advice, announced that tomatoes currently on the market are not considered to be a possible source of illness. On July 21st, FDA announced it had found a genetic match with an outbreak serotype, Salmonella St. Paul, in jalapeno peppers we tested from a distribution center in Texas. This finding of a genetic match was an important break in the investigation. Upon further investigation, 
we determined that the contamination of the pepper occurred in Mexico, not at the plant in Texas. And accordingly, on July 25th, updated our advisory, announced that there was no indication that domestically grown jalapeno or serrano peppers were implicated in the outbreak. Yesterday, FDA laboratory analysis confirmed that both a sample of serrano peppers and a sample of reservoir water used for irrigation contained the Salmonella St. Paul strain that was a genetic match for the outbreak strain. These samples came from a farm in Mexico, but not the same farm that produced the first positive jalapeno samples from the distribution center in Texas. Our current advice is for consumers to avoid jalapeno and serrano peppers grown, harvested, or packed in Mexico. In addition, domestically grown raw jalapeno and serrano peppers, canned, pickled, and cooked jalapeno and serrano peppers from any and all locations are not connected with this outbreak. We'll continue to refine our consumer message as our investigation continues. The current traceback work, tr the current traceback has worked, but was slow, requiring review of many paper records. While sectors of the produce industry may keep electronic records, as we have just heard on the previous panel, and be able to do rapid tracebacks, this is not a uniform practice. And many of the plants FDA visited only had paper records, bills of lading or invoices. To better understand the universe of track and trace systems and best industry practices for traceability, FDA has reached out to a variety of external entities. We plan to hold a public meeting in the fall to further exchange of information on available technology and best practices for enhanced traceability. To enhance safety across a range of imported consumer products, last November, Secretary Leavitt presented to the President the Action Plan for Import Safety. In conjunction with the Action Plan, FDA released the Food Protection Plan, which provides a framework to identify and counter potential hazards with respect to both domestic and imported food. Both plans build in safety measures across a product's life cycle, from the time food is produced to the time it is distributed, and encompass the elements of prevention, intervention, and response. The Food Protection Plan identified 10 legislative authorities necessary for achieving full impl implementation. And we appreciate the work this committee is, drafting, uh, is doing to draft legislation intended to help provide these authorities. We look forward to continuing to work with you to develop this important legislation. FDA is working hard to ensure the safety of food in collaboration with our partners. As a result of this effective collaboration, the American food supply continues to be amongst the safest in the world. However, the Salmonella St. St. Paul foodborne illness underscores the challenges that we face. We've been making progress and we're moving forward with the implementation of the plans, but more does need to be done. To that end, FDA ex is exploring using its, science board, um, it, it, using its science board to convene a group of state industry and academic and other experts to examine lessons learned from the outbreak. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss FDA's continuing efforts to enhance food safety and traceability and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. King, please, if you would. Yes, good afternoon. Chairman Stupek and members of the committee, thank you for this invitation to address this subcommittee today. I'm Dr. Lonnie King, Director of the National Center for Zoonotic Vector-Borne and Enteric Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. First, let me offer my sympathies to all the families who have been adversely affected by this outbreak. Also, I understand the frustration of many in the food producing and serving industries who work so very hard to produce safe produce that we've heard about today. CDC leads federal efforts to gather data and to investigate foodborne illnesses. Much of what CDC does depends on the critical relationships with a broad range of partners, food safety regulatory agencies, in particular with FDA and USDA, USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, and with state and local public health departments. Salmonella is a group of bacteria with over 2,500 subtypes that's widespread in the intestines of birds, reptiles, and mammals. Salmonella is the second most common bacterial cause of foodborne diseases in this country. The current outbreak is caused by Salmonella serotype St. Paul, a relatively uncommon serotype causing only about 1% of all reported Salmonella infections each year. This outbreak is the largest foodborne outbreak in the United States in the past decade, its investigation has been especially complex, difficult, and prolonged. CDC first learned about this outbreak on May 22, 2008, when New Mexico Department of Health reported illnesses in four persons confirmed with Salmonella St. Paul. New Mexico posted the information about the unusual number of Salmonella St. Paul cases to PulseNet, a national network of public health and regulatory agency laboratories 
used to detect foodborne disease outbreaks. This information allowed state laboratories to compare specific DNA fingerprints found in New Mexico to their own cases of salmonella that have been reported with matching fingerprints. The next day, Texas and Colorado reported cases of matching fingerprints. Investigators in New Mexico, Texas, and CDC began a multi-state investigation. Epidemiologists conducted in-depth interviews with ill persons to collect information about might, what might be a possible source of infection. Results of this first series of interviews indicated raw tomatoes were the most commonly consumed food, leading to the hypothesis that, we were, that they were a possible source of this illness. Following these initial interviews, case control studies, comparing what ill and healthy persons reported eating were then conducted. By May 31st, preliminary results of the first case control study showed that the illness was significantly associated with the consumption of raw tomatoes. On June 4th, CDC re received the first report of a possible cluster or any restaurant cluster and subsequently learned of additional clusters after that. Between June 18th and June 20th, there was a large surge in reported cases in Texas. The geographic concentration of illness in the Southwest and in Native American and Hispanic persons, along with a strong association with the consumption of Mexican-style foods in restaurants and the apparent continuation of this outbreak after the alert regarding to tomatoes led to the hypothesis that a food item commonly consumed with tomatoes could also be causing this illness. Investigations then focused on the recently identified clusters and a second multi-state case control study of persons who became ill after June 1st was initiated. The results of the case control study indicated a strong link to fresh produce items used in Mexican cuisine, but did not point clearly to one specific item. After additional epidemiologic investigations of a cluster of illness in Texas, the FDA began their tracebacks on peppers on July 21st, and the FDA announced that they had isolated the outbreak strain of Salmonella St. Paul from, a, <clears throat> from serrano peppers and water irrigation samples from a farm in Mexico. The outbreak investigation unfortunately continues. The active fielding investigations by CDC, state and local health departments focusing on identifying clusters of cases and the FDA tracebacks now on jalapenos, serranos, tomatoes and other possible sources are providing new information daily. This outbreak has been particularly challenging. First, there is inherent delay between when persons become ill with salmonella infection and when results of the testing are reported to PulseNet. For half the cases in this outbreak, it took more than 16 days from Ill illness onset to posting the test results on PulseNet. Second, people have difficulty remembering exactly what foods they ate, and remembering specific ingredients in those foods is even more difficult, especially if the dish was prepared by someone else. Third, the foods in question are often eaten together, so exposure to one item often means exposure to all the items. And finally, perishable foods consumed by ill persons were often not available for testing. As of June 29th at 9 p.m., 1,319 cases with Salmonella St. Paul have been identified in 43 states, the District of Columbia, 255 persons have been hospitalized, and two deaths were possibly linked to this outbreak. At present, we believe that jalapeno peppers and serrano, pep serrano peppers are linked to some of these clusters and could be two of several food vehicles, including tomatoes and other possible vehicles as we continue to explore and investigate. The outbreak is ongoing, but there are fortunately fewer illnesses being reported. In conclusion, this outbreak illustrates the importance of existing public health networks, the laboratories performing pulse net and fingerprinting, epidemiologists who conduct the investigations, the multidisciplinary approach of these investigations, and the close communication and collaboration among state, local, and federal officials. We balance the rapid release of information on sources of illness against the potential negative consequences to consumers, food growers, producers, and industry. CDC is prepared to continue to work with regulatory agencies, state and local partners, food and environmental microbiologists, and certainly the food industry to find long-term solutions to this challenging problem. I thank you for the invitation to testify and be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, please. Good afternoon. Chairman Stupak and members of the subcommittee, 
My name is Kirk Smith, and I am supervisor of the Foodborne Diseases Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health. Thank you for inviting me to speak on our role in the Salmonella St. Paul investigation. We were not highly involved in the national investigation early on. Then, from June 23rd through June 27th, our state public health laboratory received 10 Salmonella St. Paul isolates from ill Minnesota residents who had gone to the doctor and been tested for Salmonella at a clinical laboratory. Our foodborne disease epidemiology staff immediately began the process of interviewing these patients. By June 30th, several patients had reported eating at the same restaurant. That same day, we visited the restaurant to assess illness in food workers, determine the exact ingredients in various menu items, and request credit card receipts to identify other potentially exposed individuals to interview. Ill and non-ill patrons were interviewed in detail about the menu items and ingredients they had consumed. By identifying what ingredients were in each menu item, we knew if an individual ate fresh tomatoes, jalapenos, or cilantro, etc., even if they couldn't discern or recall all of the specific ingredients in a menu item. Then we statistically compared foods eaten by ill people to those eaten by non-ill people. The ingredient-specific analysis indicated that diced jalapenos were the cause of our restaurant outbreak. We sent our preliminary statistics to CDC on July 3rd, three days after we had identified the restaurant as a source through patient interviews. Statistics were updated and provided to CDC daily as the scope of our investigation grew. By July 8th, five days later, we had interviewed 19 restaurant-associated cases and 52 non-ill controls and unequivocally implicated jalapenos. On our first visit to the restaurant on June 30th, we also requested vendor invoices for produce items served on the implicated meal dates. Those invoices were given to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, which conducted tracebacks. On July 3rd, we provided CDC and FDA with information on the possible sources of the jalapenos, all the way back to farms or distributors in Mexico. This part of the traceback took three days. So why were we able to solve our outbreak so quickly in Minnesota? In short, we have an efficient, rapid, and thorough system. By law, when a clinical laboratory isolates salmonella or another reportable foodborne bacteria from a patient, the lab is required to submit the isolate to our state public health laboratory. Our lab confirms serotypes and DNA fingerprints all salmonella isolates in real time. This is not done in many other public health laboratories. There is excellent communication between our lab and epidemiology staff. Every day, the lab provides us with a report of every isolate they have worked on. Another reason for our success is that foodborne disease investigations in Minnesota are centralized at the state level. We routinely interview all reported salmonella cases with a detailed questionnaire and are able to re-interview patients with specific questions quickly as needed. In many other states, salmonella cases are not routinely interviewed in a timely manner, and if they are, initial interviews are often done at the county level and may not contain sufficient detail. Centralized surveillance and investigations coordinated at the level of state or large city health departments are especially critical during multi-state outbreaks due to commercially distributed food items. Foodborne disease surveillance and investigation in the U.S. need to be improved. State and federal funding for these activities in public health departments has decreased throughout this decade, and I believe that this affected the national investigation. State and local health departments need to be able to rapidly confirm and type every Salmonella and E. coli 0157 isolate that is submitted. This is how we can learn that an outbreak is happening as early as possible. But many state public health laboratories cannot currently do this. Secondly, state and local health departments need to be able to rapidly interview every patient with Salmonella and E. coli 0157 with a detailed questionnaire and to conduct cluster investigations rapidly. Again, this currently is not being done in most localities. As we've heard, the traceback efforts of federal agencies can only be as good as the quality and timeliness of epidemiologic information coming from state and local health departments. Now, the investment in foodborne disease surveillance will not prevent food contamination from happening, but it will enable outbreaks to be detected and the source identified much earlier. This will help limit the size of outbreaks, minimize the impact on the involved food industry, and identify the types of food products on which to focus our prevention measures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, your opening statement, please, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. 
The recent na nationwide outbreak of salmonella associated with produce demonstrates challenges and opportunities for improvement in the nation's food safety infrastructure. A typical American meal includes foods from six different countries, and fresh produce travels a mean of 1,500 miles to get to our plates. Dramatic statistics demonstrate the rapidly changing environment in which outbreaks are occurring. Outbreaks increasingly involve multiple states and widely distributed products, in part reflecting improvements in detection and investigation. Recent remarkable successes have led to ex high expectations which realistically can't be met in all investigations. Epidemiologists, such as those at state and local health departments and CDC, and regulatory agencies must all work together well for outbreak investigations to be effective. Fifty state health departments in the U.S. work under independent public health laws. A handful of states have successfully investigated a disproportionately large number of multi-state outbreaks, reflecting large discrepancies in the resources available to them to respond. Most outbreaks are detected and investigated entirely at the state and local levels. As in the early stages of this salmonella outbreak, CDC is often in the position of reviewing and integrating results of investigations done by state and local agencies, rather than doing de novo investigations. State and local public health epidemiologists frequently interact directly with the public during outbreak investigations, rapidly assessing data to identify the cause. They do not routinely do things like inspect facilities, perform tracebacks, and do recalls. Federal regulatory agencies have very different missions, legal restrictions, and relationships with industry. Investigators must constantly balance the risk of continuing disease due to delays in action with the risk of economic damage to the food industry that might be mitigated by waiting for more specific data. And clearly, it's impossible to meet all of these expectations. Faster product tracebacks would clearly have helped bring this outbreak to a more satisfying conclusion. Many epidemiologists, I think, view regu federal regulatory agencies as a black box into which data are sent but from which results are received frustratingly late or never. Federal regulatory agencies often must operate under such restrictive legal constraints that they are unable to share important data such as traceback information, names of facilities and brand names as quickly and as fully as any of us would like. In a different outbreak, recently, a regulatory agency had information that would have allowed state public health officials to contact consumers at risk of disease, but was prohibited from sharing it with us. It is possible for epidemiologists to become commissioned by the FDA to be allowed to receive confidentiality, uh, confidential data, but most of my colleagues have refused to pursue this, specifically to, un to avoid the untenable moral predicament of having access to data which we would then be legally unable to act on. To their credit, USDA and FDA have recently undertaken a number of regulatory interventions based entirely on epidemiologic data prior to laboratory confirmation of pathogens in a food or production facility. And I hope that these recent experiences will not dissuade those agencies from acting rap rapidly on strong epidemiologic data in the future. My message is not all gloom and doom. Americans today have access to one of the safest, most diverse, and cheapest food supplies in the history of mankind. And a variety of groups, such as the Multi-Agency Council to Improve Foodborne Outbreak Response, or C4, are working toward the common goal of food safety. I think there are a number of opportunities for continued improvement of the nation's food safety infrastructure. Solutions require addressing barriers at the local, state, and federal levels. Federal regulatory agencies must have the authority and expectation to share actionable information with public health partners promptly and fully to protect the public's health, and that may require changes in the laws governing them. It is critical to support development of information technology adequate to sustain food safety act, uh, activities, uh, including improved technology for produce track tracebacks, which was available for the recent packaged spinach outbreak, for example. Uh, but not necessarily for the produce involved in this outbreak. Opportunities for improved coordination with industry should be explored. Industry has access to food testing data and information contained in frequent shopper cards, for example, uh, that is often unavailable to investigators. And finally, public health agencies are pitifully underfunded. Outbreak response capacity, at, the, at least at the state level, has been subsidized heavily 
by funding for successive waves of high-profile crises from bioterrorism to West Nile virus, SARS, and recently pandemic influenza. And fund funding for these is dropping dramatically. Americans eat a billion meals a day, day in and day out, and 75 million of us fall victim to foodborne illness every year. Adequate and consistent funding and resources must be dedicated to sustain effective public health programs commensurate with the true risks that they address. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you all for your testimony. Now, uh, we'll begin questions. Um, Dr. Atchison, I, I've been talking about these uh, three releases in the last 12 hours uh, because I, I think it adds more confusion as to what was going on. The first one, 9 o'clock last night, was on uh, uh, jalapenos. The one at 10.15, I think, or 10.30 was on cilantro. And then the one, one um, uh, today uh, sort of expands and talks a little bit about this uh, farm and, and the location down there in Mexico. Um, and one of the questions I asked the other one is, the other panel was, you still haven't cleared the tomatoes. Are tomatoes still a suspect or vegetable of interest, as we are calling it on the first panel? Or, or are they cleared now? FDA has investigated tomatoes. Um, we have done a lot of testing with, with states and other federal agencies. We have not found a positive sample. We have inspected farms. And so why don't you clear the tomato? At, at this point, there is nothing for FDA to say that would indicate that the, the evidence that CDC and the states generated early on in this investigation is incorrect. FDA, based on that information, okay. did its trace back. Right. And, and it, it's not up to FDA to say that that original case control study was. Well, then who, who clears the tomato then? I mean, if it's not up to the FDA, I mean, you've got no St. Paul salmonella or salmonella St. Paul in any tomato product we got. Cilantro suspect, and now we got peppers for sure, right? Right, correct. Well, okay, we, so, so who would clear it then? I mean, we have, we have made it very clear that there are no tomatoes that are currently available on the market from anywhere in the world that are linked Currently, to but how about the tomatoes from the original suspect? I think that's what the last panel was concerned about, that that hangover effect still s exists as to tomatoes. Um, are, you, are, you, are you suggesting that, that FDA go back and say that that original conclusion was incorrect? Because that's not FDA's role. FDA picks this up at the point at okay, which. Okay. So if the FDA makes a mistake, you never say, "I might have made a mistake." F of course we would, but we didn't make a mistake. FDA. Well, how, how do you get St. Paul salmonella with the tomato then? Let me try this again. Yeah. FDA begins its trace back. Correct. Based on information from the CDC and others, right? Right. Right. We do that in good faith, based right. on the science that right. that CDC has undertaken. And in your trace back. You found nothing to implicate the tomato. And we have said that. And we have said that tomatoes that are currently on the market are safe to consume. On behalf of the tomato, they want their good name back. I, I think you should put out something a little more, more firmer on that. Let me ask you this. These farms in Mexico that you now suspect with the jalapenos, yeah. do any of them grow tomatoes? Yes, they do. There's at least, there's at least one farm. Okay. At least one. Then, then the irrigation water that suspect, is that irrigation water being used on the tomatoes then? The, uh, the farm that grows tomatoes also grows serrano and jalapeno peppers. Okay. That is the farm where the original peppers that were positive in McAllen, Texas trace back to. Okay. This is the one that Minnesota did, right? No? It, that's, the Minnesota part is just one piece of this. Okay. That, that'll add to okay. So, so the farm, there's at least one farm in Mexico that grows jalapenos, and tomatoes that we got positive for Salmonella St. Paul, correct? Let me, let me try this again. There, Please. There, there is. If I'm confused, the American people are really confused. <laughs> FDA found a correct. positive sample of jalapeno peppers at a distribution center in Texas. Texas. Okay. You traced it back to a farm. And traced, can, I, can I finish? Sure. That, that may clarify your confusion. They, we traced that positive sample of jalapeno peppers back to a farm in Mexico. That okay. farm grows jalapenos, serranos, and tomatoes. Tomatoes, okay. As part of the investigation in Mexico, we were investigating other farms, and we took samples on other farms. Correct. And found the, the outbreak strain on a different farm that grows jalapeno peppers and serrano peppers, but does not grow tomatoes. Okay. Now, one question that is out there, which I think you're getting at, is, is there a connection between those two farms? 
Well, wh where's the water source coming from? That's, that's, that's a good question, and that's part of what we would try to determine while we're, while we're there. Would these two farms use the same water source? Don't know. Don't know. Okay. But what I can tell you is, is that those two farms do well, send their produce through a single distribution center. How far apart are these farms? I believe they're about three hours drive, but I don't know specifically how many miles apart they are. Okay. And let me ask this question I asked of the previous panel, and, and they weren't real clear on it, or didn't quite, a, is Salmonella St. Paul usually associated with poultry? Salmonella, yes, typically with turkey. Turkey? Yeah. Okay. Are there turkey farms down there near this area in Mexico? Not aware of any turkey farms down there. Okay. Let me ask this. Any reason why you couldn't clear domestically grown tomatoes then? We have already stated that domestically grown tomatoes, tomatoes from anywhere, are perfectly okay to consume. Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, let me go, Dr. Smith. You said, and I'm going to come right back to you. Mm -hmm. You said the, you, uh, when you did the jalapeno and you nailed it there, you traced it back to the farms in Mexico? There were multiple possible sources of um, these jalapenos, and they were all in Mexico. Okay. I'm sure you gave that information to the FDA. Yes. So are we talking about the same farms then that Minnesota suspected? Yep. They crossed into our systems, into, into what we were tracing back. Okay. How many farms or possible sources did you find? Well, we couldn't get back all the way to the farm level okay. on all of the arms, but we had um, three different possible traceback arms, okay. and um, they, all, they all went back to Mexico, and one of them only could we get back to a, a distributor. Okay. So you found at least three arms. You got at least two farms about three hours apart, and the water source we're still not sure about yet, right? Is that correct, Dr. Atchison? We found... Two, two farms, yes. Well, we've been, there, there are many other farms, distri distribution centers that have crossed over in this traceback. It's not as simple as just two farms and a distribution center. Okay. How many, if, if you know, how many farms use this water source that has suspect with Salmonella St. Paul? I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, let me ask this question. You mentioned you're going to have a fall conference. Secretary Levitt's called a fall conference. Will the FDA be running a post-mortem on what went right, what went wrong on this uh, recall? And will you be doing that? We're, we're proposing two things. One is a public meeting in the fall that will be focused on issues around traceability. We've had okay. a lot of discussion earlier. It's very important. Okay. Um, what, what I said is that, is that right now we're exploring using our science board as a, as a mechanism to set up a, a subcommittee of the science board that could involve industry, state, federal academic experts to help right. ask questions about what can we do better, what went wrong, what are the lessons learned. Why will not you just use the folks involved in this one? Because this one is what the largest salmonella outbreak we've had in the last 10 years, last decade. Why will not you use the folks in the first panel to help do it as opposed? We, we very well may. It just needs to be done through the mechanisms of, of the science board. As, as you've raised earlier or has been raised in terms of information that we can share and the, and the and the Federal Advisory Committee um, Act laws that are around discussions, et cetera, it has to be done according to the law. And doing right. it through the science board is a process that allows us to do that. Well, okay. The, the okay, okay. The last science board on, on reviewing the FDA, though, and, and the things you had, they were limited because they couldn't talk about budget. So I'd hope that this science board would be given full uh, review of the information so they can put forth recommendations to help you assist with this. Let me ask you this. With any questions, you'll, you, with any crisis, you learn from your weaknesses in the existing system. What have you learned from this investigation that requires legislative changes? Because in your testimony, you said Congress is drafting. We're past drafting. We're actually negotiating between all the parties. I know the FDA has been involved. Mm. So, and we're getting, we're on the food part right now on food safety. So what legislative changes have you learned that we need uh, to help you with this kind of investigation? Of the, of the 10 legislative proposals that we've discussed previously as part of the Food Protection Plan, probably the one that's most important is the one that requires preventative controls. I don't think anybody would disagree that the, the key answer to this is not to react faster, but is to prevent the problems in the first place. That's absolutely critical across the board. So, so that's a very, a very important one. 
There are other components in there in terms of the other legislative proposals that, that would help somewhat. Um, another one, for example, is the requirement for certification for certain uh, imported products. Um, that's a federal to federal agreement, but, but that's another example uh, that, that could help us. Um, and then I think as the, as, as the questions around lessons learned unfold here, and we're still focusing on stopping the outbreak as opposed to focusing on what are the lessons learned after, but, but obviously there, there needs to be lessons learned and discussion around traceability and whether there right. needs to be a legislative fix around that. Well, we have the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, which was supposed to give the Secretary of HHS the tools necessary to have rapid trace back of a food commodity through the distribution chain. Did the Bioterrorism Act work here? The Bioterrorism Act worked as written. Um, we rarely ran into a problem where people were not keeping records of people who were supposed to. That, it, that did not slow it down. Contrary to what you heard on the first panel, what we learned in this outbreak is that it was many of the small producers, the small restaurants, um, much like Mr. Shimkis' example of, of the little restaurant that he goes to on a Friday night that, that were involved in this. They do not have electronic systems. Um, the vast majority of the information we got was paper, it was invoices, it was bills of lading. That has got to be worked through by, by a person just, just working their way through, looking for the connectivity. Well, shouldn't the farm farm be included in the Bioterrorism Act? Right now it's exempt farms and restaurants. Wouldn't that have really helped you out if they were part of the Bar Bioterrorism Act? Currently the Bioterrorism Act does not cover you from farm Correct. all the way through to restaurant. Correct. Shouldn't they be included? It certainly would expedite the process if they were. Okay. Let me, um, let me go Dr. Smith. I got a question or two. Uh, I read from an Associated Press article and I want to go back to that. On July 23rd, Associated Press ran an article entitled and I'm quoting, a hot lead in the hunt of salmonella source, Minnesota pinpointed jalapenos while fe feds fruitlessly chase tomatoes. Um, I presume you've read this article? Yes. Okay, then let me ask you this. The article suggests that the state of Minnesota was using certain outbreak investigation techniques that the CDC and FDA were not using. Are there certain things that you believe that the state of Minnesota did in this outbreak that key federal agencies did not do? Well, uh, first of all, I should say it's, you know what, the types of things that we do are the types of things that need to be done in other state and local health departments. And right, but what about CDC and FDA? Should they be using those things too? And what are they? Well, okay, so what makes, I think, us so successful is that our laboratory confirms and types all salmonella isolates that they get right away. It takes two or three days. And then they give that information to epidemiologists right away, and then we interview these patients right away. So is it the rapid response from the I think investigation of, of the slide to your local health to the interviews? I think it is a rapid response, but it's also the level of response. We, we get very detailed information from all of these patients. And I also have epidemiologists who work only on foodborne disease. They're evaluating clusters every day, and so they're very experienced. And, and so in the first panel when they said, well, yesterday I was working on heart stents, today I'm working on tomatoes, that doesn't lead to good investigative work? Um, yes, yeah, certainly it's better if you've got people that are just dedicated and focused on, on one thing. And we're fortunate to have enough resources uh, to be able to have epidemiologists that are dedicated to, uh, to foodborne disease. And a lot, of these, a lot of these resources are from federal programs such as FoodNet. Okay. Um, just one last question before I turn to Mr. Shim, because Dr. Atchison, um, it came up in the first panel, it sort of came up here, uh, Dr. Jones mentioned it. If this was bioterrorism, how would you have acted differently? If this was deliberate, the process would have been the same. So e even information sharing would have been the same? There's been complaints about information sharing and like, whether a person would be commissioned or non-commissioned because there's a concern about information sharing, uh, no command. Incident Command Center, no one was in charge was the other allegation. So there we was, handle it the same? That's, that's not a good idea. There was, there was a lot of information sharing that, that went on, a lot of work was done. In fact, with the state of Florida, as, as um, Commissioner Bronson talked about, we did use Florida labs, we did use Florida inspectors when we were down in Florida. So we actively did what he was suggesting that we didn't do. Um, but Florida's it, mad at you for banning your tomatoes when they could provide traceability with a system that FDA helped develop. So. I don't, think, I don't think Florida is especially happy with the FDA or the way information was shared. Their traceability would have showed because of I, the outbreaks that 
I'm pointing out that we did share a lot of information with Florida, and we did, we did use the Florida resources as, as the Commissioner suggested we should, and we did. We used their labs and we used their inspectors. Well, I hope now, if we suspect a bioterrorism, we're not going to treat it the same way, that there would be a little bit more urgency to it. And the, the traceback process would be the same. There, it, it, is, it is what it is. So then it's a major hole in our national safety, whether it's bioterrorism or Salmonella St. Paul. If, if, if somebody has done something deliberate that's involving the same type of products in the same type of restaurants and retailers, it would be no different. It couldn't be different. It's still right now paper, invoices, bills of lading. You've got to go and get them. You've got to go and pick them up. That's what could be a focus of making it faster if there was a, if there, if there was a deliberate act. Now, obviously, if this was deliberate, there would be different federal authorities involved. Homeland Security would have a lead if it was a bioterrorism event. It would be run differently. I'm simply focusing on FDA's role with the traceability. It is what it is, and it, and it worked. It was just slow. Mr. Shimkus, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I, I want to go back. I, I think we're, we're we're pounding on FDA, but FDA spent all this time going after the wrong suspect because it wasn't identified properly to begin with. And once we got identification with the help of a public health department, 18 days plus four to find the location. Um, and so I, I think there's ways that we think we can make things better. And my questions are going to are, are going to be in that. But and we we got to keep this in the in focus. And I think the original panel identified that. We we just got taken off in the wrong direction. And the FDA went. Traceability worked, maybe not as quickly as we would like, but it worked. And, and the reality is, Diana, the reality is tomatoes search time for this disease is infinity. We are still looking. We cannot find it. When it was identified in peppers, 18 days to find the pepper, four days to find the location. I think that's a success. What went wrong was that, and the issue is, the CDC and the, the public health departments. So I'd like to ask first, we got two public health departments. How big is the state of Minnesota, population-wise? About five million people. And so your state? Six million. Six million. And so what's the budget, Dr. Smith, of yours, of the state public health department? I basically have one foodborne disease epidemiologist for every million people in the state. One for every million. And Dr. Jones? Same order of magnitude, yeah. And we don't have to name states, but you probably know states that have one epidemiologist for how many? Every 24 million people. 24 million. And I guess Texas, I mean, and, we, and we're talking about this starting in Texas. And, and uh, New Mexico, I guess Texas was, was the second point. And I don't even want to ask about my state. So, uh, I, but if we had a bioterrorism attack, it would be identified first by who? It would be identified in exactly the same way as a natural contamination would. Exactly. And, and, and it would go, once you would identify the convergence, the commodity, you would, you would then go to the CDC. Absolutely. And then in conjunction, we would then have to raise a, war a, a, a concern to start finding where this thing started from. And, and, and again, if we're using to make this as a case study, we just identified it wrong. So I think part of this debate is public health, state public health departments, get them funded, get them technologically advanced, and then probably Dr. King, uh, probably working with CDC to, to get you all fully funded and up to speed in staffing. Wouldn't you agree? I certainly agree that the, many of the states are under-resourced when it comes to many f public health problems, including food safety. I think that was one of the inherent problems and lessons learned here is that they were poorly resourced and couldn't respond just because they didn't have the resources to put into this. When you, when you talk about, Congressman, about the states talking to CDC, there is a system in place called PulseNet. 
and PulseNet is in place. All the states have PulseNet capabilities. There are counties and cities that also have PulseNet. So concurrently and simultaneously, we can, through the states, local, and CDC, actually look across the 50 states and even further into those states, into, into cities, uh, with a system that is standardized to say, oh, this is Salmonella St. Paul, this is the variety that has caused outbreak over in New Mexico and Texas and Illinois. That gives us then the capability to say, this is a multi-state outbreak. There is a source here that we didn't know about. CDC's role then, and by the way, the states can look at this um, just as quickly as CDC can. CDC then is involved in that coordination when asked. Last year, there was 1,260 right, outbreaks that came to CDC's notice. Okay. Of those, about 120 CDC was actually involved in giving advice, helping where it was asked. 12 of those, we actually took a lead role. 90% of what's happening in the food safety area is at the local and state level. 1% of the time, CDC actually gets involved uh, in, in a lead situation. That's why these states need to have proper resources. And, and I mean, this is a, it's a tough position because you make a call, there's, there's people ill, you make the wrong call, then you've got the, the culprit still out there, people are sick, people are dying. I, it's, 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 it's an honorable profession and, and we applaud your work. We're just trying to get it better. Dr. Jones, you, and, and this is also in, in preparation for the hearing, I want to know what are the barriers, these legal barriers, and I want to know some specifics of what are the legal barriers that are, are limiting our ability to most more quickly, clearly identify culprits and, and the like. Do you have any that you can specifically give me? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, legal barriers to sharing epidemiologic data. And I think that that occurs quite rapidly in, in both directions and goes to the, to the regulatory agencies fairly quickly. I guess the examples that I'm familiar with uh, have to do, and, and again, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but have to do with legal uh, restrictions on federal regulatory agencies uh, not being able to share potentially, you know, proprietary information. I, I, yeah, give me an example. I, I, we want to, I, I would think the committee would want to find out exactly what those are. And as we're doing legislation, to say when there's a national public health risk, do we got to tear these down and we got to ensure that the federal agencies protect the propriety while, we, while we're finding the information. So, Mr. Chairman, as we continue this, I, I think this is a, a key area of and, I mean, does anyone, can anyone share, Dr. Atchison? Um, part of the problem here is, is proprietary information that's, that's deemed to be commercial confidential. There is, a, there is a mechanism through commissioned individuals at the state level that that can be shared with. And we, well, we heard about commissioned individuals yeah. in the first panel, and they, they didn't seem they had much power or control or input. No, we, we are able to share information with, with commissioned individuals, and we do. And, and I think to that point, if, if, so, if a commissioned individual in a state is saying, we think there's something going on and, and we, we, we'd like some information, nothing to stop them picking up the phone and saying, can you help us here because we've got some questions. If they're well, we're going to, I know we're on our side, we're going to try to dig in, Mr. Mr. Chairman, on, on this issue because we're the legislative branch. You know, we can, Dr. King, you want to add? Uh, th there's one piece of information I know the industry was uh, hoping to get and couldn't get and was critical of it, and that was identification of cases by county. Uh, and that is something that through our uh, legal counsel, uh, when a state shares information with us, first of all, the, the, the data and information is the state's. When it is shared voluntarily with CDC, it becomes part of the federal record. It's also then under um, the authority of Privacy Act and also under uh, Freedom of Information Act and agency policy. And it has been consistent and the recommendation of our general counsel that when you get down to the county level, that that gets too close uh, and patient, to protect patients' rights, we will not give that information out. And so there is a case where you get, where you get states with um, 
very, not very populated, but maybe have one hospital. Right. Uh, that is the information then could actually get back, and, and those, those patient rights need to be protected. So, so there's a case. Yeah, I, again, I'm going to keep. We're going to keep following up on this line of work because uh, I think there, there, where there's some legislative fixes here, and where we can protect proprietary, some carve out provisions, where because we need information, and and I think the first panel talked about transparency, when when there is a national emergency, if we're talking about bioterrorism, and the risk of millions of people, we surely don't want uh, privacy considerations to trump. The health and welfare of, of, of the nation. So, the um, I, I, and, and the chairman's position also was, if we get sent down the wrong path, as as this case is happening, how do we clear the product that has now lost immediate dollars and and potentially market share? How how do we who calls it and says? Lay off the tomatoes, Dr. King. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. You know, we respectfully disagree that tomatoes weren't involved. Right? And so if you, if you give me a little bit of time uh, to talk about um, what happened in that case control study, if you'd like for me to explain that, to talk about the science and the epidemiology behind it. That's your call. Well, my, my time's expired. The chairman wants to hear it. I would be happy to hear it. Oh, yeah. Let's hear it because uh, I think, I think how do you prove a negative? You, you put a negative an, out there and you still can't prove an, that negative. It's an important point to make. And so, so let me kind of go back. Uh, and, you know, I apologize for the terms of the epidemiology. I don't apologize for the science. So initially, when we had these cases in New Mexico, New Mexico uh, went ahead and went back to ill people and did what they call hypothesis-generating interviews. And that hypothesis-generating, uh, I think your committee had copies of this. Uh, right here, Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, was pretty comprehensive. It included um, at least 200 different sources of food. But even at that time, you knew tomatoes coming from South Florida doesn't go to New Mexico. We That's the traceability we thing where, that they're arguing traceable. with you. And if you won't give them the county, they can't help you. Yes, sir. You know, it's what you know at that point in time. Right. So, it, you know, at that Well, you knew that South Florida was the only place that there was producing tomatoes for distribution in the United States there in Mexico. Well, well, so me why did and if, if Florida has this great traceability, why didn't you work with them so they could show there wasn't Florida tomatoes so we could have protect the domestic tomato industry, which has lost $100 million and counting? So, so let me just go back and explain the epi. The, the tracebacks are, are part of what FDA does, not what. Well, that's part of epidemiology, isn't it? You, I, it, it informs tracebacks for sure, absolutely, and they go together. So you're absolutely right. So through the hypothesis generating, you, you know, interviews, and through the case control studies that followed, right? The case control studies were done by Texas, New Mexico, and the Indian Health Service, right? And the analysis of the data. Uh, strongly associated tomatoes as, uh, as uh, the possible cause of this outbreak. And when I say strongly associated, you have to understand what that is in epidemiologic terms. When we did the calculations, epidemiologists, statisticians, right, that means that people that were ill with this form, Salmonella St. Paul, that was the, the in, in this particular um, pulse field, um, were seven times more likely to have eaten raw tomatoes. And when you did further probabilities of the calculation, right, they do what's called a p-value. This is the probability that was came up with 0 0.001. That was 10 times greater in terms of what it would take to publish the scientific data. So with that information in mind, and epidemiologists, and talking to other people that do this, and which we have done for 30 years, right, that is a strong association. Agreed. But when you made that strong association, May 22nd is when CDC and state health officials identified outbreak of Salmonella St. Paul. And within a few days, you said tomatoes was the probable one, right? It had the strongest association. Sure, strongest association. Okay. But then, if it's tomatoes, isn't the next question 
where the tomatoes come from. And we know from all the testimony, the only place is southern Florida, which has the strongest, as they say, traceable product of tomatoes. And they say you wouldn't work with them. The first line of uh, Mr. Bronson's testimony. Give me the first line of that testimony. The first line of his testimony, written testimony, which he gave us was, his first line was, FDA did not share or solicit critical information from state, state food safety agencies. State resources could have augmented FDA's effort. So if you're doing, and I understand epidemiology, I understand statistics, also understand doing crime scenes. When you go to a crime scene, Everyone's a suspect, but the infant is probably can be cleared immediately because they don't have the means to cause the harm. So I, I, for the tomato industry, I guess I'm saying, if you knew it was South Florida, you knew it was tomatoes, South Florida tomatoes weren't going there. They could trace that. They could, they could prove that to you. And what, what went wrong after that? We just kept focusing on the tomatoes. I understand that, but domestically produced tomatoes? CDC doesn't do the trace back, by the way. So, so Agreed. But you do the epidemiology, right? The epidemiology. We do the lab. Correct. And make, you give it to the FDA, then do the trace back. And F FDA is informed by what we have with that conversation, and it certainly leads them to um, some indication of best bets in terms of trace, trace backs. If well, I then what, what, what would the information would the FDA receive from the CDC on tomatoes to make it think it's domestically grown tomatoes when we know it's only coming from a very small part of our country which has traceback laws. When we were looking at the clusters and right. the sporadic cases that, that the CDC and the locals were, were investigating in the states, that's our start point. You, and, and initially in this, in this outbreak, we did not have clusters. We were dealing with sporadic cases and individuals. You're, you're dependent on their memory. And they say, well, we bought our tomatoes at such and such a retail outlet. So we would go there and we would trace it back. Correct. And then we are, to your point, asking where could those tomatoes have, have been distributed? This year, what we learned from industry was that because of weather or, or economic conditions, Florida tomatoes were going all across the United States. They were going as far as California. Well, that's not what the first panel said. Well, I, that's what, that was what our information And if there were Florida tomatoes, wouldn't you think you'd have some sick people in Florida about the same time? These were only west, right? New Mexico and Texas were the only two places the first outbreaks were. Uh, if it's Florida tomatoes, I would think Florida people would be getting sick. What do we have, four? Four people have, you know, this whole time out of Florida and 11 in California, I think it was, so and 500 in Texas and 100 and some in New Mexico. Anyways, okay. Did, did you want to add anything more I, on, that, on what you did there? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, Chairman, thank you. Yeah. Just to kind of put it in a little bit of a context, so I just went back to 2006, and I looked at 10 outbreaks, right? E. coli and spinach, shredded lettuce, botulism, salmonella and tomatoes, E. coli and, fr and frozen pizza, salmonella and peanut butter, salmonella and... Yeah, we've done all those hearings. You've done all of those hearings? Yeah. L let me point out that, that actions were taken on the basis of epidemiologic investigations on all of those in the advance of any product cultures that were done. Okay. So, so, the, so the idea that this one is not different than what we usually do. I understand you have a suspect, but you've got to put the suspect at the scene of the crime. You guys sure didn't uh, do a very good job, I don't think. That's, and, and I think that's where you're coming from, I'll yield back too. my time, yeah. yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gedd for questions. Dr. Atchison, do you think that the traceback in this most recent salmonella outbreak was done in the best and most timely way it could have been done? With do, the system? Do, yeah. With the system that we currently have in place, yes. Do you think it's the best system that we could have? I think it could be improved in terms of increasing its speed. And if it was improved, then would we have been, if we had a better system, which I will get into, would we have been able to identify, at least eliminate tomatoes as a potential source and move and try to identify the sources more quickly? I, I believe that a faster system, and you could talk about what that would look like, but I believe that a faster system would allow you to exclude products faster, 
and to get back to potential areas where clusters are crossing over to give you a source faster. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, we heard on the last panel that there are a number of voluntary industry associations for traceback and also a number of companies have traceback systems. Are those going to do the job that you're talking about for speed and efficiency if they don't link up with each other and cross-reference each other? Not, not entirely, no. And um, is a voluntary traceback system in which only some market players participate going to be adequate to give the speed and comprehensiveness that we need in a traceback system? No. Now, um, I've learned in, my, uh, in, in recent months that many larger companies do have the ability to track their food and, and probably in a better way than smaller firms because at larger companies, brand preservation is al almost always a key to survival. So my question is, if, if you have a purely voluntary traceback system, will that be as successful as it could be if some market players, particularly smart, smaller market players, uh, can't participate in the system? Like any system, it's, it's as strong as its weakest point. So if you put in a great system and only 99% of, of the industry is using it and you have a problem with that 1%, all bets are off. It's not the whole thing falls apart at that point. It does, yes. Now, um, I'd like to know if the FDA currently has the legal authority to do what some of our panelists on the last panel were talking about, which would be to use a numerical unique identifier that can travel with the product and instantaneously identify relevant tracking information like location, time, date, et cetera, vector in the field. Um, d does the FDA currently have that authority to develop that comprehensive system? Well, bearing in mind that, that I'm not an attorney, but my interpretation of, of that is that we do not have explicit authority to require the sort of level of detail that you're asking for, but it okay. may be better that we get you a written response to that. You betcha. I love it. Um, and I, I, I I'll assume, not, not to rag on you because you've been very cooperative with my office, but I've made about 10 or 12 requests to the FDA, other parts of the agency in the last year, and I must say I have not gotten responses, so I'm sure you will respond to my question. Sure um, <laughs> now, uh, I wanted to ask a few questions about the, about the um, other end of this the identification of, of the foodborne illness, because it seems to me that the problems that we've had in this investigation, it, it's, it's true we don't have the comprehensive traceability system that we could or should have, and it's also true that if we had had a, a national interoperable system of traceability, I believe we could have identified, we could have eliminated uh, foods in areas that were not affected, which would have been financially beneficial to those to those portions of the industry, and we could have also identified the source of the contamination more quickly, which would which would be good for public health. But but the other so the traceability is what I've been focusing on in my legislation. But in truth, we, really the identification um, of 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 the situation is of great concern to me and the rest of us because people started getting sick in April and here we are now at the end of July still trying to figure out exactly where that contamination came from. I think some of it does come from the CDC and the state health departments, so I want to focus on that for a, a few minutes. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Dr. Jones, is it true that you believe that there are some sizable communication problems between state agencies which are often on the front lines of the outbreaks, and uh, the CDC and the FDA. Uh, I do, and, and I think your point's an important one. You know, the, the farm to fork continuum uh, has, all along that continuum, there are places for improvement. And there are states that investigate hundreds of outbreaks every year, and there are states that investigate a half dozen. And, you know, the, I think the food is just as safe uh, in, in both of those states. And if outbreaks can't be detected and investigated at the local level, uh, then we'll never know we have a, a multi-state issue on our hands and, and be able to even discuss it with CDC or FDA. And, and I guess I could ask you, Dr. Smith, and, and you, Dr. Jones, the same question. Do you think all states have 
enough resources to do that investigation that they need to do? Uh, absolutely not. Dr. Smith is nodding yes. I agree 100%. And, and um, is there something at the CDC, maybe Dr. King you can answer or somebody, is, the, is there some resource management at the CDC that works with those states that have less resources to be able to identify these situations? And if, and if it's incomplete, what can we in Congress do to help improve our identification system in this country? Dr. Jones? Uh, I, I think there are a number of things. And, and yes, the CDC will respond and provide assistance to any state health department that asks for it. Uh, and there's obviously wide variability in you know what when a state will pull the trigger. I think there are some very important ways that CDC has provided a lot of support to state health departments. Both of our states are, are uh, among a group of ten that are in this food net uh, system, which gives us uh, and, and it's all federal resources. It comes through the CDC, uh, which supports the half dozen epidemiologists that we talk about. Uh, I think that if all 50 states had a system like that, that a lot of the problems that we were talking about today wouldn't exist. But, but you know, I, I will say that um, I, I will say that that uh, it's all well and good to have the states asking for resources. But when you're talking about identifying either a foodborne disease or a bioterrorist attack, if they don't have the resources to identify the problem in the first place, they don't know. It's it's a real chicken and an egg part kind of a problem. Dr. Smith is is again nodding yes. Um, my, you're my favorite witness of the day. You just nod in agreement, but you don't ramble on. So good work, um, Dr. Jones. You mentioned in your testimony that. A lot of the reason why critical communication between the federal and the local health agencies isn't occurring because of policies that restrict the sharing of proprietary data and information collected in the course of an investigation. Is that true? Yes. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. King or Dr. Atchison, if, if you can uh, comment on how much of that proprietary information is hurting your agency's ability to collect data and to, and to uh, find the causes of these uh, diseases? I, certainly from, from FDA's perspective, we do have a mechanism through commissioned offices at, at the state level to share that information. But I think as we've addressed, if we can find ways to break down these barriers and these silos, not just with the, with the state partners, but with industry, because there's no question that they have a significant piece to bring to bear that's, that would be helpful. You know, but, but part of the problem is, um, as Dr. Jones states in his written testimony, even though public health ep epidemiologists can become commissioned by the FDA, he says, most of my colleagues have refused to pursue this expressly to avoid the untenable moral predicament of having access to data which they would be legally unable to act upon. I'm wondering, Dr. Jones or Dr. Atchison or anyone else, if you'd have any comment on, on how we can solve that problem if we're going to be able to more quickly to respond to these, pro to these issues. I, I would suggest that, that the way is, is how do we build these partnerships to be actually successful so that you're not that's just... A, that's a good parapher paraphrase of my question. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the process that we've got to address. I don't know what, that, what that's going to be. We've got a process that we're going to begin in August. We're meeting with states and locals, FDA, with CDC, to look at how can we better build partnerships around protecting the food supply in the United States. There's a lot to be done. Does anybody else have an idea how we can break some of those those problems? Well, this is not very encouraging to me because it, it seems to me that one of the keys towards identifying, towards having state and federal agencies working together to identify these, these issues is, is to going to be coordination. If we've got barriers right now, we need to figure out how to break that. And we sit here as a Congress ready to help you, but you're the experts. So, um, so I think that we, we need to figure out how to break these barriers. One, one last question, Dr. Jones. Do you have examples of actual cases where the barriers of data sharing or other forms of communication between state public health agencies and these federal agencies, the CDC and the FDA, made it difficult to rapidly solve a food outbreak case or quickly act in the interest of public health? Uh, yes, and I think I alluded to one uh, 
fairly generally in my testimony, but uh, you know, we, we did have a recent uh, situation where a federal regulatory agency had collected the names of people who had purchased a product uh, which we knew was uh, contaminated, and, uh, and I'm, I know that this frustrated them as much as it did us, but they were not able to hand us the list of the contact information of those patients, victims, for us to be able to call them and talk to them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. But you're at the front line collecting that information, right? Uh, if uh, some, this came through a, a mechanism where sure. consumers can call in to the FDA right. hotline right. and ask them questions, and we do not have access to that system. Mr. Dingle, for questions, please. Again, I thank you for your courtesy and commend you for your labors in this matter. Uh, these questions to to Dr. Atchison. Uh, these will be yes or no questions. FDA had over 4,000 field investigators in the year 2003 to investigate uh, contamination of food outbreaks and inspect food facilities. True or false? In 2003? In 2003. I'd at 4,000. I'd have to check. Please check. And. Uh, in 2008, FDA's field force of investigators had been reduced to about 3,300 investigators. That's a loss of 700 investigators. True or false? I believe that's true. Uh, tracking foodborne contamination outbreaks is labor intensive. I'm sorry, say again? Con tracking foodborne contamination outbreaks is very labor intensive. Yes, I agree. Uh, what level of food-related resources, inspectors, scientists, etc., do you believe that food and drug currently needs? You may submit that, the response to that question for the record. But it would be fair to say that the number is rather larger than you have now. Is it not true? I would agree. Uh, we're now learning that the probable or possible source of contamination uh, in the jalapeno peppers and tomatoes is Mexico. Is that true? Correct. Uh, FDA has minimal resources to inspect food imports at the border. It depends how you define minimal. Minimal. All right. How, is, 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 is food drugs resources in these matters adequate? No. They can import, they can inspect, as I understand it, about 1 percent of, of the food. That is correct. Clearly, that is not adequate. Is that right? That is correct. But, in, but, but, you, but as we said before, you cannot in, inspect your way through this. It's got to be a risk-based approach. All right. Now, it is also true that Food and Drug has almost no resources that it can dedicate to inspect foreign firms, foreign farms that handle food. Is that true? Uh, in 2007, FDA conducted about 95 inspections of those types of facilities. Do you know how many facilities there are? There are a little under 200,000 that are part of the bioterrorism registration database. And you inspected, as I understand, 95 of those 200,000? Correct. And don't ask me the percentage, because I can't work that out in my head. Please. <laughs> is, 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 is a fair comment minimal? <laughs> Depends how you define minimal. All right. Now. Uh, if food drug had had sufficient resources for inspecting imported produce or actual sources of that produce, we could have detected this contaminant much sooner, could we not? I suspect not. Suspect I, no? No. I, I think not because inspections and sampling as a mechanism to ensure that, that it's safe is not realistic. You just could not sample enough to make it realistic. Right. The answer is the preventative controls. That's the fix. Now, would you agree that FDA needs considerably more resources to conduct foreign and domestic inspection of food processors? Yes, and we are getting some of those in 2008 and hopefully 2009. Uh, now, does food, would you agree that food and drug needs considerably more resources to inspect actual imports at the border? 
Yes. Uh, if you turn to page, no, no, that's, I'm sorry. Where, I guess that's, that constitutes my questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Inslee, for questions, please. Thank you. I think we all agree that our trace back and investigatory systems are inadequate. But I want to ask, what is more inadequate, our, our after-the-fact trace back investigatory system or our preventative systems of agricultural practices that prevent and packaging and distribution practices that would prevent these instances from happening? What is sicker? What is more ailing? What is more porous? What is most, what, what is the most um, glaring weakness between those two uh, approaches, either pre or post injury? If, if I could respond first, I would say the most critical is the preventative controls. That's, that's what counts the most, building the safety in upfront, so whether it be a domestically grown or an imported product, manufactured, whatever it is, build that safety in upfront to a standard that is adequate. You've obviously got to have strong reactive capabilities when things do go wrong, but having a reactive system, however well it works, is, is just not a good way to protect public health. Well, I would agree with that, and that's why I hope those who are interested in this subject will be very anxious, as I am, to get legislation through to finally adopt best practices in these industry in the field and in the farm and in the packaging plant to prevent these repeated instances. I've got to tell you, this is very frustrating to sit at this dais time after time after time to see these incidents, and we still haven't successfully got the industry totally to agree to standards that will prevent these things from happening. So I hope that this continued incident will encourage others to work with us as soon as humanly possible to pass practices that will prevent this from happening. We know this can happen. We've had substantial improvement in the meat industry. We have not had improvement in the produce industry in practices in the field. And I just hope that others agree with Dr. Atchison and myself on the importance of those preventative measures so we can move, move forward. Uh, Dr. Jones, I want to ask you about in state measures. I think even a cursory review would show that, that a relatively small handful of states have been most successful in investigating a disproportionate number of these, of these incidents. And I just want to ask you to, to the extent you can, tell us what do those states have in common? What have they done well? Is it resources? Is it practices? Is it you know, gubernatorial leadership? What is it and what can we do to, to get more states to either emulate those efforts or federally remove the necessity of them? Uh, unfortunately, I think the basic answer is resources. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Smith has, has mentioned some other things. I mean, uh, states that, are, that have a very centralized uh, public health and epidemiology structure uh, tend to get information a little bit faster. Uh, laboratories that are well funded and can do their uh, testing quickly and get their results to epidemiologists quickly help, but all of that requires manpower and resources. We were looking for an easier answer, actually. Sorry. If you could. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Smith, your team had a relatively rapid identification of jalapenos uh, through genetic systems. And, you know, basically what did they do differently than the FDA? What can we do to replicate that on a, on a federal level? Right. Well, again, I think it needs to be replicated more on the state level because, I mean, CDC and FDA are kind of limited by the information they're getting from state health departments. And so I think our system or something like it needs to be implemented more at different state levels. Again, our laboratory is confirming and typing bacteria in real time, giving that information to our epidemiologists right away, and our epidemiologists are interviewing these patients extensively, again, in real time. And so we're asking people about what they ate two weeks ago. And that's hard to get detailed information at that point, but it's much easier and you get much better information than if you waited until you asked them about four weeks ago or six weeks ago. And that's what happens in some states. It's like some laboratories physically can't type all their bacteria in real time, and so they can only do it once every two weeks or, or once every month. And then by the time they do that and get that information to their epidemiologists, you know, it's four or six weeks later, and, you know, when the interviewers are being started. So the whole key is just, uh, you know, it's not really that hard 
It's the resources to do stuff right away and to do it in detail, and that'll get you the, the detailed interview information that, that you need to, to solve an investigation. So what would you say to the federal government, the agencies, to match that state input early? Is there something that has to change? Well, I mean, I, I know for a fact that, that CDC um, could use more resources in PulseNet um, to track all the isolates that are being submitted by state health departments into that. And I also know there are epidemiologists that are helping to coordinate multi-state outbreaks get stretched awfully thin. And so, again, I know that they could use some more resources at the federal level to, to go ahead and assimilate the information that's coming in from the states. Anyone else want to add to that? With that, thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, Ms. DeGette had a question. But Mr. Chairman, I just had a follow-up question. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm still trying to think about how we could improve our identification of these outbreaks. And Dr. King, I wanted to ask you in particular about this salmonella outbreak. Now, um, patients were given, uh, or people who, who we thought ate, ate uh, the tainted foods, were given questionnaires by the state of New Mexico and also the CDC. Is that correct? Yes. We've okay. been provided copies of these questionnaires by the CDC, and I'm wondering, are they, are these uh, confidential? These forms? I, I know the ones filled out are confidential, but I, I'm looking at them. I see no reason why these would be confidential in any way. The forms? Yeah. No, no not at all. Okay, um, and. And the first form, which is a very extensive form that was, that was provided by um, New Mexico to patients, talked about fresh tomatoes, and it, it had a long list of different, different um, foods. And, and it didn't highlight jalapeno peppers or serrano peppers. It simply had a space for other peppers. And then the form that was given out by the CDC, which is a form much more targeted at the salsa that was suspected, um, asked questions about salsa, homemade salsa, store-bought salsa. It talked about onions, tomatoes, where you ate tomatoes, a lot of questions about tomatoes. That form never asked one question about peppers. And I'm wondering why, or, or for that matter, any other ingredients other than uh, onions that are in salsa. There's two different forms. You have the first one is this hypothesis generating form. It's the larger yeah. form provided by New form. Mexico, which has a whole right. bunch and of it, stuff. It had, on I think, it. red peppers, green peppers, or other peppers. Correct. So that the people doing the interviews, uh, it was open ended. So you would also ask people, are there other things aren't on this list that that you could remember that you'd have. So that's one thing. Okay. You get down into case control, which is the second form. Okay. It also was done by the state. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, two states. And that's like a smaller health. form what after. What says then is that because the hypothesis has been generated, right, then we're able to focus into this looks like it's food, it looks like this type of food, and so the questionnaire then becomes more focused based on that information to try to pinpoint more accurately the different types of foods and ingredients. That makes sense to me. So who develops that second form? And that, that's like a follow-up set of questions yes, that's asked? That's, that's, that's correct. Comment. And who develops that form? Well, the states will actually have some um, changes in those depending on what they do. Uh, there's kind of a template that's being used, but um, States will add to those um, as they... So as they the state that. of New Mexico would have developed that second form? They would have, but I think okay. for the case control study, we actually were involved in helping them with... Well, and, and the reason I'm concerned is this. It may be that after the initial survey that, that uh, people didn't focus in on peppers. However, if you look at this second follow-up form, they were focused in on salsa, right? Now, I will tell you, as someone who myself is from the Southwest, I never made salsa without putting peppers in it. That's one of the key ingredients of salsa. So if, if in fact, salsa was suspected, and you ask the question, tomatoes and extensively tomatoes and onions, why, why wasn't the question about peppers asked on that follow-up questionnaire? It may have helped you much more quickly identify the uh, serranos and the jalapenos. 
I, now I have to look at the questionnaire. Again, it was, uh, I, no, I, I understand that you're, that you're looking at that. So I would look at that. I, I, will, I will tell you, yeah. without misleading you, that peppers are not mentioned whatsoever on this second form. There are many questions about tomatoes. D did you eat any raw tomatoes? Did you eat tomatoes at a restaurant? Where did you purchase them? It seems like it seems like what happened was the state of New Mexico and the CDC focused right in laser-like on tomatoes. But yet, if they thought the problem was salsa, maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe they went off down the wrong road too fast. Um, that's uh, you know, that's part of them, something we'd look at. The second case control study certainly did focus at peppers as we gained more information as as we went. Okay, I don't think we have that in our, oh, here, here's Mexican food exposure. Then would that have been the, the next thing after that? That's correct. And, okay. And, and was that, when, when was that given to them? After the tomatoes were so, eliminated so as, as a suspect? As we gained more information, then we oh. were able then to, to focus more, and peppers became something of um, more concern for us, and with stronger association, and, co and consequently, the questioning and the questionnaires. Do you think there would have? Do you think we, we might have been better off if we focused on, on all the ingredients of salsa right right at the time, uh, that that we thought salsa might be a problem rather than just going down the tomato road? It, it may have, it, it may have been, and and I certainly go back and review that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hutchinson. You've indicated, and, and I know we've been down this path before on heparin and China and, and all this uh, with the FDA, but you, you said that uh, the best way to handle these issues is to build up the safety first. In other words, make sure the farm is growing a healthy product, correct? A safe product, yes. A safe product. How many inspectors, full-time inspectors, do you have in Mexico then checking farms? Nobody's, no FDA employees are permanently stationed in Mexico. So then the only chance to make sure that you have this safety uh, of the product coming in is catching it at the border then, right? Under the current system, yes. It's, it's based on, on inspection and sampling at the border. As part of the Food Protection Plan, FDA Beyond Our Borders, we are looking at establishing FDA presence in a number of countries which inclu would include Central and South America. Okay. You're established in, in uh, China, are you not? Yeah, we're Didn't in the you have the memorandum that was on the pet food. We're we're in the process of of establishing an office in China. That's correct. Yes. So, do you have any food inspectors outside the borders of the United States? Not currently, no. Not okay. permanently. Not permanently. They 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 would go out usually for cause. If we if we know of a problem, correct. It needs to be checked. There on. has to be a problem first before you'll send them off overshores, offshores. Typically, yes, it does. So, but to get to your safety, build up the safety, as you said. Yeah. You really should have the inspectors in other countries, especially like in the winter months. We know we get most of our produce, at least south of our border. It, it's not all about inspections. It's about building in the preventative controls. So we've got to set the standards. We've got to work with industry to do that. And we have to find a way to ensure that they're meeting those standards. Some of that would be FDA inspections. As I, as I know you're aware, an, an area that we're exploring as a mechanism here is an FDA audited third party certification system. Correct. Simply because, as I s s said to Congressman Dingle, we're looking at 200,000 foreign manufacturers. And it's, it's like, let's focus on those that are high risk and let's leverage every possible mechanism to be able to ensure that they're, they're building the safety and upfront. Okay. Now, Dr. King, if I may ask you, who's in charge of coming up with? Uh, the source here of the salmonella, the vegetable of interest, if you will, the CDC? With the, the, the original epidemiology, CDC is uh, actually, uh, that's our responsibility. Okay. So CDC told FDA, look at tomatoes. Yes. Okay. Then who made the call to change the focus to peppers, CDC or FDA? It came through further investigations. By the way, we don't do this kind of by ourselves. We do this through conversations back and forth. Correct. Our investigations in the epidemiology led us to look more and more toward peppers. Uh, uh, and I know Dr. Atkinson and folks at FDA, that was from our investigations then that led them to further trace backs down that, down that track. Okay. Who is the agency in charge here then when you have a foodborne illness outbreak, CDC or FDA? 
it depends on what part of the outbreak. So we do surveillance, we do epidemiology, we do outbreak investigation in the laboratory. We don't do the tracebacks. Right. So, so that's the bifurcation. FDA does the tracebacks, the work on the food, or USDA, depending on what the product is. And so they're clearly in charge of that part of it. We're clearly in charge of the other part of it. We uh, talk all the time. We meet all the time. Uh, but that's how the de delineation is. You say you talk all the time. But yet when I hear Dr. Jones talk, it sounds like no one talks to the state officials who are really the frontline people who really do your epidemiology stuff, as Mr. Get pointed out with the forms, because I, I, I'm still bemused by the fact that uh, Dr. Jones testifies they have an outbreak. You know the names and addresses, or FDA does, of the people who are being sick, but they can't tell the frontline people, Dr. Jones, to, to warn them or to uh, try to, at the local level, take care of the issue. I, I just find that amazing. Go ahead. Thank you, and I'll talk to Dr. Jones about that, and I'm sure he has good reasons to say that. There are three systems that we have kind of in, in effect. One is called um, Outbreak Net, where we actually had the epidemiologist in every state and CDC involved. Uh, the others are daily conference calls during this outbreak with all the states involved. And the other is C4, which is this council to improve um, uh, food outbreaks, and uh, that involves uh, states and epidemiologists. So there's three systems in place where I think the dialogue continues fairly readily. Three systems in place, so wouldn't it really indicate that you need an incident command center that would include state, local, federal, industry reps, science experts, especially when you get an outbreak as big as this, 43 states, District of Columbia, Canada? I think that's something to take a look at, and, and, and I appreciate your observation on that. Go ahead, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, yeah, and just if, if this was a bioterrorism attack, I mean, that's, I mean, this is, uh, this is what we're all, a lot of us are concerned with, and you, we've said the system works the same, but as far as a command and incident center, does the Department of Homeland Security get involved at all in, in that debate then? Yes. I mean, is that the command and control center that we lack if, here? If there is, well, thankfully, we haven't had to deal with one of those since, since the That's public. true, but I mean, we have but to be, that's, there is, we don't, but we need to start, we, we can't shy away from the risk, we, and we have to ask these questions, and yeah. this case study is a good case study uh, to help us look at that. There is, if, if, if it was a deliberate act, and we knew it was deliberate, and, and I want to add that if somebody was putting salmonella in the food supply, the chances are that it would be treated exactly the same as this. If somebody, because it, it happens, unfortunately, too often, if it was anthrax, which clearly happens never, then it would be, the, the suspicion would be much higher. Law enforcement would be involved very early, and I think the whole thing would be different. But they would call upon you all for your expertise oh, yes. in the public health department yeah. and your trace back yeah. and, and but CDC. I, I think your, your point, and Chairman Stupak's point, is an incident command type approach for dealing with these is, is one that seriously needs to be looked at as a mechanism that involves, at the very least, the regulatory individuals that are seated here and others. The industry piece is more complex because of the sharing of confidential information, and I'd, I'd love for us to break down those barriers. It could only help. Well, and that's what we want to do. But following up on that question, if it is a bioterrorist attack, how does, does law enforcement then and security of our country trump those privacy concerns we have? Does it trump the Privacy Act? Does it trump the agency chief counsel who don't allow you to share that information? I, when reading the Bioterrorism Act, I don't see an exception for that. So. I, We've been I, done the same way, not sharing information. I, from FDA's perspective, I don't right. think anything changes. It may right. be different for Department of Justice and law enforcement and FBI. I just but you don't have any opportunity, though, if it's a bioterrorism attack, to uh, waive the privacy laws, the confidentiality, the trade secrets, wherever you want to call it, proprietary mm -hmm. interests, I think was the word you Not that I'm aware of, but I'll take that back. And if yeah, I haven't seen it either. something so. in the act to that effect, then I'll, I'll obviously get back to you. And, and Doctor, can you, you quoted um, a legal opinion. C can you provide that for the committee, for the record? I'd be glad to. That has to do with the county information, yes. Okay, that's, right. that's kind of the direction we want to head, so thanks. Let me thank this panel, and thank you again for your time and testimony. And. Uh, We'll continue on this issue.
I'd like to invite our third panel of witnesses to come forward. On our third panel, we have Mr. Michael R. Taylor, JD, who is a research professor of health policy at George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services. Mr. Hank Gickless, who is vice president for strategic planning, science, and technology at Western Growers Association. Dr. Donna Guerin, who is vice president for Health and Safety Regulatory Affairs at National Restaurant Association, and Dr. Robert Brackett, who's a Senior Vice President and Chief Science and Regulatory Affairs Officer at the Grocery Manufacturing Association. Thank you all for coming. It's the policy of the subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that witnesses have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during their testimony. Do any of you four wish to be represented by counsel at this time? Everyone indicating no. Then I'll ask you to please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect. The witnesses replied in the affirmative. You are each now under oath. We'll now hear your opening statement, five minute opening statement. You may submit a longer statement for inclusion in the hearing record. Uh, Professor Taylor, let's start with you, sir. Chairman, why don't you pull that up a little bit? Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to testify today. Uh, I have submitted a, a written statement, the, the purpose of which was uh, to demonstrate that we have a system problem here. And I, I think it's fair to say that the testimony you've heard so far really demonstrates that. Um, I think it really demonstrates that we need a system solution. And I look forward, hopefully, this panel can have some time to talk about uh, some of those solutions. But in my, test, in my written testimony, I, I tick off you know, really seven elements of preparedness and planning for outbreak response and investigation that are really lacking in the current system. And I think we've heard about all of these today. I mean, it is focused federal leadership and accountability. It's somebody being in charge. It is well-defined institutional roles across the system, federal, state, and local, uh, which we really don't have formalized today. It's very ad hoc. Uh, adequate expertise and capacity, the funding issues that we've talked about, clearly an element of this. Prompt traceback, and I think we can talk about some specifics there. This issue of standardized data collection and seamless data sharing, I mean, I think is really central to being able to manage these outbreaks and also to deal with prevention in a systematic way, and we don't have that provided for. We've also heard about the need for active industry engagement, which I absolutely agree with, and then coordinated uh, public communication is, is obviously essential. I guess one thing I really want to emphasize is that um, Congress has to act to address these problems. I think these problems are, are built into our current system, the current fragmentation uh, organizationally in our food safety system at the national level. It goes beyond outbreak. Uh, investigation and response, it really goes to the whole way in which we manage our food safety system and needs to be transformed. As this committee well knows, we're operating at FDA under, under a food safety law that's 70 years old. It contains no mandate for prevention. It contains no mandate to take an integrated systems approach. And I think the legislation you're working on will, will address that. Now, the other element, of course, of the broader problem is resources. We've talked about that today. Uh, I would just like to emphasize the, the organizational issue, and, and there's been extensive study of this by the Government Accountability Office, by the National Academy of Sciences, the fragmented structure of the, of the government's uh, food safety system, particularly at the federal level, but then also, as we've heard today, uh, state and local agencies, its health departments at state and local level, its, its regulatory agencies, its departments of agriculture, all of whom play roles uh, without any sense of how we or any clear directive that there be a national leadership role in seeing that these entities work in an integrated way. So Congress really has to, uh, to address this organizational, this structural issue, and, and really drive uh, the development of an integrated system. I would start that organizational reform at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, personally. Um, within HHS, uh, we have food safety agencies, multiple components, really, of the Food and Drug Administration, as well as CDC, you know, all of which work in their own traditional ways, with their own particular charges. They have their own cultures and ways of dealing. Um, none of them have the, the charge or the, 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 the stature uh, within the government system to really exert leadership uh, nationally and internationally, for that matter, towards a more integrated preventive approach. So one of the things I would hope this committee would, would consider in due course uh, is unifying and elevating within HHS uh, all of the components of HHS working on food safety so that a single office, a single official can be in charge and accountable for all HHS food safety 
activities, including outbreak response and investigation, but, but going beyond that to include all the things we need to do to build a preventive integrated food safety system uh, in the country. Uh, so with that, I look forward to the opportunity to discuss uh, any of these ideas and, and solutions to some of the problems that, uh, that have been identified here today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glicklass, please. Thank you, Chairman Stupak, members of the committee. Uh, Western Growers is a trade association representing growers, shippers, handlers of fresh fruits, nuts, and vegetables in California and Arizona. Our 3,000 members produce approximately half of the United States' total production of fresh fruits, nuts, and vegetables. We appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today on our activity and learnings related to food safety. The industry has a long history of implementing and improving our food safety programs and defense capabilities to protect public health as well as business interests. In the early 1990s, we led to develop the first ever Good Agricultural Practices document that recommended key areas of, uh, and strategies for reducing risk. These guidelines address production, harvest, cooling, processing, transportation, and retail and food service handling. They later became the basis for the FDA's guide to minimize microbial food safety standards for fresh fruits and vegetables, excuse me, hazards. Uh, today, that's the baseline for all food safety guidance. When the guide was published, our emphasis shifted to one of education and extension. A cottage industry of third-party food safety consulting and auditing firms began to grow. These private programs have driven a high level of implementation as buyers demand audits as a condition of doing business in the marketplace. This benchmark set of guidelines and food safety paradigm has evolved significantly over the last few years for select commodities. Today, commodity-specific guidance has been developed for lettuce and leafy greens, tomatoes, as you saw this morning, and cantaloupes, and there's work underway on green onions and herbs. These are each grounded in the FDA guide and utilize an approach based on hazard identification, assessment, and control. Despite the continual improvements in guidance, there have also been continuing outbreaks. The 2006 outbreak in spinach drove the industry to move far beyond existing paradigms to even more prescriptive sets of best practices. California and Arizona now have established uniform gaps and a corresponding verification program that requires implementation of food safety measures developed in concert with public health authorities and private sector experts. These newer generation guidelines include specific requirements for risk assessment, sampling and analysis of inputs, safety response measures, and requirements for documentation. Compliance with these requirements is verified by governance inspectors in the field, and we believe this model could provide direction for broader national and international efforts to improve food safety. The model program brings together the strengths of state, federal government, the national and international research community, and the industry itself in a coordinated fashion to ensure science-based best practices for preventing or reducing the potential for contamination. The health and human service agencies are in a key position to identify the areas that industry must address based on the data and information they have gathered and analyzed in epidemiological investigations and traceback. Addressing these risks in turn becomes the focus for enhanced best practices. Verification can rely on inspectors who are already in place throughout the country. FDA is exploring this option by evaluating how third parties might assist in providing boots on the ground for verification and inspection. Western Growers firmly believes that prevention is our strongest tool in efforts to reduce foodborne illness associated with produce, but a model program also must address the response to any discovery of contaminated product in the marketplace or outbreak of foodborne illness. Collaboration is equally important in efforts to respond. The FDA and CDC have an army of industry personnel at the ready. A formal recognition of this industry expertise and a commitment to strengthen communication with industry during an outbreak will both help protect the public and minimize economic damage to the industry. We believe the time has come to cease operating in silos and work hand in hand using the strengths, talents, and expertise of all parties to improve food safety. The program for leafy greens adopted in California and Arizona is moving the industry closer to achieving our common goal of minimizing the incidence of foodborne illness associated with the consumption of fresh produce. We encourage this committee to assist the industry to build on and extend the success of these efforts. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of Western Growers, I look forward <coughs> to any questions you might have regarding our efforts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Guerin, your testimony, please. Chairman Stubach and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today on the recent salmonella outbreak. 
The National Restaurant Association, founded in 1919, is a leading business association for the restaurant industry, which is comprised of 945,000 945, um, restaurant and food service outlets and a workforce of 13.1 million employees, generating estimated sales of $558 billion in 2008. Nationwide, the industry serves 133 million guests every day. The food, food safety is the utmost importance to the restaurant industry. Restaurants have taken the lead in ensuring food safety within the four walls of our restaurants. The Re National Restaurant Association and our men members are making multi-billion dollar investments in improving food safety and developing state-of-the-art food safety education programs. We are especially proud of SurfSafe, the food safety education program that sets the standard for our industry. More than 3 million food service professionals have been certified through our SurfSafe Food Protection Manager certification exam. The current salmonella outbreak is one of the largest in U.S. history. A particular concern was the two, over two months period of time needed to identify the source of the outbreak and the mid-course change in focus of the cause of the outbreak. We are at a critical time in food safety and all of us have a role to play. This highlight the outbreak highlights the need to reevaluate our food safety system and implement needed improvements. A particular concern is the complexity of the food distribution channels of, for fresh produce and the challenges presented when a finished product served to customers contains a number of ingredients. This complexity presents challenges to the public health officials leading the efforts to resolve this outbreak in a timely manner. In moving forward, we need a better approach. We need a farm to table approach. We build confidence by showing people that we are always ready, always vigilant. For the purpose of this hearing, we would like to focus on key areas in moving our food safety efforts forward. Adequate funding for FDA, improved collaboration and communication, stronger standards and practices for produce, and additional tools that include recall authority, traceability, improve epidemiological investigations, and private sector certification. The recent outbreak highlighted the need to provide FDA with adequate resources to do its job. We are encouraged by the FY08 supplemental increase for FDA of $150 million. Further increases recommended for FY09 budget as well. However, this can only be a down payment on a sustained effort to increase the agency's appropriated base. This outbreak also highlights the need for increased collaboration and communication between industry and government. The fact that fresh produce is commingled and repacked at various steps in the chain should not present an insurmountable problem. There are industry experts who specialize in the distribution of these types of products. There should be a mechanism that allows the agency to tap into this expertise to facilitate a more meaningful investigation of the crisis at hand. While we recognize that conducting an outbreak investigation is a governmental function, we would urge a greater level of collaboration and communication between government and industry as we all benefit from a rapid resolution. Effective communication guides the public, the news media, health care providers, and industry in responding appropriately to outbreak situations. There are certain challenges and hurdles inherent in developing materials to inform and educate the public about potential health and safety risks in an accurate and timely manner. We must overcome these obstacles and improve how we communicate health and safety information. It would be a serious area to error to underestimate the importance of developing by consensus among <coughs> stakeholders the final version of risk communication strategy and plan. Communication professionals in the public and private sector need to ensure strong and well-integrated working relationships that will help sustain communication resources as an outbreak evolves. The planning, preparation, and practice must begin now. Over the past, <laughs> over the, over the past several <laughs> Over the past several years, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> okay. 
Over the past several years, there have been repeated calls for stronger safety standards for fresh produce. This outbreak reinforces the importance and urgency of that task. The produce industry has taken positive proactive steps to establish standards. Now is time for FDA to take the next step. The first goal of any food safety system must be prevention. FDA's good agricultural practice developed a decade ago should be updated and made mandatory. The National Restaurant Association supports the FDA in setting mandatory general standards for produce as well as commodity specific standards for commodities the FDA deems as posing a higher risk. Prevention alone cannot guarantee safety and so emphasize emphasis must be placed on rapid response when an outbreak does occur. This leads directly to the issue of traceability. The produce industry has made important strides in recent years to improve traceability, yet more can be done. We must apply our best collective knowledge, expertise, and emerging technology so that finding the source of contaminated produce is a matter of hours or days, not weeks or months. Traceability systems may need to be developed commodity by commodity to address varying supply chains. A one-size-fits-all strategy may not work for all sectors and stakeholders. In addition, any credible traceability system should be effective for all stakeholders and routinely tested to determine potential flaws prior to a crisis event. The National Restaurant Association supports granting the FDA the authority to recall a food product that poses serious adverse public health risk and the company refuses to complete a voluntary recall. Enhanced and coordinated recall and notification should be developed to better inform the consumer so that the FDA is communicating these notices to public in a consistent manner. We also believe that there should be a better resources for investigating outbreaks at the state level. The epidemiology of foodborne illness is sophisticated and always changing. Many states lack the manpower and resources to do it well. Poorly managed investigations can be catastrophic, as we most recently demonstrated by this particular outbreak. We must ensure states have the necessary funding available to assess this information and Im implement better investigations related to food. Increasingly, our members are relying on private sector to ensure compliance by suppliers with food safety standards. This approach provides consistency of standards and quality across borders, cost efficiency in the supply chain, and less duplication of certification processes, and simpler buying. We believe the FDA should support the use of third-party certification as a way to leverage the agency's limited resources. In conclusion, the ongoing salmonella outbreak has been long, costly, and frustrating for all concerned. We must do better. This means taking a new look at our food safety system to ensure we have a comprehensive farm-to-table strategy. We must look for ways for government at all levels to collaborate more closely with industry experts during the course of an outbreak investigation, and we must establish stronger standards and practices that move us towards continuous improvement in produce safety. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Guerin. Dr. Brackett, your testimony, please, sir. Thank you, Chairman Stupak and other members of the subcommittee. The Grocery Manufacturers Association is the, represents the world's leading food, beverage, and consumer uh, products companies. And the members of GMA share your commitment to ensuring the safety of our nation's food supply. Product safety is the foundation of that consumer trust. The recent investigation into the foodborne illnesses outbreaks due to Salmonella St. Paul is the latest event to challenge our whole food safety system. The inability of the current food safety systems to rapidly and accurately determine the source of Salmonella St. Paul uh, in this outbreak is a major contributor to the erosion of consumer confidence uh, in the safety of the nation's food supply. The topic of this hearing is what we have learned as a result of the salmonella outbreak. And we've learned three things. Clearly, the first thing we've learned is that FDA is in dire need of additional resources to carry out its mission of protecting the public from foodborne hazards, and not just money, but in terms of scientific expertise and IT infrastructure and all of that goes along with protecting the food supply. Secondly, we've learned that the ability to trace a product is meaningless if the epidemiological data implementing implicates the wrong product. This highlights the need for more, serious, uh, for more resources at the state and local levels as well so that we can more rapidly and thoroughly investigate these foodborne illnesses if they occur. Third, we've learned the need to do more to prevent food safety incidences in the first place. 
GMA has led the effort to provide current guidance to the food industry, both domestically and abroad, by issuing the GMA Food Safety Chain Supply Handbook this past April in 2008. And I've got a copy of that here for you. This reference manual represents a tool chest for companies in search of examples of successful management practices for suppliers to consider. The GMA Handbook clearly states that, at a minimum, suppliers and transporters should consider their ability to trace back and trace forward the movement of ingredients and finished goods through the whole supply chain. But traceability was not the real issue in the Salmonella St. Paul outbreak that we're discussing today. We really need to modernize our entire food safety system. GMA continues to propose that Congress modernize our food safety system by making risk and prevention of contamination the focus of our food safety strategies going forward. GMA CEO Cal Dooley and I have testified many times before Congress on the issue of improving food safety. We have consistently proposed the following reforms, many of which are included in legislation already introduced in both the House and the Senate. These include, first, one, that we urge you to give FDA the power to establish mandatory safety standards for fruits and vegetables. In particular, give FDA the power to establish food safety standards for those fruits and vegetables that have repeatedly been involved in food safety incidences. Two, we urge you to require food companies to have a food safety plan. In particular, every food company selling food in the U.S. should conduct a food safety risk evaluation that identifies potential sources of contamination, identifies appropriate food safety controls, and verifies that those controls are effective and then documents those controls in the food safety plan subject to FDA review. Now, with respect to tracebacks, Congress and the FDA should evaluate the traceback requirements in the Bioterrorism Act to determine whether it should be extended to farms given these recent developments. In addition, there is also one inadvertent outcome from the Bioterrorism Act. The law clearly requires food companies to keep the one-up, one-down records that have been discussed so far. However, there appears to be some ambiguity as to whether the law gives FDA the express authority to check during a routine investigation to see if a company is, in fact, keeping such records. We believe Congress should clarify FDA's authority. By expressly granting FDA such authority, FDA can better assess whether companies are properly prepared to trace product when a foodborne incident does occur. Third, require every food importer to police their foreign suppliers. In particular, Congress should require that all food importers document the food safety measures and controls being implemented by their foreign suppliers and should require food importers to make their food supplier food safety plan available to FDA. And fourth, build the capacity of foreign governments to enlist the help of the, and uh, enlist the help of the private sector. In particular, Congress should direct FDA to develop a plan to help build the scientific and regulatory capacity of major exporters to the U.S. and should create a register of private laboratories that meet FDA standards. Mr. Chairman, we are grateful for the opportunity to work with you and promote a risk-based approach to food safety regulation and to allow FDA the flexibility to respond to emerging risks in the manner that most efficiently uses the agency's precious resources. We look forward to working with you to develop and implement improvements that will make risk and prevention the focus of our nation's food systems. This concludes my oral testimony and my written testimonies have been submitted for the record. Thank you and thank you all for your testimony. Unfortunately, as you know, with the bells ringing, we have votes. We have uh, five minutes left on the floor before we have to go vote. We have six votes. Um, I'm going to say uh, 315, we'll come back and we'll go with questions. I hate to ha ask you to stay another hour, but uh, we want to get the questions in. So let's come back here at 3. 15. Okay. The committee will be in recess till 3.15. Well, I thank you for uh, staying with us. And uh, sorry, we thought it was going to be a short uh, deal. There was a special motion on the floor, which took a little bit of time. That's why we're about an hour late, or else uh, for those of us who live in Central Time Zone, we're right on time, 3:15. But um, uh, we'll start with some questions here. Um, let me ask this, uh, Mr. Gicklass. Um, when 
this outbreak, outbreak first occurred and tomatoes were named as possible source of salmonella, large portions of Florida, and, or in this case the entire state of California, were not in production and therefore it would have been impossible for salmonella uh, to, to be in the tomatoes. Nonetheless, almost the entire growing industry has been broadly painted and still is today with the same brush, at least in the eyes of consumers. Is there anything with respect to CDC or FDA's messaging to the public that can be improved so not to hurt certain parts of uh, industries that are not responsible for outbreaks? Mr. Chairman, um, my response to that would be I think there is a lot of room for improvement in the messaging uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, I think that CDC and FDA ought to just tell people what they know, when they know it, and and um, you know not get into a position where they're speculating on what other products or what other commodities or what other regions. I think um, uh, uh, I also think that the frequency of communication was problematic in this particular uh, outbreak because there was you know a series of media calls that were held over and over and over with really nothing new to report other than an update on the numbers, um, uh, but no significant findings, if you will. Okay. Uh, Dr. Guerin, uh, Dr. Brackett, uh, in the Bioterrorism Act 202, both the restaurants and the farms were, were exempt. Would you now agree that we should put them in the Bioterrorism Act uh, so we can do traceability better? On behalf of the restaurants, Dr. Guerin, what would you, would you agree you should be part of this process? Uh, we definitely believe that there should be a farm to table strategy. Um, How about restaurants? Excuse me? Restaurants. <laughs> um, we uh, want to work with FDA. Um, right now, we would say that, you know, we represent a very diverse industry that goes from the small independent operator all the way to the multi-unit operators. Agreed. Um, and in this, this particular case, you know, I would say in regards to the Bio Bioterrorism Act, I'd say we already voluntarily comply with it in that we we're able to, in this particular case, supply information to FDA in a timely manner. It might have been purchasing records for those small unit operators. Those small unit operators, that's how they may maintain. Yeah, but one of the problems is you may be, if you're not part of the act, maybe the records you're, and we've seen this throughout this whole investigation, the records you're providing may be something different than what their, the distributor gave to you. I, I think, and, and I, we're getting with the other panels, you almost need a seamless form system where we're all using the same systems. Uh, otherwise, it just burdens everybody. You have paper, they have electronics, they have something else, bill lading, some are on back of a brown bag, they said that's some of their records. Right. I mean, we would want to work with the stakeholders involved, including government, to come up with an approach that works potentially commodity to commodity, stake and incorporate the needs of different stakeholders. I think a one-size-fits-all strategy for traceability might not be working for every particular business type. We need to take into account where we move from here, but we definitely welcome the opportunity to work to, to move in that direction. Dr. Brackett, you want to add anything on behalf of grocers and manufacturers? Well, yeah, I would make a comment specifically on the, on the farm side of it. Since this, in its particular group of products, those that are high-risk products, most of the problems have been in the past the fact that they, they are, have not been able to track back to the farms. And so if you are going to have a farm-to-table approach, I think they would have to be included. And I think the industry is well on its way to doing that already. Mr. Taylor, Professor Taylor, you want to add anything on that? Well, I, I think as long as you are in the, the mode of having a system that is dependent upon government investigation of company records and you want a farm-to-table system, you have to extend it to restaurants and farms. I guess I, I would encourage consideration of a completely different approach, though, because in a, in a public health context, um, it seems to me what FDA needs to be able to do is rapidly get traceback information that the, that the companies uh, have and, and give answers to FDA as to where product came from instead of creating company records that then still rely on FDA to do the investigation. So rather than rely on those, those internal records, um, you know, I would suggest, for example, as I did in my testimony, uh, creating a performance standard, if you right. will, having, having Congress legislate or, or authorize FDA to do commodity-specific uh, rulemaking that would say, Based on available technologies, everyone in that supply chain should be able to tell FDA within four hours, eight hours, 12, whatever you judge or FDA judges is technologically feasible, uh, 
the, the duty is to provide that information within a certain period of time, and then the companies can figure out what specific uh, technology or set of practices work for that commodity or that business model and not get the government into the business of trying to create the traceback system, but set the performance standard that every company has to meet. Or at least some minimum standards that we need for traceback? Yes. And then let the Again, industries buy commodity? Yes, and on. based on an assessment of what's technologically feasible and can be done you know, in, a, in a cost effective way, uh, but then leave it to the companies to innovate the specific systems that meet that, that performance standard for timeliness of disclosure of, of where product came from. Mr. Gitglass, you, you indicated that uh, uh, Arizona and California have a standards they've developed together for what uh, leafy greens, tomatoes. Well, uh, the, the first panel this morning spoke specifically about the standards uh, for tomatoes in California and Florida. We, I, my testimony was about the leafy greens program in California and Arizona. Could that be replicated with the U.S.? I mean, you're the only two states that are doing it right now. Uh, it absolutely could be replicated, um, uh, and it's one of the things that you know we're bringing forward as a potential model. It is very similar to what's being done in tomatoes in both California and Florida on on the part of the tomato industry. So, it's an example of uh, some of the commodities that have been deemed to have higher risk, like leafy greens, tomatoes, cantaloupes. There are some others where industry is coming forward to put these best practices, if you will, in place. And, and I think you know, what we need to do is provide that line of sight to FDA and to others. I asked the other panel, and, and I guess it was only a, I think the air panels said the first panel was a, a penny to print on the box, the code, but like to implement this. Do you have any cost estimates? What would it cost to implement this? I mean, it goes out the system, I realize, from farm to the table. but. Well, well, leafy greens, um, there's a couple of different costs that are associated with it. Um, there is a two cent per carton assessment um, levied on the industry um, to support the verification program and the administration of the leafy greens programs. Um, that cost is borne by everybody, but it is not, um, uh, there are also additional costs for every individual firm in terms of ramping up to meet the requirements of the leafy greens metrics or best practices, if you will. And um, those have been estimated to be, you know, on the order of 25 cents a carton. Um, there's the significant investment in, in this program. It's probably tripled food safety investments in California. Um, and doubled the number of staff that are focused on food safety. It's very significant expenditure, ultimately. Dr. Brackett, do you have any estimates or restaurant association any estimates what something like this would cost if we had sort of like uniform standards throughout the nation had to do it? I, I would take it you'd be in favor of uniform standards maybe promulgated by the federal government, FDA, whatever, but let industry implement it to a minimum standard? And what, what would cost estimates be if you have any cost, Mr. Brackett? Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't know what the cost is if we've been done that. Uh, many of the industry already have systems in place already, so they've already bought those costs, those systems already. But I agree with, uh, with, with Mr. Taylor that having a performance-based system where the requirement is what the government expects or what the regulatory agency expects in terms of response in order to trace back and then allowing the industry to adopt to whatever the best technology is at the time is probably what we would support. Okay, um, let me ask this, and, and whoever can answer it. Um, industry, um, like Jack in a Box, they had a problem one year, and, and they've, they've sort of put in a system that they demand their growers do certain things, uh, and some of the other McDonald's I know do, and, and others. Has that worked, and um, what's the benefit of that as opposed to having the government put in something? Anyone want to comment on that? I mean, I, I heard two things. Number one, it can work. Even if the tomatoes are being grown in Mexico, if you're McDonald's, you're a big enough corporate player, you can say you will do it this way and get compliance even in a foreign country. Then I've heard from other farmers who will say, well, these corporations, well, they're concerned about the safety of the food, but they're putting other restrictions on us, which are more risk management, like fences and things like that. It has nothing to do with growing or protection. Can you shed a little light on that? We, uh, I'm a Gickless. You're well, nodding um, your head. I'd be I'm, I'd be happy to honor or to to answer that part of the question. I'm sorry. Um, this this has been a significant um, uh, uh, point of frustration for many many growers. Um, uh, we have worked very very uh, hard and in close collaboration with the public health community 
to identify you know, a set of best practices that we believe are prudent, science-based, and feasible and implementable in the field. Those best practices are you know, part of this uh, program for leafy greens. And yet, there are individual buying companies that will say, um, for example, if you're estimating an approximate safe distance between a livestock operation and a produce operation, which you should keep separate, right. um, we might say that a quarter mile is a safe distance, or the distance may vary based on the risk. Is it uphill? Is it downhill? Is it, um, are there barriers in between that might you know, prevent a um, uh, uh, escape of... Uh, Anyways, um, uh, I guess the point is, um, if we say a quarter mile, and that's been vetted by science, there may be others who say a mile, or two miles, or three miles is better. Um, every single one of those um, uh, new requirements has a cost to it. It takes uh, key valuable production land out of the equation. Um, it, it jeopardizes people's ability to continue to farm. It may not be... Um, uh, science-based. So those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with with these extra requirements. Professor Taylor? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I uh, was administrator of the Food Safety and Inspection Service right. at USDA uh, in the aftermath of the Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak and, and saw what happened in the industry after that and also the efforts we made in the government to try to improve standards. And, and the first thing I would say is that uh, I mean, Jack in the Box in particular, but also other major retailers went through enormous transformation in terms of their own management of their supply chains, putting specifications on suppliers. The beef industry uh, really got with that program and has gone through enormous you know, positive change to bring technology into the processing, and I think they've made real progress, all based on the principle of preventive controls. And so industry innovation has been critical to progress on food safety. But, but the other side of that is... Go ahead. But then what happened to the beef industry? Because we had the largest recall ever, 143 million well, pounds of beef here. Uh, yeah, th I mean, we had a hearing on that. And, yeah. I mean, just get sloppy or well, what? Part of the, well, I mean, one part of the reality is that the, the E. coli problem is not a problem you solve on one day and it right. stays solved because that bacteria changes. It's a very dynamic problem. But the other, the other point I wanted to make is that while innovation gets driven and, and really created in food safety by industry practices typically, there's an essential role for government regulation to, to set standards that ensures that it's not just the good actors who have the market incentives to do that that make the changes, but that everybody makes them, that there's a le that there's a, you bring the lower performers up to an acceptable, a socially acceptable level, and you also achieve the objective of having a, a common science-based standard so that they're you know, businesses can plan, and I think it helps probably address some of the concerns uh, that Mr. Gicklis uh, raised. So, so, so again, I, I think you have to look to both, you know, industry, private sector innovation to, to really drive progress, but then government standard setting, and hopefully in a performance standard way, so that, again, you see what's possible through, through innovation the industry itself has done, and you set government performance standards to ensure that everybody meets that standard that's been demonstrated to be feasible. Mr. Gicklis, one more, and my time's up, but... Uh, you know, Salinas Valley, we've had, what, 20 outbreaks in 10 years. And, and why can't we s seem to resolve that issue? It seems like every nine months or so we have a spinach or a leafy problem with E. coli or salmonella coming out of that particular area. Well, if we've learned from all these different experiences, why can't we solve that Salinas Valley problem? Any suggestions? I, I throw it out to all my panels. Well, uh, what, I can, what I can say is that... Um, uh, after the 2006 outbreak in spinach, um, we really, as an industry, focused in um, on you know looking at these practices, what we could do, um, and now we've gone a full season without um, an outbreak. Uh, uh, this program is in place. We are hopeful that this program has resolved these issues and this problem, as has been pointed out. Um, you can't get to zero, but uh, we can do everything that we can to minimize. We think we have the best program in place to do that now. Okay, thanks. I, I guess only Dole and Natural Select are the only ones really aggressively doing the program that's been put forth by industry, right? In, in that spinach area, in uh, Salinas Valley? Th this, this program is subscribed to by uh, 120 different companies, I okay. believe, representing 99.9% .9 of the volume of... Salinas Valley. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Burgess, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank everyone's 
indulgence and patience with uh, what's been a, turned into a very long afternoon. Um, Professor Taylor, if I could just ask you, and uh, again, I apologize for being absent for part of your testimony, but on the part where you discuss uh, some of the problems within the food safety program at the FDA, and, and one of the things you allude to is that because of the bifurcated mission of the FDA, and drugs and devices get more attention, and perhaps it's even the presence of a user fee that may drive attention in, in, the, in the direction of drugs and devices. Is, uh, I know we're going to have at some point the opportunity to discuss a draft here at, uh, at, at some level at this committee, and I got a feeling that user fees are going to come up. So what is your feeling about the, the presence of user fees as it pertains to the food safety side of the, of the FDA's bifurcated mission? Well, I think, uh, I mean, user fees on the drug side has served the very useful purpose of providing adequate funding for that drug review program. And they, that is now a program that has demonstrated that with adequate resources, FDA can manage efficiently a timely drug review program. So it's worked in that sense. And my point in the testimony, of course, was that that has had a bit of a distorting effect, unintended, on management attention and the allocation of resources within FDA. And so user fees are a complicated issue and potentially uh, a mixed blessing. On the food side, you know, I'm of the old school that says that ideally we would fund uh, public health programs through appropriated resources. And I think ideally that's what should happen. Well, I'm, just for the record, I agree with you. Uh, I think that I'm, is the fundamental purpose of the Food and Drug Administration <laughs> and should be the fundamental purpose of I, our appropriations. I, and, I, and I think philosophically that makes all the sense in the world. I think the, the issue, though, is in the world in which we live and in which you live. I mean, how the, the, the core issue for food safety is how do we provide an adequate stable, predictable uh, base of resources uh, for FDA. That need for food safety at FDA, and that, that need has to be met. And, um, and so it may not be an ideal world, and maybe there's a fee that can be done that, that will generate revenues. And I think I, I would personally um, be willing to compromise on the philosophy point if we could find a way to get a base of resources that was fair and, and, and not too onerous, but would generate a sufficient you know, core of resources for FDA so that it could do its, its work. Um, and, and, and again, and maintain the independence and all that, that I think is important um, for its food safety public health function. But I'll just ask if anyone else on the panel has a, has a feeling about that, uh, about what uh, about Professor Taylor just, uh, just alluded to. I'll, I'll tell you philosophically I have, I have difficulty with it because it's almost like we're abdicating our responsibility mm -hmm. to provide the protection where it belongs, which is within the food safety aspect of the FDA, but does anyone else have, a, have an opinion about that? Um, we, we do not support uh, user fees. We, we do, as you mentioned, believe that um, you know, food safety is a common benefit to all and should be out of the general revenue fund um, and be appropriate um, to fund FDA so they can do their job. Uh, and Mr. Geeklos, let me just ask you, you talked about a one to two cent charge for the, uh, for the tracking code on the box, I mean, in, in a sense, that's a user fee, isn't it? It is, sir. Um, it, it does fund the, the program, but the program is industry designed. Um, uh, it has industry at the heart of it in, in the sense of, you know, oversight on funding and spending and administration. So um, uh, it's something that was willingly um, subscribed to. And you can sleep peacefully at night knowing that one to two cents is not going to grow the government into some other aspect or, or some other place in your life. Absolutely. Very good. Um, Dr. Brackett, uh, let me just ask you a question on the, uh, and we've heard a lot about this today from, from various sources, but where, what is the role for the, for the food companies and the importers in the prevention of, of foodborne illness? Well, it's the food companies that actually provide the safe food to the public, and it's their responsibility to actually make sure that those preventative controls that have been mentioned several times today are actually implemented. And I quite agree with, uh, with Professor Taylor that it's the role of government to set those standards, and then if you allow the industry to actually meet those standards, uh, they will find ways to do that. And, and then what, in the event of an outbreak or in the event, in the event of a problem, what, uh, what should the role be? Well, I think the role should be to assist the regulatory agencies as much as they can. And I, again, I would like to repeat what has been said elsewhere, that if the regulatory agencies and CDC do not have uh, either 
do not or do not have the ability to tap into the resources that the industry has in terms of scientific expertise and information. I think they're missing the boat. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question in regards to the, uh, what we've heard a lot about today in the 2002 Bioterrorism Act. And we've <clears throat> earlier we heard a lot from the standpoint of, of the importers. But as far as restaurants are concerned, the, uh, the ability to opt out of the reporting and recording requirements, in light of what we've learned with this outbreak and what we've learned today, is it still reasonable to allow restaurants to, to opt out of the, uh, the requirement when we've got 130 people visiting these establishments every year? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we, while we are exempt from the Bioterrorism Act, I would say that we're voluntarily complying now and that we keep the necessary records to know where we're getting product from. Um, you know, I often say, and, and, you know, follow the money. I mean, you know, people know who they're buying product from. Um, they have to pay the bills and, you know, so they know that um, when FDA comes, even a small independent operator, it may be a paper-based system, but they are maintaining those records because they have to financially to know who they're paying product for, too. So we would say that, um, you know, they are supplying the information needed to FDA. We need to come up with an approach, and we welcome the opportunity to work with all the stakeholders, including federal and state uh, food safety agencies and all the stakeholders along the supply chain to look at approaches that will work for all stakeholders involved, taking into account different business types, and in some cases taking into commodity types, because um, one size fits all approach strategy may not work for everyone. But in this in this instance, wouldn't it have been better if it was rather than voluntary compliance that it was required compliance? Well, I, I would offer that in this particular case that you know the restaurants that were involved, even the small operators, were able to supply the necessary information to facilitate. Um, a rapid response uh, from them. Um, FDA's ability to then go through and assess the, uh, the amount of paperwork um, that they had to work through to build a case, um, you know, in regards to, I guess, a collection of data, um, evidence, and, you know, securing that information made a complicated and frustrating in investigation. Um, again, we are, you know, willing to work with uh, creating a program that works for all. So it was more the FDA's inability to ask the correct question at the correct time with the correct person, not the inability of the of the smaller restaurant to provide the uh, the needed data when when it was requested. They were supplying the information, and I think the earlier panels did indicate that you know we were looking down the wrong path too. So that also made the length of this outbreak. You know we they were supplying information on tomatoes. When asked about jalapeno peppers, they quickly were able to supply the information needed to, to facilitate trace back. But realistically, how burdensome would it be to require the restaurants to participate in a trace, trace back system? You know, I, I, I don't know what the actual costs uh, associated would with that. And again, we'd be willing to look at different strategies. Um, I think, you know, if we're looking at the diversity of our industry, you've got a breadth of, you know, small independent operators collecting data on paper all the way through very sophisticated electronic tracking systems through the distribution chain or distributors that supply to our operators as well as the large uh, chains that have systems. And we need to make sure that they are, are take into account the different business types um, when we create a new system. <clears throat> Would, uh, Mr. Geekless, let me ask you this, because it came up during some of our other hearings where we're actually talking about foodborne illnesses in, in uh, in Asian countries, and the statement was made by, by one of the suppliers that if they found that one of their suppliers was, was providing a product that was somehow damaged, that they didn't feel compelled to report it to other, other businesses in the area. This was just something they kept to themselves, and in fact, they didn't even feel compelled to report it to the FDA, who's responsible for ensuring the food safety. And the issue came up around the issue of maintaining a competitive advantage. Well, do you think members of your organization would be willing to sacrifice some or to provide some leniency on, on trade seekers to provide information, to provide that collaborative role with public health officials in the event of, of an outbreak or the, during the course of an investigation? 
how, how closely held are those trade secrets, and, and would you be willing to, to relax those somewhat during the course of, uh, of an investigation of an outbreak? Well, I think in the investigation of an outbreak, um, the industry would comply fully and does comply fully with, you know, the requirements, the law. I mean, in terms of learning from an outbreak, I think we are all willing to sit down with FDA and others and share information, um, including uh, what might be confidential business information. That's an individual company decision, but I mean, I'm, I'm certain that people would be willing to collaborate, you know, to improve on traceback and to prove on those types of things. Um, the, the Leafy Greens pr program that we have in California and Arizona, if you're actually sourcing product from somebody who's not compliant, um, that would be communicated um, uh, to others so that they would know that there is a non-compliant supplier out there and not be able to um, uh, or not go to them to, you know, to source product, if you will. So there are some additional preventive steps that are in place in this uh, construct that we have for the leafy greens industry. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I, I actually, if I could uh, submit some questions in writing to the panel, just uh, would like to get some follow-up on the, the issue of if we're ever able to close our border in the event of an outbreak, again, the finding of this problem on a Friday morning and not being able to do anything about it for several days is pretty frustrating to the American people, I think. Sure, no problem. We, we, at the end there, when we close out this hearing, we'll leave the record open for 30 days for additional written questions then. Uh, Mr. Gicklis, and the last question from Mr. Burgess, you indicated, sure, we'd like to sit down uh, sit down with the FDA if there was no break and, and we'd all share our records and the proprietary interest would probably be, it wouldn't be a burden some. But I, I got the impression in listening to three panels today and especially uh, Florida and California, like. In this whole Salmonella, St. Paul, there was no one ever sat down with the growers or producers to say, we have this problem. Uh, we referred to it throughout today as an incident command. Like, you'd think they'd sit down with the growers, distributors, the wholesalers, the local health department, the state health department, and say, okay, where are we going with this? It seems like everything was a stove, stove pipe, we call it, the information was, this one don't talk here and that, and they use these ideas like Privacy Act, proprietary information as not to do that. I think the American people think that when you have an outbreak, you're all sitting around a big table like you have in front of us saying, okay, where do we go? How do we do this? Could the Timinellos possibly come from Florida? Was it growing season? I, I take it the industry would be willing to, to work and sit around the table and get this thing resolved instead of have it go on for a few months like we have right now and 1,300 people becoming ill. That, that's absolutely correct. I mean, we, we would very much, and we have encouraged in other testimony and in other times, um, setting up some type of a formal uh, recognition of industry expertise to assist in tracebacks. Um, and I can tell you, now having been involved in tracebacks for numerous commodities for a number of years, we have consistently asked FDA Tell us what went wrong. Tell us what is the obstacle in traceback. Tell us what information you're missing. What, what form do you want it in? And we have yet to really get a, a response to those questions such that we can change our industry systems to meet their needs, which is, I mean, traceback is vitally important to us because it minimizes the scope of a, the economic damages right away. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Brackett, I guess it would be fair to ask you, I asked some of the other panels on the um, Associated Press story. Uh, that we've seen and we've talked a little bit about, and it's in the binder there by Mr. Gicklis. Uh, it's, it's number five if you want to see it, but it was the uh, article is entitled Food Industry Bitten by Its Own Lobbying Success. Um, you were at the FDA at the time in, during the development of the regulations that resulted in the Bioterrorism Act, which is designed to enhance product traceability. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. In the article referring to the latest salmonella outbreak investigation, your quote is saying, if they, the regulation, regulations, had been broader and a bit more far-reaching, it could have helped us. Is that correct? Well, yes, that was a statement. And uh, if I could, I'd put, like to put it in context of what sure. it was. And in fact, there are two parts to that, one of which was something that I've said already today, which is if it had included the agricultural industry, the farms, that would have helped a lot right. too. And the second half is now, several years later, after technology has changed and the market has changed, if we had the ability to go back in a time machine and change things, we could probably uh, think of a way to, to fit this situation 
but we don't have that sort of luxury. But uh, the main part was the fact that uh, the farm to table inclusion in the Bioterrorism Act would have been helpful. Okay. Um, anything else, Mr. Burgess? I have no further questions. I want to thank you for coming and thanks for your patience once in a while we get put up for votes. And, and I thought we were going to make it. Uh, we are pretty close to getting it all completed before the votes. Uh, maybe we will start it earlier than 10 o'clock so we can get them in before votes. But thank you for being here. Thank you for your help. And uh, I know Mr. Burgess will have further questions. We will submit them to you. I am sure other members will too. As I said earlier, there are two sets of hearings going on today besides oversight investigation. So thank you. That concludes all questions. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for their testimony. I ask for unanimous consent that the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for additional questions for the record. Without objection, the record will remain open. I ask unanimous consent that the contents of our document binder be entered in the record. I, I also ask unanimous consent that the binder containing questionnaires used by the states and the CDC be made available for review at the committee office upon request. Without objection, the documents will be entered record and the consent or questionnaires will be in the office. That concludes our hearing. Without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. on C-SPAN 2, a House Armed Services Committee hearing on the rights of Guantanamo Bay detainees 